Preface to the New Edition Forty years have passed since the first German-language edition of this volume was published. In the course of these four decades, the world has gone through many disasters and catastrophes. The policies that brought about these unfortunate events have also affected the nation's currency systems. Sound money gave way to progressively depreciating fiat money. All countries are today vexed by inflation and threatened by the gloomy prospect of a complete breakdown of their currencies. There is need to realize the fact that the present state of the world, and especially the present state of monetary affairs, are the necessary consequences of the application of the doctrines that have got hold of the minds of our contemporaries. The great inflations of our age are not acts of God. They are man-made, or, to say it bluntly, government-made. They are the offshoots of doctrines that ascribe to governments the magic power of creating wealth out of nothing and of making people happy by raising the national income. One of the main tasks of economics is to explode the basic inflationary fallacy that confused the thinking of authors and statesmen from the days of John Law down to those of Lord Keynes. There cannot be any question of monetary reconstruction and economic recovery as long as such fables as that of the blessings of expansionism form an integral part of official doctrine and guide the economic policies of the nations. None of the arguments that economics advances against the inflationist and expansionist doctrine is likely to impress demagogues, for the demagogue does not bother about the remoter consequences of his policies. He chooses inflation and credit expansion, although he knows that the boom they create is short-lived and must inevitably end in a slump. He may even boast of his neglect of the long-run effects. In the long run, he repeats, we are all dead. It is only the short run that counts. But the question is, how long will the short run last? It seems that statesmen and politicians have considerably overrated the duration of the short run. The correct diagnosis of the present state of affairs is this. We have outlived the short run and now face the long-run consequences that political parties have refused to take into account. Events turned out precisely as sound economics, decried as orthodox by the neo-inflationist school, had prognosticated. In this situation, an optimist may hope that the nations will be prepared to learn what they blithely disregarded only a short time ago. It is this optimistic expectation that prompted the publishers to republish this book, and the author to add to it as an epilogue an essay on monetary reconstruction. Ludwig von Mises, New York, June 1952 Preface to the English Edition The outward guise assumed by the questions with which banking and currency policy is concerned changes from month to month and from year to year. Amid this flux, the theoretical apparatus which enables us to deal with these questions remains unaltered. In fact, the value of economics lies in its enabling us to recognize the true significance of problems divested of their accidental trimmings. No very deep knowledge of economics is usually needed for grasping the immediate effects of a measure, but the task of economics is to foretell the remoter effects and so to allow us to avoid such acts as attempt to remedy a present ill by sowing the seeds of a much greater ill for the future. Ten years have elapsed since the second German edition of the present book was published. During this period, the external appearance of the currency and banking problems of the world has completely altered. But closer examination reveals that the same fundamental issues are being contested now as then. Then England was on the way to raising the gold value of the pound once more to its pre-war level. It was overlooked that prices and wages had adapted themselves to the lower value and that the re-establishment of the pound at the pre-war parity was bound to lead to a fall in prices which would make the position of the entrepreneur more difficult and so increase the disproportion between actual wages and the wages that would have been paid in a free market. 
Of course, there were some reasons for attempting to reestablish the old parity, even despite the indubitable drawbacks of such a proceeding. The decision should have been made after due consideration of the pros and cons of such a policy. The fact that the step was taken without the public having been sufficiently informed beforehand of its inevitable drawbacks extraordinarily strengthened the opposition to the gold standard. And yet the evils that were complained of were not due to the resumption of the gold standard, as such, but solely to the gold value of the pound having been stabilized at a higher level than corresponded to the level of prices and wages in the United Kingdom. From 1926 to 1929, the attention of the world was chiefly focused upon the question of American prosperity. As in all previous booms brought about by expansion of credit, it was then believed that the prosperity would last forever, and the warnings of the economists were disregarded. The turn of the tide in 1929 and the subsequent severe economic crisis were not a surprise for economists. They had foreseen them, even if they had not been able to predict the exact date of their occurrence. The remarkable thing in the present situation is not the fact that we have just passed through a period of credit expansion that has been followed by a period of depression, but the way in which governments have been and are reacting to these circumstances. The universal endeavor has been made in the midst of the general fall of prices to ward off the fall in money wages and to employ public resources on the one hand to bolster up undertakings that would otherwise have succumbed to the crisis and on the other hand to give an artificial stimulus to economic life by public work schemes. This has had the consequence of eliminating just those forces which in previous times of depression have eventually effected the adjustment of prices and wages to the existing circumstances and so paved the way for recovery. The unwelcome truth has been ignored that stabilization of wages must mean increasing unemployment and the perpetuation of the disproportion between prices and costs and between outputs and sales which is the symptom of a crisis. This attitude was dictated by purely political considerations. They're wage-earning subjects. They did not dare to oppose the doctrine that regards high wages as the most important economic ideal and believes that trade union policy and government intervention can maintain the level of wages during a period of falling prices. And governments have therefore done everything to lessen or remove entirely the pressure exerted by circumstances upon the level of wages. In order to prevent the underbidding of trade union wages, they have given unemployment benefits to the growing masses of those out of work, and they have prevented the central banks from raising the rate of interest and restricting credit, and so giving free play to the purging process of the crisis. When governments do not feel strong enough to procure by taxation or borrowing the resources to meet what they regard as irreducible expenditure or alternative, so to restrict their expenditure that they are able to make do with the revenue that they have, recourse on their part to the issue of inconvertible notes and a consequent fall in the value of money is something that has occurred more than once in European and American history. But the motive for recent experiments in depreciation has been by no means fiscal. The gold content of the monetary unit has been reduced in order to maintain the domestic wage level and price level, and in order to secure advantages for home industry against its competitors in international trade. Demands for such action are no new thing either in Europe or in America. But in all previous cases, with a few significant exceptions, those who have made these demands have not had the power to secure their fulfillment. In this case, however, Great Britain began by abandoning the old gold content of the pound. Instead of preserving its gold value by employing the customary and never failing remedy of raising the bank rate, the government and parliament of the United Kingdom, with bank rate at 4.5%, preferred to stop the redemption of notes at the old legal parity and so to cause a considerable fall in the value of sterling. 
The object was to prevent a further fall in prices in England, and above all, apparently, to avoid a situation in which reduction of wages would be necessary. The example of Great Britain was followed by other countries, notably by the United States. President Roosevelt reduced the gold content of the dollar because he wished to prevent a fall in wages and to restore the price level of the prosperous period between 1926 and 1929. In Central Europe, the first country to follow Great Britain's example was the Republic of Czechoslovakia. In the years immediately after the war, Czechoslovakia, for reasons of prestige, had heedlessly followed a policy which aimed at raising the value of the krona, and she did not come to a halt until she was forced to recognize that increasing the value of her currency meant hindering the exportation of her products, facilitating the importation of foreign products, and seriously imperiling the solvency of all those enterprises that had procured a more or less considerable portion of their working capital by way of bank credit. During the first few weeks of the present year, however, the gold parity of the krona was reduced in order to lighten the burden of the debtor enterprises, and in order to prevent a fall of wages and prices, and so to encourage exportation and restrict importation. Today, in every country in the world, no question is so eagerly debated as that of whether the purchasing power of the monetary unit shall be maintained or reduced. It is true that the universal assertion is that all that is wanted is the reduction of purchasing power to its previous level, or even the prevention of a rise above its present level. But if this is all that is wanted, it is very difficult to see why the 1926 to 1929 level should always be aimed at, and not, say, that of 1913. If it should be thought that index numbers offer us an instrument for providing currency policy with a solid foundation and making it independent of the changing economic programs of governments and political parties, Perhaps I may be permitted to refer to what I have said in present work on the impossibility of singling out any particular method of calculating index numbers as the sole scientifically correct one and calling all the others scientifically wrong. There are many ways of calculating purchasing power by means of index numbers, and every single one of them is right from certain tenable points of view but every single one of them is also wrong, from just as many equally tenable points of view. Since each method of calculation will yield results that are different from those of every other method, and since each result, if it is made the basis of practical measures, will further certain interests and injure others, it is obvious that each group of persons will declare for those methods that will best serve its own interests. At the very moment when the manipulation of purchasing power is declared to be a legitimate concern of currency policy, the question of the level at which this purchasing power is to be fixed will attain the highest political significance. Under the gold standard, the determination of the value of money is dependent upon the profitability of gold production. To some, this may appear a disadvantage, and it is certain that it introduces an incalculable factor into economic activity. Nevertheless, it does not lay the prices of commodities open to violent and sudden changes from the monetary side. The biggest variations in the value of money that we have experienced during the last century have not originated in the circumstances of gold production, but in the policies of governments and banks of issue. Dependence of the value of money on the production of gold does at least mean its independence of the politics of the hour. The disassociation of the currencies from a definitive and unchangeable gold parity has made the value of money a plaything of politics. Today, we see considerations of the value of money driving all other considerations into the background in both domestic and international economic policy. We are not very far now from a state of affairs in which the economic policy is primarily understood to mean the question of influencing the purchasing power of money. Are we to maintain the present gold content of the currency unit, or are we to go over to a lower gold content? 
That is the question that forms the principal issue nowadays in the economic policies of all European and American countries. Perhaps we are already in the midst of a race to reduce the gold content of the currency unit with the object of obtaining transitory advantages, which, moreover, are based on self-deception, in the commercial war which the nations of the civilized world have been waging for decades with increasing acrimony, and with disastrous effects upon the welfare of their subjects. It is an unsatisfactory designation of this state of affairs to call it an emancipation from gold. None of the countries that have abandoned the gold standard during the last few years has been able to affect the significance of gold as a medium of exchange either at home or in the world at large. But what has occurred has not been a departure from gold, but a departure from the old legal gold parity of the currency unit, and, above all, a reduction of the burden of the debtor at the cost of the creditor, even though the principal aim of the measures may have been to secure the greatest possible stability of the nominal wages, and sometimes of prices also. Besides the countries that have debased the gold value of their currencies for the reasons described, there is another group of countries that refuse to acknowledge the depreciation of their money in terms of gold that has followed upon an excessive expansion of the domestic note circulation and maintain the fiction that their currency units still possess their legal gold value, or at least a gold value in excess of its real level. In order to support this fiction, they have issued foreign exchange regulations which usually require exporters to sell foreign exchange at its legal gold value, i.e. at a considerable loss. The fact that the amount of foreign policy that is sold to the central banks in such circumstances is greatly diminished can hardly require further elucidation. In this way, a shortage of foreign exchange, divisino, arises in these countries. Foreign exchange is, in fact, unobtainable at the prescribed price, and the central bank is debarred from recourse to the illicit market in which foreign exchange is dealt in at its proper price because it refuses to pay this price. This shortage, then, is made the excuse for talk about transfer difficulties and for prohibitions of interest and amortization payments to foreign countries. And this has practically brought international credit to a standstill. Interest and amortization are paid on old debts, either very unsatisfactorily or not at all. And, as might be expected, new international credit transactions hardly continue to be a subject of serious consideration. We are no longer far removed from a situation in which it will be impossible to lend money abroad because the principle has gradually become accepted that any government is justified in forbidding debt payments to foreign countries at any time on grounds of foreign exchange policy. The real meaning of this foreign exchange policy is exhaustively discussed in the present book. Here let it merely be pointed out that this policy has much more seriously injured international economic relations during the last three years than protectionism did during the whole of the preceding 50 or 60 years. The measures that were taken during the World War included. This throttling of international credit can hardly be remedied otherwise than by setting aside the principle that it lies within the discretion of every government by invoking the shortage of foreign exchange that has been caused by its own actions to stop paying interest to foreign countries and also to prohibit interest and amortization payments on the part of its subjects. The only way in which this can be achieved will be by removing international credit transactions from the influence of national legislatures and creating a special international code for it, guaranteed and really enforced by the League of Nations. Unless these conditions are created, the granting of new international credit will hardly be possible. Since all nations have an equal interest in the restoration of international credit, it may probably be expected that attempts will be made in this direction during the next few years, provided that Europe does not sink any lower through war and revolution. But the monetary system that will constitute the foundation of such future agreements must necessarily be one that is based upon gold. Gold is not an ideal basis for a monetary system, 
Like all human creations, the gold standard is not free from shortcomings. But in the existing circumstances, there is no other way of emancipating the monetary system from changing influences of party politics and government interference, either in the present or so far as can be foreseen in the future. And no monetary system that is not free from these influences will be able to form the basis of credit transactions. Those who blame the gold standard should not forget that it was the gold standard that enabled the civilization of the 19th century to spread beyond the old capitalistic countries of Western Europe and made the wealth of these countries available for the development of the rest of the world. The savings of the few advanced capitalistic countries of a small part of Europe have called into being the modern productive equipment of the whole world. If the debtor countries refuse to pay their existing debts, they certainly ameliorate their immediate situation. But it is very questionable whether they do not at the same time greatly damage their future prospects. It consequently seems misleading in discussions of the currency question to talk of an opposition between the interests of the creditor and debtor nations, of those which are well supplied with capital and those which are ill supplied. It is the interests of the poorer countries who are dependent upon the importation of foreign capital for developing their productive resources that make the throttling of international credit seem so extremely dangerous. The dislocation of the monetary and credit system that is nowadays going on everywhere is not due, the fact cannot be repeated too often, to any inadequacy of the gold standard. The thing for which the monetary system of our time is chiefly blamed, the fall in prices during the last five years, is not the fault of the gold standard, but the inevitable and ineluctable consequence of the expansion of credit, which was bound to lead eventually to a collapse. And the thing which is chiefly advocated as a remedy is nothing but another expansion of credit, which as certainly might lead to a transitory boom but would be bound to end in a correspondingly severer crisis. The difficulties of the monetary and credit system are only a part of the great economic difficulties under which the world is at present suffering. It is not only the monetary and credit system that is out of gear, but the whole economic system. For years past, the economic policy of all countries has been in conflict with the principles on which the 19th century built up the welfare of the nations, International division of labor is now regarded as an evil, and there is a demand for a return to the autarky of remote antiquity. Every importation of foreign goods is heralded as a misfortune to be averted at all costs. With prodigious ardor, mighty political parties proclaim the gospel that peace on earth is undesirable and that war alone means progress. They do not content themselves with describing war as a reasonable form of international intercourse, but recommend the employment of force of arms for the suppression of opponents, even in the solution of questions of domestic politics. Whereas liberal economic policy took pains to avoid putting obstacles in the way of developments that allotted every branch of production to the locality in which it secured the greatest productivity to labor, Nowadays, the endeavor to establish enterprises in places where the conditions of production are unfavorable is regarded as a patriotic action that deserves government support. To demand of the monetary and credit system that it should do away with the consequences of such perverse economic policy is to demand something that is a little unfair. All proposals that aim to do away with the consequences of perverse economic and financial policy merely by reforming the monetary and banking system are fundamentally misconceived. Money is nothing but a medium of exchange, and it completely fulfills its function when the exchange of goods and services is carried on more easily with its help than would be possible by means of barter. Attempts to carry out economic reforms from the monetary side can never amount to anything but an artificial stimulation of the economic activity by an expansion of the circulation, and this, as must constantly be emphasized, must necessarily lead to crisis and depression. Recurring economic crises are nothing but the consequence of attempts, despite all the teachings of experience 
and all the warnings of the economists to stimulate economic activity by means of additional credit. This point of view is sometimes called the orthodox because it is related to the doctrines of the classical economists who are Great Britain's imperishable glory, and it is contrasted with the modern point of view which is expressed in doctrines that correspond to the ideas of mercantilists of the 16th and 17th centuries. I cannot believe that there is really anything to be ashamed of in orthodoxy. The important thing is not whether a doctrine is orthodox or the latest fashion, but whether it is true or false. And although the conclusion to which my investigations lead, that expansion of credit cannot form a substitute for capital, may well be a conclusion that some may find uncomfortable, yet I do not believe that any logical disproof of it can be brought forward. Ludwig von Mises, Vienna, June 1934 Preface to the Second German Edition When the first edition of this book was published twelve years ago, the nations and their governments were just preparing for the tragic enterprise of the Great War. They were preparing, not merely by piling up arms and munitions in their arsenals, but much more by the proclamation and zealous propagation of the ideology of war. The most important economic element in this war ideology was inflationism. My book also dealt with the problem of inflationism and attempted to demonstrate the inadequacy of its doctrines, and it referred to the changes that threatened our monetary system in the immediate future. This drew upon it passionate attacks from those who were preparing the way for the monetary catastrophe to come. Some of those who attacked it soon attained great political influence. They were able to put their doctrines into practice and to experiment with inflationism upon their own countries. Nothing is more perverse than the common assertion that economics broke down when faced with the problems of the war and post-war periods. To make such an assertion is to be ignorant of the literature of economic theory and to mistake for economics the doctrines based on excerpts from archives that are to be found in the writings of the adherents of the historico-empirico-realistic school. Nobody is more conscious of the shortcomings of economics than economists themselves, and nobody regrets its gaps and failings more. But all the theoretical guidance that the politician of the last ten years needed could have been learned from existing doctrine. Those who have derided and carelessly rejected as bloodless abstraction the assured and accepted results of scientific labor should blame themselves, not economics. It is equally hard to understand how the assertion could have been made that the experience of recent years has necessitated a revision of economics. The tremendous and sudden changes in the value of money that we have experienced have been nothing new to anybody acquainted with currency history. Neither the variations in the value of money, nor their social consequences, nor the way in which the politicians reacted to either were new to economists. It is true that these experiences were new to many etatists, and this is perhaps the best proof that the profound knowledge of history professed by these gentlemen was not genuine but only a cloak for their mercantilistic propaganda. The fact that the present work, although unaltered in essentials, is now published in a rather different form from that of the first edition is not due to any such reason as the impossibility of explaining new facts by old doctrines. It is true that, during the twelve years that have passed since the first edition was published, economics has made strides that it would be impossible to ignore and my own occupation with the problems of catalactics has led me in many respects to conclusions that differ from those of the first edition. My attitude towards the theory of interest is different today from what it was in 1911, and although in preparing this, as in preparing the first edition, I have been obliged to postpone any treatment of the problem of interest, which lies outside the theory of indirect exchange, in certain parts of the book it has, nevertheless, been necessary to refer to the problem. Again, on the question of crises, my opinions have altered in one respect. 
I have come to the conclusion that the theory which I put forward as an elaboration and continuation of doctrines of the currency school is in itself a sufficient explanation of crises and not merely a supplement to an explanation in terms of the theory of direct exchange, as I supposed in the first edition. Further, I have become convinced that the distinction between statics and dynamics cannot be dispensed with even in expounding the theory of money. In writing the first edition, I imagined that I should have to do without it, in order to not give rise to any misunderstandings on the part of the German reader. For in an article that had appeared shortly before in a widely read symposium, Altman had used the concepts static and dynamic, applying them to monetary theory in a sense that diverged from the terminology of the modern American school. Meanwhile, however, the significance of the distinction between statics and dynamics in modern theory has probably become familiar to everybody, who, even if not very closely, has followed the development of economics. It is safe to employ the terms nowadays without fear of their being confused with Altman's terminology. I have in part revised the chapter on the social consequences of variations in the value of money in order to clarify the argument. In the first edition, the chapter on monetary policy contains long historical discussions. The experiences of recent years afford sufficient illustrations of the fundamental argument to allow these discussions now to be dispensed with. A section on problems of banking policy of today has been added, and one in which the monetary theory and policy of the etatists are briefly examined. In compliance with the desire of several colleagues, I have also included a revised and expanded version of a short essay on the classification of theories of money, which was published some years ago in Volume 44 of the Archiv für Sozialwissenschaft und Sozialpolitik. For the rest, it has been far from my intention to deal critically with the flood of new publications devoted to the problems of money and credit. In science, as Spinoza says, the truth bears witness both to its own nature and to that of error. My book contains critical arguments only where they are necessary to establish my own views and to explain or prepare the ground for them. This omission can be the more easily justified in that this task of criticism is skillfully performed in two admirable works that have recently appeared. The concluding chapter of Part 3, which deals with problems of credit policy, is reprinted as it stood in the first edition. Its arguments refer to the position of banking in 1911, but the significance of its theoretical conclusions does not appear to have altered. They are supplemented by the above-mentioned discussion of the problems of present-day banking policy that concludes the present edition. But even in this additional discussion, proposals with any claim to absolute validity should not be sought for. Its intention is merely to show the nature of the problem at issue. The choice among all possible solutions in any individual case depends upon the evaluation of pros and cons. Decision between them is the function, not of economics, but of politics. L. von Mises, Vienna, March 1924The Theory of Money and Credit Written by Ludwig von Mises Narrated by Jim Van Forward by Murray N. Rothbard Ludwig von Mises' The Theory of Money and Credit is, quite simply, one of the outstanding contributions to economic thought in the 20th century. It came as the culmination and fulfillment of the Austrian school of economics, and yet, in so doing, founded a new school of thought of its own. The Austrian school came as a burst of light in a world of economics in the 1870s and 1880s, serving to overthrow the classical, or Ricardian, system, which had arrived at a dead end. This overthrow has often been termed the marginal revolution, but this is a highly inadequate label for the new mode of economic thinking. 
The essence of the new Austrian paradigm was analyzing the individual and his actions and choices as the fundamental building block of the economy. Classical economics thought in terms of broad classes and hence could not provide satisfactory explanations for value, price, or earnings in the market economy. The Austrians began with the actions of the individual. Economic value, for example, consisted of the valuations made by choosing individuals, and prices resulted from market interactions based on these valuations. The Austrian school was launched by Karl Menger, professor of economics at the University of Vienna, with the publication of his Principles of Economics in 1871. It was further developed and systematized by Menger's student and successor at Vienna, Eugen von baum Bauwerk, in his writings from the 1880s on, especially in various editions of his multi-volume Capital and Interest. Between them, and building on their fundamental analysis of individual valuation, action, and choice, Menger and baum Bauwerk explained all the aspects of what is today called microeconomics, utility, price, exchange, production, wages, interest, and capital. Ludwig von Mises was a third-generation Austrian, a brilliant student in baum Bauwerk's famous graduate seminar at the University of Vienna in the first decade of the 20th century. Mises' great achievement in The Theory of Money and Credit, published in 1912, was to take the Austrian method and apply it to the one glaring and vital lacuna in Austrian theory, the broad macro area of money and general prices. For monetary theory was still languishing in the Ricardian mold. Whereas general micro theory was founded in analysis of individual action and constructed market phenomena from these building blocks of individual choice, monetary theory was still holistic dealing in aggregates far removed from real choice, hence the total separation of the micro and macro spheres. While all other economic phenomena were explained as emerging from individual action, the supply of money was taken as a given external to the market, and supply was thought to impinge mechanistically on an abstraction called the price level. Gone was the analysis of individual choice that illuminated the micro area. The two spheres were analyzed totally separately and on very different foundations. This book performed the mighty feat of integrating monetary with micro theory, of building monetary theory upon the individualistic foundations of general economic analysis. Eugene von baum Bauwerk died soon after the publication of The Theory of Money and Credit, and the orthodox baum Bauerkians, locked in their old paradigm, refused to accept Mises' new breakthrough in the theory of money and business cycles. Mises, therefore, had to set about the arduous task of founding his own neo-Austrian, or Misesian, school of thought. He was handicapped by the fact that his post at the University of Vienna was not salaried. Yet, all during the 1920s, many brilliant students flocked to his private seminar. In the English-speaking world, acceptance of Mesesian ideas was gravely hampered by the simple but significant fact that few economists read any language other than English. Mises, The Theory of Money and Credit, was not translated into English until 1934, and the result was two decades of neglect of Misesian insights. Cash balance analysis was developed in the late 1920s in England by Sir Dennis H. Robertson, but his approach was holistic and aggregative and not built out of individual action. The purchasing power parity theory came to England and the United States only through the flawed and diluted form propounded by the Swedish economist Gustav Cassell, and neglect of the Kuhel Mises theory of ordinal marginal utility allowed Western economists, led by Hicks and Allen in the mid-1930s, to throw out marginal utility altogether in favor of the fallacious indifference curve approach now familiar in micro-textbooks. 
Mises' integration of micro and macro theory, his developed theory of money and the regression theorem, as well as his sophisticated analysis of inflation, were all totally neglected by later economists. The idea of integrating macro theory on micro foundations is further away from current economic practice than ever before. Only Mises' business cycle theory penetrated the English-speaking world, and this feat was accomplished by personal rather than literary means. Mises' outstanding follower, Friedrich A. von Hayek, immigrated to London in 1931 to assume a teaching post at the London School of Economics. Hayek, who had concentrated on developing Mises' insights into a systematic business cycle theory, managed quickly to convert the best of the younger generation of English economists, and one of the brightest in the group, Lionel Robbins, was responsible for the English translation of the theory of money and credit. For a few glorious years in the early 1930s, such youthful luminaries of English economics as Robbins, Nicholas, Caldor, John R. Hicks, Abba P. Lerner, and Frederick Benham fell under the strong influence of Hayek. In the meanwhile, Austrian followers of Mises' business cycle theory, notably Fritz Macklup and Gottfried von Haberler, began to be translated or published in the United States. Also in the United States, young Alvin H. Hansen was becoming the leading proponent of the Mises-Hayek cycle theory. Mises' business cycle theory was being adopted precisely as a cogent explanation of the Great Depression, a depression which Mises anticipated in the late 1920s. But, just as it was being spread through England and the United States, the Keynesian Revolution swept the economic world, converting even those who knew better. The conversion process won, not by patiently rebutting Misesian or other views, but simply by ignoring them, and leading the economic world into old and unsound inflationist views dressed up in superficially impressive new jargon. By the end of the 1930s, only Hayek and none of the other students of himself or Mises had remained true to the Misesian view of business cycles. Mises, the theory of money and credit, in its English version, barely had time to be read before the Keynesian Revolution of 1936 rendered pre-Keynesian thought, particularly on business cycles, psychologically inaccessible to the next generation of economists. Mises added Part 4 to the 1953 English language edition of the theory of money and credit, but Keynesian economics was riding high, and the world of economics was scarcely ready to resume attention to the Misesian insights. Now, however, and particularly since his death in 1973, Misesian economics has experienced a remarkable resurgence, especially in the United States. There are conferences, symposia, books, articles, and dissertations abounding in Austrian and Misesian economics. With the Keynesian system in total disarray, reeling from chronic and accelerating inflation, punctuated by periods of inflationary recession, Economists are more receptive to Misesian cycle theory than they have been in four decades. Let us hope that this new edition will stimulate economists to re-examine the other sparkling insights in this grievously neglected masterpiece, and that Mises' integration of money and banking with micro-theory will serve as the basis for future advances in monetary thought. New York, 1981 Forward to the 2009 edition. With the great bursting of the real estate bubble in 2008, the federal government is reforming and expanding its regulatory oversight in hopes of legislating away booms and busts. Recent decades have featured a series of speculative manias, followed by harrowing financial busts, with central banks applying the same tonic, a flood of monetary stimulus, to solve the nation's financial wounds. The repeated stimulus has only served to create new bubbles, continued malinvestment, and more financial pain. The Federal Reserve's easy money response to the collapse of long-term capital management in 1998 
led to the dot-com stock bubble and bust, which led to even more monetary easing that begat the housing bubble. Back in August 2002, Keynesian economist Paul Krugman, who would win the Nobel Prize in economics six years later, editorialized in the New York Times, This was a pre-war-style recession, a morning after brought on by irrational exuberance. To fight this recession, the Fed needs more than a snapback. It needs soaring household spending to offset moribund business investment, and to do that, as Paul McCulley of PIMCO put it, Alan Greenspan needs to create a housing bubble to replace the NASDAQ bubble. And create a housing bubble Greenspan did, by increasing the money supply nearly 30% in just two years after Krugman wrote his column. But in the aftermath, government now seeks to legislate stability, over the past two decades, we have seen time and again cycles of precipitous booms and busts, U.S. President Barack Obama told reporters as his administration rolled out new regulations to increase market stability. In each case, millions of people have had their lives profoundly disrupted by developments in the financial system, most severely in our recent crisis. The current chief economic advisor to the President of the United States, Lawrence Summers, speaks often of creating a new foundation for a less bubble-driven economy. With the idea that more regulation of the fractionalized banking system cartelized by a central bank will create such stability. Despite causing worldwide economic instability, central banks around the world are set to expand their reach to supervise the markets that their interventions distort. There is a logic to the systemic regulator being the central bank as they control monetary policy and can prick an asset bubble. Barbara Ridpath, chief executive of the International Center for Financial Regulation, told Reuters. Ms. Ridpath is talking about the same Federal Reserve that has diabolically crushed the value of the dollar. Since its exception in 1913, and especially since 1971, after the faintest of the remaining ties to gold were severed, and now, with the latest crisis, has expanded an unprecedented fashion. Well and truly, writes Grant's interest rate observer, the Fed isn't your father's central bank. The new, supersized Fed piles a huge superstructure of risky assets on a tiny sliver of capital. So while governments and their friends are stumping for central banks to have more regulatory power, Grants, using the work of Peter Stella at the International Monetary Fund, says that if the Fed's own examiners were handed the Fed's own financials, unlabeled of course, and asked to render a regulatory decision, they would order the place shut down. It is not lack of regulation that has caused the current depression, which is the economy desperately gasping to recover from multiple decades of Keynesian monetary stimulus and its disastrous effects. But politicians, bureaucrats, regulators, modern financial commentators, Nobel Prize-winning economists, and central bankers have proven they lack any knowledge of what money is and what causes business cycles. It was Ludwig von Mises, as Murray Rothbard wrote in Economic Depressions, Their Cause and Cure, who developed hints of his solution to the vital problem of the business cycle in his monumental Theory of Money and Credit, published in 1912, and still nearly 60 years later, the best book on the theory of money and banking. But Mises' great work has been ignored by policymakers. The federal response to the 2008 meltdown is 12 times greater than that to the Great Depression of the 1930s, according to Grants. And yet even this is not viewed as enough to save the economy. The Financial Times reports the existence of a Federal Reserve staff memorandum that makes the case for a negative 5% Fed funds rate. Meanwhile, Japanese authorities are toying with the idea of outlawing cash in that country. 
despite using every fiscal trick in the book and keeping interest rates at zero for a decade, that economy has been mired in a post-bubble depression. So the thinking is that nominal interest rates of zero are too high, and current theory would suggest that nominal interest rates of minus 4% might be closer to what is required to rescue the economy from another deflationary spiral, reported the Times online. These developments would not have surprised Mises. In discussing the freely vacillating currency, he wrote that the United States was committed to an inflationary policy. And except for the lively protests on the part of a few economists, the dollar would have been on its way to being the German mark of 1923. Indeed, America's debts at this writing exceed those of Germany in 1923, even relative to the size of the U.S. economy, author and financial commentator Bill Bonner writes, in fact, 100 times greater. Yet the future of the dollar is precarious. Mises, presciently penned in the theory of money and credit, dependent on the vicissitudes of the continuing struggle between a small minority of economists on the one hand and hosts of ignorant demagogues and their unorthodox allies on the other hand. As this new edition is being produced, the ignorant demagogues and their powerful allies are having their way, with all of us paying the price and prospects for the future bleak. But it is the demand for the republication of Mises' great monetary work that gives us hope. Hope that a new generation of economists will learn from this masterwork and take up the struggle for sound money and honest banking that will unleash capitalism's restorative magic. Douglas E. French, Auburn, Alabama, 2009 Introduction Of all branches of economic science, that part which relates to money and credit has probably the longest history and the most extensive literature. The elementary truths of the quantity theory were established at a time when speculation on other types of economic problems had hardly yet begun. By the middle of the 19th century, when, in the general theory of value, a satisfactory statistical system had not yet been established, the pamphlet literature of money and banking was tackling, often with marked success, many of the subtler problems of economic dynamics. At the present day, with all our differences, there is no part of economic theory which we feel to be more efficient to lend practical aid to the statesman and to the man of affairs than the theory of money and credit. Yet for all this, there is no part of the subject where the established results of analysis and experience have been so little systematized and brought into relation with the main categories of theoretical economics. Special monographs exist by the hundred. The pamphlet literature is so extensive as to surpass the power of any one man completely to assimilate it. Yet in English, at any rate, there has been so little attempt at synthesis of this kind that when Mr. Keynes came to write his treatise on money, he was compelled to lament the absence not only of an established tradition of arrangement, but even of a single example of a systematic treatment of the subject on a scale and of a quality comparable with that of the standard discussions of the central problems of pure equilibrium theory. In these circumstances, it is hoped that the present-day publication will meet a real need among English-speaking students. For the work of which it is a translation, the Theory de Geldist und der Unflausmittel of Professor von Mises of Vienna does meet just this deficiency. It deals systematically with the chief propositions of the theory of money and credit, and it brings them into relation both with the main body of analytical economics and with the chief problems of contemporary policy to which they are relevant. Commencing with a rigid analysis of the nature and function of money, it leads by a highly ingenious series of approximations from a discussion of the value of money under simple conditions, in which there is only one kind of money and no banking system, 
through an analysis of the phenomena of parallel currency and foreign exchanges to an extensive treatment of the problems of modern banking and the effects of credit creation on the capital structure and the stability of business. In continental circles, it has long been regarded as the standard textbook on the subject. It is hoped that it will fill a similar role in English-speaking countries. I know few works which convey a more profound impression of the logical unity and the power of modern economic analysis. It would be a great mistake, however, to suppose that systematization of the subject constituted the only, or indeed the chief, merit of this work. So many of the propositions which it first introduced have now found their way into the common currency of modern monetary theory that the English reader, coming to it for the first time more than twenty years after its first publication, may be inclined to overlook its merits as an original contribution to knowledge, a contribution from which much of what is most important and vital in contemporary discussions takes its rise. Who in 1912 had heard of forced saving, of disparities between the equilibrium and the money rates of interest, and of the cycle of fluctuations in the relations between the prices of producers' goods and consumers' goods, which is the result of the instability of credit? They are all here, not as an obiter dicta on what are essentially side issues, as is occasionally the case in the earlier literature, but as central parts of a fully articulated theoretical system, a system which the author has had the somewhat melancholy satisfaction of seeing abundantly verified by the march of subsequent events, first in the great inflations of the immediately post-war period, and later in the events which gave rise to the depression from which the world is now suffering. Nor should we overlook its contributions to the more abstract parts of the theory of the value of money. Professor von Mises shares with Marshall and one or two others the merit of having assimilated the treatment of this theory to the general categories of the pure theory of value, and his emphasis in the course of his assimilation on the relation between uncertainty and the size of the cash holding and the dependence of certain monetary phenomena on the absence of foresight anticipates much that has proved most fruitful in more recent speculation in these matters. In spite of a tendency observable in some quarters to revert to more mechanical forms of the quantity theory, in particular to proceed by way of a multiplication of purely tautological formulae, it seems fairly clear that further progress in the explanation of the more elusive monetary phenomena is likely to take place along this path. The present translation is based upon the text of the second German edition, published in 1924. Certain passages of no great interest to English readers have been omitted, and a chapter dealing with more or less purely German controversies has been placed in an appendix. The comments on policy, however, in Part 3, Chapter 6, have been left as they appeared in 1924. But the author, who has most generously lent assistance at every stage of the translation, has written a special introduction in which he outlines his views on the problems which have emerged since that date. A note in the appendix gives the German equivalents to the technical terms which have been employed to designate the different kinds of money, and discusses in detail the translation of one term for which no exact English equivalent existed. Lionel Robbins, London School of Economics, September 1934 Part 1. The Nature of Money Chapter 1. The Function of Money Section 1. The General Economic Conditions for the Use of Money Where the free exchange of goods and services is unknown, money is not wanted. In a state of society in which the division of labor was a purely domestic matter, and production and consumption were consummated within the single household, it would be just as useless as it would be for an isolated man. But, even in an economic order based on division of labor, money would still be unnecessary if the means of production were socialized. 
the control of production and the distribution of the finished product were in the hands of a central body, and individuals were not allowed to exchange the consumption goods allotted to them for the consumption goods allotted to others. The phenomenon of money presupposes an economic order in which production is based on division of labor, and in which private property consists not only in goods of the first order, consumption goods, but also in goods of higher orders, production goods. In such a society there is no systematic centralized control of production, for this is inconceivable without centralized disposal over the means of production. Production is anarchistic. What is to be produced and how it is to be produced is decided in the first place by the owners of the means of production, who produce, however, not only for their own needs but also for the needs of others, and in their valuations take into account not only the use value that they themselves attach to their products, but also the use value that these possess in the estimation of the other members of the community. The balancing of production and consumption takes place in the market, where the different producers meet to exchange goods and services by bargaining together. The function of money is to facilitate the business of the market by acting as a common medium of exchange. Section 2. The Origin of Money Indirect exchange is distinguished from direct exchange according as a medium is involved or not. Suppose that A and B exchange with each other a number of units of the commodities M and N. A acquires the commodity N because of the use value that it has for him. He intends to consume it. The same is true of B, who acquires the commodity of M for his immediate use. This is a case of direct exchange. If there are more than two individuals, and more than two kinds of commodity in the market, indirect exchange is also possible. A may then acquire a commodity P, not because he desires to consume it, but in order to exchange it for a second commodity, Q, which he does desire to consume. Let us suppose that A brings to the market two units of the commodity M, B two units of the commodity N, and C, two units of the commodity O, and that A wishes to acquire one unit of each of the commodities N and O, B, one unit of each of the commodities O and M, and C, one unit each of the commodities M and N. Even in this case, a direct exchange is possible if the subjective valuations of the three commodities permit the exchange of each unit of M, N, and O for a unit of one of the others. But if this or a similar hypothesis does not hold good, and in by far the greater number of all exchange transactions it does not hold good, then indirect exchange becomes necessary, and the demand for goods for immediate wants is supplemented by a demand for goods to be exchanged for others. Let us take, for example, the simple case in which the commodity P is desired only by holders of the commodity Q, while the commodity Q is not desired by the holders of the commodity P, but by those, say, of a third commodity, R, which, in its turn, is desired only by possessors of P. No direct exchange between these persons can possibly take place. If exchanges occur at all, they must be indirect, as, for instance, if the possessors of the commodity P exchange it for the commodity Q, and then exchange this for the commodity R, which is the one they desire for their own consumption. The case is not essentially different when supply and demand do not coincide quantitatively. For example, when one indivisible good has to be exchanged for various goods in the possession of several persons. Indirect exchange becomes more necessary as division of labor increases and wants become more refined. In the present stage of economic development, the occasions when direct exchange is both possible and actually effected have already become very, very exceptional. Nevertheless, even nowadays, they sometimes arise. Take, for instance, the payment of wages in kind. 
which is a case of direct exchange so long on the one hand as the employer uses the labor for the immediate satisfaction of his own needs and does not have to procure, through exchange, the goods in which the wages are paid, and so long, on the other hand, as the employee consumes the goods he receives and does not sell them. Such payments of wages in kind is still widely prevalent in agriculture, although even in this sphere its importance is being continually diminished by the extension of capitalistic methods of management and the development of division of labor. Thus, along with the demand in a market for goods for direct consumption, there is a demand for goods that the purchaser does not wish to consume but to dispose of by further exchange. It is clear that not all goods are subject to this sort of demand. An individual obviously has no motive for an indirect exchange if he does not expect that it will bring him nearer to his ultimate objective, the acquisition of goods for his own use. The mere fact that there would be no exchanging unless it was indirect could not induce individuals to engage in indirect exchange if they secured no immediate personal advantage from it. Direct exchange being impossible, and indirect exchange being purposeless from the individual point of view, no exchange would take place at all. Individuals have recourse to indirect exchange only when they profit by it. For example, only when the goods they acquire are more marketable than those which they surrender. Now, all goods are not equally marketable. While there is only a limited and occasional demand for certain goods, that for others is more general and constant. Consequently, those who bring goods of the first kind to market in order to exchange them for goods that they need themselves have, as a rule, a smaller prospect of success than those who offer goods of the second kind. If, however, they exchange their relatively unmarketable goods for such as are more marketable, they will get a step nearer to their goal and may hope to reach it more surely and economically than if they had restricted themselves to direct exchange. It was in this way that those goods that were originally the most marketable became common media of exchange. For example, goods into which all sellers of other goods first converted their wares and which it paid every would-be buyer of any other commodity to acquire first. And as soon as those commodities that were relatively most marketable had become common media of exchange, there was an increase in the difference between their marketability and that of all other commodities, and this in its turn further strengthened and broadened their position as media of exchange. Thus the requirements of the market have gradually led to the selection of certain commodities as common media of exchange. The group of commodities from which these were drawn was originally large and differed from country to country, but it has more and more contracted. Whenever a direct exchange seemed out of the question, each of the parties to a transaction would naturally endeavor to exchange his superfluous commodities not merely for more marketable commodities in general, but for the most marketable commodities. And among these, again, he would naturally prefer whichever particular commodity was the most marketable of all. The greater the marketability of the goods first acquired in indirect exchange, the greater would be the prospect of being able to reach the ultimate objective without further maneuvering. Thus, there would be an inevitable tendency for the less marketable of the series of goods used as media of exchange to be, one by one, rejected, until at last only a single commodity remained, which was universally employed as a medium of exchange, in a word, money. This stage of development in the use of media of exchange, the exclusive employment of a single economic good, is not yet completely attained. In quite early times, sooner in some places than in others, the extension of indirect exchange led to the employment of the two precious metals, gold and silver, as common media of exchange. But then there was a long interruption in the steady contraction of the group of goods employed for that purpose. For hundreds, even thousands of years, the choice of mankind has wavered undecided between gold and silver. The chief cause of this remarkable phenomenon is to be found in the natural qualities of the two metals. Being physically and chemically very familiar, 
they are almost equally serviceable for the satisfaction of human wants. For the manufacture of ornaments and jewelry of all kinds, the one has proven as good as the other. It is only in recent times that technological discoveries have been made which have considerably extended the range of uses of the precious metals and may have differentiated their utility more sharply. In isolated communities, the employment of one or other metal as sole common medium of exchange has occasionally been achieved, but this short-lived unity has always been lost again as soon as the isolation of the community has succumbed to participation in international trade. Economic history is the story of the gradual extension of the economic community beyond its original limits of the single household to embrace the nation and then the world but every increase in its size has led to a fresh duality of the medium of exchange whenever the two amalgamating communities have not had the same sort of money. It would not be possible for the final verdict to be pronounced until all the chief parts of the inhabited earth formed a single commercial area. For not until then would it be impossible for other nations with different monetary systems to join in and modify the international organization. Of course, if two or more economic goods had exactly the same marketability so that none of them was superior to the others as a medium of exchange, this would limit the development towards a unified monetary system. We shall not attempt to decide whether this assumption holds good of the two precious metals, gold and silver. The question, about which a bitter controversy has raged for decades, has no very important bearings upon the theory of the nature of money. For it is quite certain that even if a motive has not been provided by the unequal marketability of the goods used as a medium of exchange, unification would still have seemed a desirable aim for monetary policy. The simultaneous use of several kinds of money involves so many disadvantages and so complicates the technique of exchange that the endeavor to unify the monetary system would certainly have been made in any case. The theory of money must take into consideration all that is implied in the functioning of several kinds of money side by side. Only where its conclusions are unlikely to be affected one way or the other may it proceed from the assumption that a single good is employed as common medium of exchange. Elsewhere, it must take account of the simultaneous use of several media of exchange. To neglect this would be to shirk one of its most difficult tasks. Section 3. The Secondary Functions of Money The simple statement that money is a commodity whose economic function is to facilitate the interchange of goods and services does not satisfy those writers who are interested rather in the accumulation of material than in the increase of knowledge. Many investigators imagine that insufficient attention is devoted to the remarkable part played by money in economic life if it is merely credited with the function of being a medium of exchange. They do not think that due regard has been paid to the significance of money until they have enumerated half a dozen further functions, as if in an economic order founded on the exchange of goods there could be a more important function than that of the common medium of exchange. After Menger's review of the question, further discussion of the connection between the secondary functions of money and its basic function should be unnecessary. Nevertheless, certain tendencies in recent literature on money make it appear advisable to examine, briefly, these secondary functions. Some of them are coordinated with the basic function by many writers, and to show once more that all of them can be deduced from the function of money as common medium of exchange. This applies, in the first place, to the function fulfilled by money in facilitating credit transactions. It is simplest to regard this as part of its function as a medium of exchange. Credit transactions are, in fact, nothing but the exchange of present goods against future goods. Frequent reference is made in English and American writings to a function of money as a standard of deferred payments, but the original purpose of this expression was not to contrast a particular function of money with its ordinary economic function, 
but merely to simplify discussions about the influence of changes in the value of money upon the real amount of money debts. It serves this purpose admirably, but it should be pointed out that its use has led many writers to deal with the problems connected with the general economic consequences of changes in the value of money merely from the point of view of modifications in existing debt relations and to overlook their significance in all other connections. The functions of money, as a transmitter of value through time and space, may also be directly traced back to its function as medium of exchange. Menger has pointed out that the special suitability of goods for hoarding and their consequent widespread employment for this purpose has been one of the most important causes of their increased marketability and therefore of their qualification as media of exchange. As soon as the practice of employing a certain economic good as a medium of exchange becomes general, people begin to store up this good in preference to others. In fact, hoarding as a form of investment plays no great part in our present stage of economic development, its place having been taken by the purchase of interest-bearing property. On the other hand, money still functions today as a means for transporting value through space. This function, again, is nothing but a matter of facilitating the exchange of goods. The European farmer who immigrates to America and wishes to exchange his property in Europe for a property in America sells the former goes to America with the money, or a bill payable in money, and there purchases his new homestead. Here we have an absolute textbook example of an exchange facilitated by money. Particular attention has been devoted, especially in recent times, to the function of money as a general medium of payment. Indirect exchange divides a single transaction into two separate parts, which are connected merely by the ultimate intention of the exchangers to acquire consumption goods. Sale and purchase thus apparently become independent of each other. Furthermore, if the two parties to a sale and purchase transaction perform their respective parts of the bargain at different times, that of the seller preceding that of the buyer, purchase on credit, then the settlement of the bargain, or the fulfillment of the seller's part of it, which need not be the same thing, has no obvious connection with the fulfillment of the buyer's part. The same is true of all other credit transactions, especially of the most important sort of credit transaction, lending. The apparent lack of a connection between the two parts of a single transaction has been taken as a reason for regarding them as independent proceedings, for speaking of a payment as an independent legal act and consequently for attributing to money the function of being a common medium of payment. This is obviously incorrect. If the function of money as an object which facilitates dealings in commodities and capital is kept in mind, a function that includes the payment of money prices and repayment of loans, there remains neither necessity nor justification for further discussion of a special employment or even function of money as a medium of payment. The root of this error, as of many other errors in economics, must be sought in the uncritical acceptance of juristical conceptions and habits of thought. From the point of view of the law, outstanding debt is a subject which can and must be considered in isolation and entirely, or at least to some extent, without reference to the origin of the obligation to pay. Of course, in law, as well as in economics, money is only the common medium of exchange. But the principal, although not exclusive, motive of the law for concerning itself with money is the problem of payment. When it seeks to answer the question, what is money, it is in order to determine how monetary liabilities can be discharged. For the jurist, money is a medium of payment. The economist, to whom the problem of money presents a different aspect, may not adopt this point of view if he does not wish, at the very outset, to prejudice his prospects of contributing to the advancement of economic theory. Chapter 2. On the Measurement of Value Section 1. The Immeasurability of Subjective Use Values 
Although it is usual to speak of money as a measure of value and prices, the notion is entirely fallacious. So long as the subjective theory of value is accepted, this question of measurement cannot arise. In the older political economy, the search for a principle governing the measurement of value was to a certain extent justifiable. If, in accordance with an objective theory of value, the possibility of an objective concept of commodity values is accepted, and exchange is regarded as the reciprocal surrender of equivalent goods, then the conclusion necessarily follows that exchange transactions must be preceded by measurement of the quantity of value contained in each of the objects that are to be exchanged, and it is then an obvious step to regard money as the measure of value. But modern value theory has a different starting point. It conceives of value as the significance attributed to individual commodity units by a human being who wishes to consume or otherwise dispose of various commodities to the best advantage. Every economic transaction presupposes a comparison of values. But the necessity for such a comparison, as well as the possibility of it, is due only to the circumstance that the person concerned has to choose between several commodities. It is quite irrelevant whether this choice is between a commodity in his own possession and one in somebody else's possession, for which he might exchange it, or between the different uses to which he himself might put a given quantity of productive resources. In an isolated household in which, as on Robinson Crusoe's desert island, there is neither buying nor selling, changes in the stocks of goods of higher and lower orders do nevertheless occur whenever anything is produced or consumed. And these changes must be based upon valuations if their returns are to exceed the outlay they involve. The process of valuation remains fundamentally the same whether the question is one of transforming labor and flour into bread in the domestic bakehouse or of obtaining bread in exchange for clothes in the market. From the point of view of the person making the valuation, the calculation whether a certain act of production would justify a certain outlay of goods and labor is exactly the same as the comparison between the values of the commodities to be surrendered and the values of the commodities to be acquired that must precede an exchange transaction. For this reason, it has been said that every economic act may be regarded as a kind of exchange. Acts of valuation are not susceptible of any kind of measurement. It is true that everybody is able to say whether a certain piece of bread seems more valuable to him than a certain piece of iron, or less value than a certain piece of meat, and it is therefore true that everybody is in a position to draw up an immense list of comparative values, a list which will hold good only for a given point of time, since it must assume a given combination of wants and commodities. If the individual's circumstances change, then his scale of values changes also. But subjective valuation, which is the pivot of all economic activity, only arranges commodities in order of their significance. It does not measure this significance. And economic activity has no other basis than the value scales thus constructed by individuals. An exchange will take place when two commodity units are placed in a different order on the value scales of two different persons. In a market, exchanges will continue until it is no longer possible for reciprocal surrender of commodities by any two individuals to result in their each acquiring commodities that stand higher on their value scales than those surrendered. If an individual wishes to make an exchange on an economic basis, he has merely to consider the comparative significance in his own judgment of the quantities of commodities in question. Such an estimate of relative values in no way involves the idea of measurement. An estimate is a direct psychological judgment that is not dependent on any kind of intermediate or auxiliary process. Such considerations also provide the answer to a series of objections to the subjective theory of value. It would be rash to conclude because psychology has not succeeded and is not likely to succeed in measuring desires 
that it is therefore impossible, ultimately, to attribute the quantitatively exact exchange ratios of the market to subjective factors. The exchange ratios of commodities are based upon the value scales of the individuals dealing in the market. Suppose that A possesses three pears, and B two apples, and that A values the possession of two apples more than that of three pears, while B values the possession of three pears more than that of two apples. On the basis of these estimations, an exchange may take place in which three pears are given for two apples. Yet, it is clear that the determination of the numerically precise exchange ratio 2 to 3, taking a single fruit as a unit, in no way presupposes that A and B know exactly by how much the satisfaction promised by possession of the quantities to be acquired by exchange exceeds the satisfaction promised by possession of the quantities to be given up. General recognition of this fact, for which we are indebted to the authors of modern value theory, was hindered for a long time by a peculiar sort of obstacle. It is not altogether a rare thing that those very pioneers who have not hesitated to clear new paths for themselves and their followers by boldly rejecting outworn traditions and ways of thinking should yet shrink sometimes from all that is involved in the rigid application of their own principles. When this is so, it remains for those who come after to endeavor to put the matter right. The present is a case in point. On the subject of the measurement of value, as on a series of further subjects that are very closely bound up with it, the founders of the subjective theory of value refrained from the consistent development of their own doctrines. This is especially true of Bombauerk. At least it is especially striking in him, for the arguments of his which we are about to consider are embodied in a system that would have provided an alternative and, in the present writer's opinion, a better solution of the problem, if their author had only drawn the decisive conclusion from them. Bombauer points out that when we have to choose an actual life between several satisfactions which cannot be had simultaneously because our means are limited, the situation is often such that the alternatives are on the one hand big satisfaction and on the other hand a large number of homogeneous smaller satisfactions. Nobody will deny that it lies in our power to come to a rational decision in such cases, but it is equally clear that a judgment merely to the effect that a satisfaction of one sort is greater than a satisfaction of the other sort is adequate for such a decision as would even be a judgment that a satisfaction of the first sort is considerably greater than one of the other sort. Baumbauerk, therefore, concludes that the judgment must definitely affirm how many of the smaller satisfactions outweigh one of the first sort, or, in other words, how many times the one satisfaction exceeds one of the others in magnitude. The credit of having exposed the error contained in the identification of these two last propositions belongs to Kuel. The judgment that so many small satisfactions are outweighed by a satisfaction of another kind is in fact not identical with the judgment that the one satisfaction is so many times greater than one of the others. The two would be identical only if the satisfaction afforded by a number of commodity units taken together were equal to the satisfaction afforded by a single unit on its own multiplied by the number of units. That this assumption cannot hold good follows from Gossin's law of the satisfaction of wants. The two judgments, I would rather have eight plums than one apple, and I would rather have one apple than seven plums, do not in the least justify the conclusion that Bombauer draws from them when he states that, therefore, the satisfaction afforded by the consumption of an apple is more than seven times, but less than eight times as great as the satisfaction afforded by the consumption of a plum. The only legitimate conclusion is that the satisfaction from one apple is greater than the total satisfaction from seven plums, but less than the total satisfaction from eight plums. This is the only interpretation that can be harmonized with the fundamental conception expounded by the marginal utility theorists, and especially by Bombauer himself, that the utility 
and consequently the subjective use value also of units of a commodity decreases as the supply of them increases. But to accept this is to reject the whole idea of measuring the subjective use value of commodities. Subjective use value is not susceptible of any kind of measurement. The American economist Irving Fisher has attempted to approach the problem of value measurement by way of mathematics. His success with this method has been no greater than that of his predecessors with other methods. Like them, he has not been able to surmount the difficulties arising from the fact that marginal utility diminishes as supply increases, and the only use of the mathematics in which he clothes his argument, and which is widely regarded as a particularly becoming dress for investigations in economics, is to conceal a little the defects of their clever but artificial construction. Fisher begins by assuming that the utility of a particular good or service, though dependent on the supply of that good or service, is independent of the supply of all others. He realizes that it will not be possible to achieve his aim of discovering a unit for the measurement of utility unless he can first show how to determine the proportion between two given marginal utilities. If, for example, an individual has a hundred loaves of bread at his disposal during one year, the marginal utility of a loaf to him will be greater than if he had 150 loaves. The problem is to determine the arithmetical proportion between the two marginal utilities. Fisher attempts to do this by comparing them with a third utility. He therefore supposes the individual to have B gallons of oil annually as well, and calls beta that increment of B whose utility is equal to that of the one hundredth loaf of bread. In the second case, when not a hundred but a hundred and fifty loaves are available, it is assumed that the supply of B remains unchanged. Then the utility of the one hundred fiftieth loaf may be equal, say, to the utility of beta over 2. Up to this point, it is unnecessary to quarrel with Fisher's argument, but now follows a jump that neatly avoids all the difficulties of the problem. That is to say, Fisher simply continues as if he were stating something quite self-evident. Then the utility of the 150th loaf is said to be half the utility of the 100th. Without any further explanation, he then calmly proceeds with his problem, the solution of which, if the above proposition is accepted as correct, involves no further difficulties, and so succeeds eventually in deducing a unit which he calls a util. It does not seem to have occurred to him that, in the particular sentence just quoted, he has argued in defiance of the whole of marginal utility theory and set himself in opposition to all the fundamental doctrines of modern economics. For obviously this conclusion of his is legitimate only if the utility of beta is equal to twice the utility of beta over 2. But if this were really so, the problem of determining the proportion between two marginal utilities could have been solved in a quicker way, and his long process of deduction would not have been necessary. Just as justifiably, as he assumes the utility of beta is equal to twice the utility of beta over 2, he might have assumed straight away that the utility of the 150th loaf is two-thirds of that of the 100th. Fisher imagines a supply of B gallons that is divisible into N small quantities, beta or 2N small quantities, beta over 2. He assumes that an individual who has this supply B at his disposal regards the value of a commodity unit X as equal to that of beta and the value of another commodity unit Y as equal to that of beta over 2. And he makes the further assumption that in both valuations, i.e. both in equating the value of X with that of beta and in equating the value of Y with that of beta over 2, the individual has the same supply of B gallons at his disposal. He evidently thinks it is possible to conclude from this that the utility of beta is twice as great as that of beta over 2. The error here is obvious. The individual is in one case faced, 
with the choice between x, the value of the 100th loaf, and beta equals 2 beta over 2. He finds it impossible to decide between the two, i.e. he values both equally. In the second case, he has to choose between y, the value of the 150th loaf, and beta over 2. Here again, he finds that both alternatives are of equal value. Now, the question arises. What is the proportion between the marginal utility of beta and that of beta over 2? We can determine this only by asking ourselves what the proportion is between the marginal utility of the nth part of a given supply and that of the 2 nth part of the same supply, between that of beta over n and that of beta over 2n. For this purpose, let us imagine the supply B split up into 2n portions of beta over 2n. Then the marginal utility of the 2n minus 1 the proportion is greater than that of the 2 nth portion. If we now imagine the same supply B divided into n portions, then it clearly follows that the marginal utility of the nth portion is equal to that of the 2 n minus 1 -th portion, plus that of the 2 nth portion in the previous case. It is not twice as great as that of the 2 nth portion, but more than twice as great. In fact, even with an unchanged supply, the marginal utility of several units taken together is not equal to the marginal utility of one unit multiplied by the number of units, but necessarily greater than this product. The value of two units is greater than, but not twice as great as, the value of one unit. Perhaps Fisher thinks that this consideration may be disposed of by supposing beta and beta over 2 to be such small quantities that their utility may be reckoned infinitesimal. If this really is his opinion, then it must first of all be objected that the peculiarly mathematical conception of infinitesimal quantities is inapplicable to economic problems. The utility afforded by a given amount of commodities or by a given increase in a given amount of commodities is either great enough for valuation or so small that it remains imperceptible to the valuer and cannot therefore affect his judgment. But even if the applicability of the conception of infinitesimal quantities were granted, the argument would still be invalid for it is obviously impossible to find the proportion between two finite marginal utilities by equating them with two infinitesimal marginal qualities. Finally, a few words must be devoted to Schumpeter's attempt to set up as a unit the satisfaction resulting from the consumption of a given quantity of commodities and to express other satisfactions as multiples of this unit. Value judgments on this principle would have to be expressed as follows. The satisfaction that I could get from the consumption of a certain quantity of commodities is a thousand times as great as that which I get from the consumption of an apple a day. Or, for this quantity of goods, I would give at most a thousand times this apple. Is there really anybody on earth who is capable of adumbrating such mental images or pronouncing such judgments? Is there any sort of economic activity that is actually dependent on the making of such decisions? Obviously not. Schumpeter makes the same mistake of starting with the assumption that we need a measure of value in order to be able to compare one quantity of value with another. But valuation, in no way, consists in comparison of two quantities of value. It consists solely in the comparison of the importance of different wants. The judgment, commodity A is worth more to me than commodity B, no more presupposes a measure of economic value than the judgment, A is dearer to me, more highly esteemed, than B presupposes a measure of friendship. Section 2. Total Value If it is impossible to measure subjective use value, it follows directly that it is impracticable to ascribe quantity to it. We may say the value of this commodity is greater than the value of that, 
but it is not permissible for us to assert this commodity is worth so much. Such a way of speaking necessarily implies a definite unit. It really amounts to stating how many times a given unit is contained in the quantity to be defined. But this kind of calculation is quite inapplicable to the process of valuation. The consistent application of these principles implies a criticism also of Schumpeter's views on the total value of a stock of goods. According to Wieser, the total value of a stock of goods is given by multiplying the number of items or portions constituting the stock by their marginal utility at any given moment. The untenability of this argument is shown by the fact that it would prove that the total stock of a free good must always be worth nothing. Schumpeter therefore suggests a different formula in which each portion is multiplied by an index corresponding to its position on the value scale, which, by the way, is quite arbitrary. And these products are then added together or integrated. This attempt at a solution, like the preceding, has the defect of assuming that it is possible to measure marginal utility and intensity of value. The fact that such measurement is impossible renders both suggestions equally useless. Mastery of the problem must be sought in some other way. Value is always the result of a process of valuation. The process of valuation compares the significance of two complexes of commodities from the point of view of the individual making the valuation. The individual making the valuation and the complexes of goods valued, i.e., the subject and objects of the valuation, must enter as indivisible elements into any given process of valuation. This does not mean that they are necessarily indivisible in other respects as well, whether physically or economically, the subject of an act of valuation may quite well be a group of persons, a state, or society, or family, so long as it acts in this particular case as a unit through a representative. And the objects thus valued may be collections of distinct units of commodities so long as they have to be dealt with in this particular case as a whole. There is nothing to prevent either subject or object from being a single unit for the purposes of one valuation, even though in another their component parts may be entirely independent of each other. The same people who, acting together through a representative as a single agent, such as a state, make a judgment as to the relative values of a battleship and a hospital, are the independent subjects of valuation of other commodities, such as cigars and newspapers. It is just the same with commodities. Modern value theory is based on the fact that it is not the abstract importance of different kinds of need that determines the scales of values, but the intensity of specific desires. Starting from this, the law of marginal utility was developed in a form that referred primarily to the usual sort of case in which the collections of commodities are divisible. But there also are cases in which the total supply must be valued as it stands. Suppose that an economically isolated individual possesses two cows and three horses, and that the relevant part of his scale of values, that item valued highest being placed first, is as follows. 1. A cow. 2. A horse. 3. A horse. 4. A horse. 5. A cow. If this individual has to choose between one cow and one horse, he will rather be inclined to sacrifice the cow than the horse. If wild animals attack one of his cows and one of his horses, and it is impossible for him to save both, then he will try to save the horse. But if the whole of his stock of either animal is in danger, his decision will be different. Supposing that his stable and cow shed catch fire, and that he can only rescue the occupants of one and must leave the others to their fate. Then if he values three horses less than two cows, he will attempt to save not the three horses, but the two cows. The result of that process of valuation, which involves a choice between one cow and one horse, is a higher estimation of the horse. The result of the process of valuation, which involves a choice between the whole available stock of cows and the whole available stock of horses, 
is a higher estimation of the stock of cows. Value can be rightly spoken of with regard to specific acts of appraisal. It exists in such connections only. There is no value outside the process of valuation. There is no such thing as abstract value. Total value can be spoken of only with reference to a particular instance of an individual or other valuing subject having to choose between the total available quantities of certain economic goods. Like every other act of valuation, this is complete in itself. The person making the choice does not have to make use of notions about the value of units of the commodity. His process of valuation, like every other, is an immediate inference from considerations of the utilities at stake. When a stock is valued as a whole, its marginal utility, that is to say the utility of the last available unit of it, coincides with its total utility, since the total supply is one indivisible quantity. This is also true of the total value of free goods, whose separate units are always valueless, i.e., are always relegated to a sort of limbo at the very end of the value scale, promiscuously intermingled with the units of all other free goods. Section 3. Money as a Price Index what has been said should have made sufficiently plain the unscientific nature of the practice of attributing to money the function of acting as a measure of price or even value. Subjective value is not measured, but graded. The problem of the measurement of objective use value is not an economic problem at all. It may incidentally be remarked that a measurement of efficiency is not possible for every species of commodity and is, at best, only available within separate species, while every possibility, not only of measurement, but even of mere scaled comparison, vanishes as soon as we seek to establish a relation between two or more kinds of efficiency. It may be possible to measure and compare the calorific value of gold and of wood, but it is in no way possible to reduce to a common objective denominator the objective efficiency of a table and that of a book. Neither is objective exchange value measurable, for it too is the result of the comparisons derived from the valuations of individuals. The objective exchange value of a given commodity unit may be expressed in units of every other kind of commodity. Nowadays, exchange is usually carried on by means of money, and since every commodity has therefore a price expressible in money, the exchange value of every commodity can be expressed in terms of money. This possibility enabled money to become a medium for expressing values when the growing elaboration of the scale of values which resulted from the development of exchange necessitated a revision of the technique of valuation. That is to say, opportunities for exchanging induce the individual to rearrange his scales of value. A person in whose scale of values the commodity a cask of wine comes after the commodity a sack of oats will reverse their order if he can exchange a cask of wine in the market for a commodity that he values more highly than a sack of oats. The position of commodities in the value scales of individuals is no longer determined solely by their own subjective use value, but also by the subjective use value of the commodities that can be obtained in exchange for them, whenever the latter stand higher than the former in the estimation of the individual. Therefore, if he is to obtain the maximum utility from his resources, the individual must familiarize himself with all the prices in the market. For this, however, he needs some help in finding his way among the confusing multiplicity of the exchange ratios. Money, the common medium of exchange, which can be exchanged for every commodity, and with which every commodity can be procured, is preeminently suitable for this. It would be absolutely impossible for the individual, even if he were a complete expert in commercial matters, to follow every change of market conditions and make the corresponding alterations in his scale of use and exchange values unless he chose some common denominator to which he could reduce each exchange ratio. 
Because the market enables any commodity to be turned into money, and money into any commodity, objective exchange value is expressed in terms of money. Thus, money becomes a price index, in Menger's phrase. The whole structure of the calculations of the entrepreneur and the consumer rests on the process of valuing commodities in money. Money has thus become an aid that the human mind is no longer able to dispense with in making economic calculations. If in this sense we wish to attribute to money the function of being a measure of prices, there is no reason why we should not do so. Nevertheless, it is better to avoid the use of a term which might so easily be misunderstood as this. In any case, the usage certainly cannot be called correct. We do not usually describe the determination of latitude and longitude as a function of the stars. Chapter 3. The Various Kinds of Money Section 1. Money and Money Substitutes when an indirect exchange is transacted with the aid of money, it is not necessary for the money to change hands physically. A perfectly secure claim to an equivalent sum, payable on demand, may be transferred instead of the actual coins. In this by itself there is nothing remarkable or peculiar to money. What is peculiar, and only to be explained by reference to the special characteristics of money, is the extraordinary frequency of this way of completing monetary transactions. In the first place, money is especially well adapted to constitute the substance of a generic obligation, whereas the fungibility of nearly all other economic goods is more or less circumscribed and is often only a fiction based on an artificial commercial terminology, that of money is almost unlimited. Only that of shares and bonds can be compared with it. The sole factor that could possibly prevent any of these from being completely fungible is the difficulty of subdividing their separate units, and various expedients have been adopted which, at least as far as money is concerned, have entirely robbed this difficulty of all practical significance. A still more important circumstance is involved in the nature of the function that money performs. A claim to money may be transferred over and over again in an indefinite number of indirect exchanges without the person by whom it is payable ever being called upon to settle it. This is obviously not true as far as other economic goods are concerned, for these are always destined for ultimate consumption. The special suitability for facilitating indirect exchanges possessed by absolutely secure and immediately payable claims to money, which we may briefly refer to as money substitutes, is further increased by their standing in law and commerce. Technically, and in some countries legally as well, the transfer of a banknote scarcely differs from that of a coin. The similarity of outward appearance is such that those who are engaged in commercial dealings are usually unable to distinguish between those objects that actually perform the function of money and those that are merely employed as substitutes for them. The businessman does not worry about the economic problems involved in this. He is only concerned with the commercial and legal characteristics of coins, notes, checks, and the like. To him, the facts that banknotes are transferable without documentary evidence, that they circulate like coins in round denominations, that no right of recovery lies against their previous holders, that the law recognizes no difference between them and money as an instrument of debt settlement, seem good enough reason for including them within the definition of the term money, and for drawing a fundamental distinction between them and cash deposits which can be transferred only by a procedure that is much more complex technically and is also regarded in law as of a different kind. This is the origin of the popular conception of money by which everyday life is governed. No doubt it serves the purposes of the bank official, and it may even be quite useful in the business world at large. But its introduction into the scientific terminology of economics is most undesirable. 
The controversy about the concept of money is not exactly one of the most satisfactory chapters in the history of our science. It is chiefly remarkable for the smother of juristic and commercial technicalities in which it is enveloped, and for the quite undeserved significance that has been attached to what is, after all, merely a question of terminology. The solution of the question has been regarded as an end in itself, and it seems to have been completely forgotten that the real aim should have been simply to facilitate further investigation. Such a discussion could not fail to be fruitless. In attempting to draw a line of division between money and those objects that outwardly resemble it, we only need to bear in mind the goal of our investigation. The present discussion aims at tracing the laws that determine the exchange ratio between money and other economic goods. This, and nothing else, is the task of the economic theory of money. Now, our terminology must be suited to our problem. If a particular group of objects is to be singled out from among all those that fulfill a monetary function in commerce, and under the special name of money, which is to be reserved to this group alone, sharply contrasted with the rest to which this name is denied, then this destruction must be made in a way that will facilitate the further progress of the investigation. It is considerations such as these that have led the present writer to give the name of money substitutes and not that of money to those objects that are employed like money in commerce, but consist in perfectly secure and immediately convertible claims to money. Claims are not goods. They are means of obtaining disposal over goods. This determines their whole nature and economic significance. They themselves are not valued directly, but indirectly. Their value is derived from that of the economic goods to which they refer. Two elements are involved in the valuation of a claim. First, the value of the goods to whose possession it gives a right. And second, the greater or less probability that possession of the goods in question will actually be obtained. Furthermore, if the claim is to come into force only after a period of time, then consideration of this circumstance will constitute a third factor in its valuation. The value on January 1st of a right to receive 10 sacks of gold on December 31st of the same year will be based not directly on the value of 10 sacks of coal, but on the value of 10 sacks of coal to be delivered in a year's time. This sort of calculation is a matter of common experience, as also is the fact that in reckoning the value of claims, their soundness or security is taken into account. Claims to money are, of course, no exception. Those which are payable on demand, if there is no doubt about their soundness and no expense connected with their settlement, are valued just as highly as cash and tendered and accepted in the same way as money. Only claims of this sort, i.e. claims that are payable on demand, absolutely safe as far as human foresight goes and perfectly liquid in the legal sense, are for business purposes exact substitutes for the money to which they refer. Other claims, of course, such as notes issued by banks of doubtful credit or bills that are not yet mature, also enter into financial transactions that may just as well be employed as general media of exchange. This, according to our terminology, means that they are money. But then they are valued independently. They are reckoned equivalent neither to the sums of money to which they refer, nor even to the worth of the rights that they embody. What the further special factors are that help to determine their exchange value, we shall discover in the course of our argument. Of course, it would be in no way incorrect if we attempted to include in our concept of money those absolutely secure and immediately convertible claims to money that we have preferred to call money substitutes. But what must be entirely condemned is the widespread practice of giving the name of money to certain classes of money substitutes, usually banknotes, token money, and the like, and contrasting them sharply with the remaining kinds, such as cash deposits. This is to make a distinction without any adequate difference, for banknotes, say, and cash deposits differ only in mere externals, important perhaps from the business and legal points of view, 
but quite insignificant from the points of view of economics. On the other hand, arguments of considerable weight may be urged in favor of including all money substitutes without exception in the single concept of money. It may be pointed out, for instance, that the significance of perfectly secure and liquid claims to money is quite different from that of claims to other economic goods. That, whereas a claim on a commodity must sooner or later be liquidated, this is not necessarily true of claims to money. Such claims may pass from hand to hand for indefinite periods, and so take the place of money without any attempt being made to liquidate them. It may be pointed out that those who require money will be quite satisfied with such claims as these, and that those who wish to spend money will find that these claims answer their purpose just as well, and that consequently the supply of money substitutes must be reckoned in with that of money, and the demand for them with the demand for money. It may further be pointed out that whereas it is impossible to satisfy an increase in the demand, say, for bread, by issuing more bread tickets without adding to the actual supply of bread itself, it is perfectly possible to satisfy an increased demand for money by just such a process as this. It may be argued in brief that money substitutes have certain peculiarities of which account is best taken by including them in the concept of money. Without wishing to question the weight of such arguments as these, we shall, on grounds of convenience, prefer to adopt the narrower formulation of the concept of money, supplementing it with a separate concept of money substitutes. Whether this is the most advisable course to pursue, whether perhaps some other procedure might not lead to a better understanding of our subject matter must be left to the judgment of the reader. To the author it appears that the way chosen is the only way in which the difficult problems of the theory of money can be solved. Section 2. The Peculiarities of Money Substitutes Economic discussion about money must be based solely on economic considerations and may take legal distinctions into account only in so far as they are significant from the economic point of view also. Such discussion, consequently, must proceed from a concept of money based not on legal definitions and discriminations, but on the economic nature of things. It follows that our decision not to regard drafts and other claims to money as constituting money itself must not be interpreted merely in accordance with the narrow juristic concept of a claim to money. Besides strictly legal claims to money, we must also take into account such relationships as are not claims in the juristic sense, but are nevertheless treated as such in commercial practice because some concern or other deals with them as if they actually did constitute claims against itself. There can be no doubt that the German token coin minted in accordance with the Coinage Act of July 9, 1873, did not in law constitute claims to money. Perhaps there are some superficial critics who would be inclined to classify these coins actually as money because they consisted of stamped silver or nickel or copper discs that had every appearance of being money, but despite this, from the point of view of economics, these token coins merely constituted drafts on the national treasury. The second paragraph of Section 9 of the Coinage Act, in its form of June 1, 1909, obliged the Bundesrat to specify those centers that would pay out gold coins on demand in return for not less than 200 marks worth of silver coins or 50 marks worth of nickel and copper coins. Certain branches of the Reichsbank were entrusted with this function. Another section of the Coinage Act, Section 8, provided that the Reich would always be in a position actually to maintain this convertibility. According to this section, the total value of the silver coins minted was never to exceed 20 marks per head of the population, nor that of the nickel and copper coins, 2.5 marks per head. In the opinion of the legislature, these sums represented the demand for small coins, and there was consequently no danger that the total issue of token coinage would exceed the public demand for it. 
Admittedly, there was no statutory recognition of any right to conversion on the part of holders of token coins, and the limitation of legal tender, section 9, paragraph 1, was only an inadequate substitute for this. Nevertheless, it is a matter of general knowledge that the token coins were in fact cashed without any demur at the branches of the Reichsbank specified by the Chancellor. Exactly the same sort of significance was enjoyed by the Reich Treasury notes, of which not more than 120 million marks worth were allowed to be in circulation. These also, Section 5 of the Act of April 30, 1874, were always cashed for gold by the Reichsbank on behalf of the Treasury. It is beside the point that the Treasury notes were not legal tender in private transactions, while everybody was obliged to accept silver coins in amounts up to 20 marks and nickel and copper coins in amounts up to 1 mark, for, although they were not legally bound to accept them in settlement of debts, people in fact accepted them readily. Another example is afforded by the German Thaler of the period from the introduction of the gold standard until the withdrawal of the Thaler from circulation on October 1, 1907. During the whole of this period, the Thaler was undoubtedly legal tender, but if we seek to go behind this expression, whose juristic derivation makes it useless for our present purpose, and ask if the Thaler was money during this period, the answer must be that it was not. It is true that it was employed in commerce as a medium of exchange, but it could be used in this way solely because it was a claim to something that really was money, i.e. to the common medium of exchange, for although neither the Reichsbank nor the Reich nor its separate constituent kingdoms and duchies nor anybody else was obliged to cash them, the Reichsbank, acting on behalf of the government, always took pains to ensure that no more thalers were in circulation than were demanded by the public. It achieved this result by refusing to press thalers on its customers when paying out. This, together with the circumstance that the thalers were legal tender, both to the bank and to the Reich, was sufficient to turn them, in effect, into drafts that could always be converted into money, with the result that they circulated at home as perfectly satisfactory substitutes for money. It was repeatedly suggested to the directors of the Reichsbank that they should cash their own notes not in gold but in thalers, which would have been well within the letter of the law, and pay out gold only at a premium, with the object of hindering the export of it. But the bank steadily refused to adopt this or any proposal of a similar nature. The exact nature of the token coinage in other countries has not always been so easy to understand as that of Germany, whose banking and currency system was fashioned under the influence of such men as Bamberger, Michaelis, and Sotbier. In some legislation, the theoretical basis of modern token coinage policy may not be so easy to discover or to demonstrate as in the examples already dealt with. But nevertheless, all such policy has ultimately the same intent. The universal legal peculiarity of token coinage is the limitation of its power of payment to a specified maximum sum. And, as a rule, this provision is supplemented by legislative restriction of the amount that may be meted. There is no such thing as an economic concept of token coinage. All that economics can distinguish is a particular subgroup within the group of claims to money that are employed as substitutes for money, the members of this subgroup being intended for use in transactions where the amounts involved are small. The fact that the issue and circulation of token coinage are subjected to special legal rules and regulations is to be explained by the special nature of the purpose that they serve. The general recognition of the right of the holder of a banknote to receive money in exchange for it, while the conversion of token coins is in many countries left to administrative discretion, is a result of the different lines of development that notes and token coinage have followed respectively. Token coins have arisen from the need for facilitating the exchange of small quantities of goods of little value. The historical details of their development have not yet been brought to light, and Almost without exception, 
all that has been written on the subject is of purely numismatical or metrological importance. Nevertheless, one thing can safely be asserted that token coinage is always the result of attempts to remedy deficiencies in the existing monetary system. It is those technical difficulties that hinder the subdivision of the monetary unit into small coins that have led, after all sorts of unsuccessful attempts, to the solution of the problem that we adopt nowadays. In many countries, while this development has been going on, a kind of fiat money has sometimes been used in small transactions, with the very inconvenient consequence of having two independent kinds of money performing side by side the function of a common medium of exchange. To avoid the inconveniences of such a situation, the small coins were brought into a fixed legal ratio with those used in larger transactions, and the necessary precautions were taken to prevent the quantity of small coins from exceeding the requirements of commerce. The most important means to this end has always been the restriction of the quantity meted to that which seems likely to be needed for making small payments. Whether this is fixed by law or strictly adhered to without such compulsion. Along with this has gone the limitation of legal tender in private dealings to a certain relatively small amount. The danger that these regulations would prove inadequate has never seemed very great, and consequently, legislative provision for conversion of the token coins has been either entirely neglected or left incomplete by omission of a clear statement of the holder's right to change them for money. But everywhere nowadays those token coins that are rejected from circulation are accepted without demur by the state or some other body such as the central bank, and thus their nature as claims to money is established. Where this policy has been discontinued for a time and the attempt made by suspending effectual conversion of the token coins to force more of them into circulation than was required, they have become credit money or even commodity money. Then, they have no longer been regarded as claims to money, payable on demand, and therefore equivalent to money, but have been valued independently. The bank note has followed quite a different line of development. It has always been regarded as a claim, even from the juristic point of view. The fact has never been lost sight of that if its value was to be kept equal to that of money, steps would have to be taken to ensure its permanent convertibility into money. That a cessation of cash payments would alter the economic character of banknotes could hardly escape notice. In the case of the quantitatively less important coins used in small transactions, it could more easily be forgotten. Furthermore, the smaller quantitative importance of token coins means that it is possible to maintain their permanent convertibility without establishing special funds for the purpose. The absence of such special funds may have also helped to disguise the real nature of token coinage. Consideration of the monetary system of Austria-Hungary is particularly instructive. The currency reform that was inaugurated in 1892 was never formally completed, and until the disruption of the Habsburg monarchy, the standard remained legally what it usually called a paper standard. Since the Austro-Hungarian bank was not obliged to redeem its own notes, which were legal tender to any amount. Nevertheless, from 1900 to 1914, Austria-Hungary really possessed a gold standard or gold exchange standard for the bank did in fact readily provide gold for commercial requirements. Although, according to the letter of the law, it was not obliged to cash its notes, it offered bills of exchange and other claims payable abroad in gold, checks, notes, and the like, at a price below the upper theoretical gold point. Under such conditions, those who wanted gold for export naturally preferred to buy claims of this sort, which enabled them to achieve their purpose more cheaply than by the actual export of gold. For internal commerce as well, in which the use of gold was exceptional since the population had many years before gone over to banknotes and token coins, the bank cashed its notes for gold without being legally bound to do so. And this policy was pursued not accidentally or occasionally or without full recognition of its significance, 
but deliberately and systematically with the object of permitting Austria and Hungary to enjoy the economic advantages of the gold standard. Both the Austrian and the Hungarian governments, to whose initiative this policy of the bank was due, cooperated as far as they were able. But in the first place, it was the bank itself which had to ensure, by following an appropriate discount policy, that it would always be in a position to carry out with promptitude its voluntary undertaking to redeem its notes. The measures that it took with this purpose in view did not differ fundamentally in any way from those adopted by the banks of issue in other gold standard countries. Thus the notes of Austro-Hungarian Bank were in fact nothing but money substitutes. The money of the country, as of other European countries, was gold. Section 3. Commodity Money, Credit Money, and Fiat Money the economic theory of money is generally expressed in a terminology that is not economic, but juristic. This terminology has been built up by writers, statesmen, merchants, judges, and others whose chief interests have been in the legal characteristics of the different kinds of money and their substitutes. It is useful for dealing with those aspects of the monetary system that are of importance from the legal point of view, but for purposes of economic investigation, it is practically valueless. Sufficient attention has scarcely been devoted to this shortcoming, despite the fact that confusion of the respective provinces of the sciences of law and economics has nowhere been so frequent and so fraught with mischievous consequences as in this very sphere of monetary theory. It is a mistake to deal with economic problems according to legal criteria. The juristic phraseology, like the results of juristic research into monetary problems, must be regarded by economics as one of the objects of its investigations. It is not the task of economics to criticize it, although it is entitled to exploit it for its own purposes. There is nothing to be said against using juristic technical terms in economic argument where this leads to no undesirable consequences. But for its own special purposes, economics must construct its own special terminology. There are two sorts of things that might be used as money. On the one hand, physical commodities as such, like the metal gold or metal silver. And on the other hand, objects that do not differ technologically from other objects that are not money, the factor that decides whether they are money being not a physical but a legal characteristic. A piece of paper that is specially characterized as money by the imprint of some authority is in no way different, technologically considered, from another piece of paper that has received a similar imprint from an unauthorized person just as the genuine five-franc piece does not differ technologically from a genuine replica. The only difference lies in the law that regulates the manufacture of such coins and makes it impossible without authority. In order to avoid every possible misunderstanding, let it be expressly stated that all that the law can do is to regulate the issue of coins and that it is beyond the power of the state to ensure, in addition, that they actually shall become money, that is, that they actually shall be employed as a common medium of exchange. All that the state can do by means of its official staff is to single out certain pieces of metal or paper from all the other things of the same kind so that they can be subjected to a process of valuation independent of that of the rest. Thus, it permits those objects possessing the special legal qualification to be used as a common medium of exchange, while the other commodities of the same sort remain mere commodities. It can also take various steps with the object of encouraging the actual employment of the qualified commodities as common media of exchange. But these commodities can never become money just because the state commands it, Money can be created only by the usage of those who take part in commercial transactions. We may give the name of commodity money to that sort of money that is at the same time a commercial commodity and that of fiat money to money that comprises things with a special legal qualification. A third category may be called credit money. 
this being that sort of money which constitutes a claim against any physical or legal person. But these claims must not be both payable on demand and absolutely secure. If they were, there could be no difference between their value and that of the sum of money to which they referred, and they could not be subjected to an independent process of valuation on the part of those who dealt with them. In some way or other, the maturity of these claims must be postponed to some future time. It can hardly be contested that fiat money, in the strict sense of the word, is theoretically conceivable. The theory of value proves the possibility of its existence. Whether fiat money has ever actually existed is, of course, another question, and one that cannot offhand be answered affirmatively. It can hardly be doubted that most of those kinds of money that are not commodity money must be classified as credit money, but only detailed historical investigation could clear this matter up. Our terminology should prove more useful than that which is generally employed. It should express more clearly the peculiarities of the processes by which the different types of money are valued. It is certainly more correct than the usual distinction between metallic money and paper money. Metallic money comprises not only standard money, but also token coins and such coins as the German Thaler of the period 1873 to 1907, and paper money, as a rule, comprises not merely such fiat money and credit money as happens to be made of paper, but also convertible notes issued by banks or the state. This terminology is derived from popular usage. Previously, when more often than nowadays metallic money really was money and not a money substitute, perhaps the nomenclature was a little less inappropriate than it is now. Furthermore, it corresponded, perhaps still corresponds, to the naive and confused popular conception of value that sees in the precious metals something intrinsically valuable and in paper credit money something necessarily anomalous. Scientifically, this terminology is perfectly useless and a source of endless misunderstanding and misrepresentation. The greatest mistake that can be made in economic investigation is to fix attention on mere appearances and so fail to perceive the fundamental difference between things whose externals alone are similar or to discriminate between fundamentally similar things whose externals alone are different. Admittedly, for the numismatist and the technologist and the historian of art, there is very little difference between the five-franc piece before and after the cessation of free coinage of silver, while the Austrian silver gulden, even of the period 1879 to 1892, appears to be fundamentally different from the paper gulden. But it is regrettable that such superficial distinctions as this should still play a part in economic discussion. Our threefold classification is not a matter of mere terminological gymnastics. The theoretical discussion of the rest of this book should demonstrate the utility of the concepts that are involved. The decisive characteristic of commodity money is the employment for monetary purposes of a commodity in the technological sense. For the present investigation, it is a matter of complete indifference what particular commodity this is. The important thing is that it is a commodity in question that constitutes the money, and that the money is merely this commodity. The case of fiat money is quite different. Here the deciding factor is the stamp, and it is not the material bearing the stamp that constitutes the money, but the stamp itself. The nature of the material that bears the stamp is a matter of quite minor importance. Credit money, finally, is a claim falling due in the future that is used as a general medium of exchange. Section 4. The Commodity Money of the Past and of the Present even when the differentiation of commodity money, credit money, and fiat money is accepted as correct in principle, and only its utility disputed, the statement that the freely mintable currency of the present day and the metallic money of previous centuries are examples of commodity money is totally rejected by many authorities and by still more of the public at large. 
It is true that, as a rule, nobody denies that the older forms of money were commodity money. It is further generally admitted that in earlier times, coins circulated by weight and not by tail. Nevertheless, it is asserted money changed its nature long ago. The money of Germany and England in 1914, it is said, was not gold, but the mark and the pound. Money nowadays consists of specified units with a definite significance in terms of value that is assigned to them by law, NAP. By the standard, we mean the units of value, florins, francs, marks, etc., that have been adopted as measures of value, and by money, we mean the tokens, coins, and notes that represent the units that function as a measure of value. The controversy as to whether silver or gold or both together should function as a standard and as a currency is an idle one, because neither silver nor gold ever have performed these functions or ever could have done so. Hammer. Before we proceed to test the truth of these remarkable assertions, let us make one brief observation on their genesis although it would really be more correct to say Renaissance rather than Genesis, since the doctrines involved exhibit a very close relationship with the oldest and most primitive theories of money. Just as they were, so the nominalistic monetary theories of the present day are characterized by their inability to contribute a single word towards the solution of the chief problem of monetary theory. One might, in fact, call it the problem of monetary theory, namely that of explaining the exchange ratios between money and other economic goods. For their authors, the economic problem of value and prices simply does not exist. They have never thought it necessary to consider how market ratios are established or what they signify. Their attention is accidentally drawn to the fact that a German thaler since 1873, or an Austrian silver florin since 1879, are essentially different from a quantity of silver of the same weight and fineness that has not been stamped at the government meant. They notice a similar state of affairs with regard to paper money. They do not understand this and endeavor to find an answer to the riddle. But at this point, just because of their lack of acquaintance with the theory of value and prices, their inquiry takes a peculiarly unlucky turn. They do not inquire how the exchange ratios between money and other economic goods are established. This obviously seems to them quite a self-evident matter. They formulate their problem in another way. How does it come about that three 20-mark pieces are equivalent to 20 thalers, despite the fact that the silver contained in the thalers has a lower market value than the gold contained in the marks? And their answer runs, because the value of money is determined by the state, by statute, by the legal system. Thus, ignoring the most important facts of monetary history, they weave an artificial network of fallacies, a theoretical construction that collapses immediately when the question is put, what exactly are we to understand by a unit of value? But such impertinent questions can only occur to those who are acquainted with at least the elements of the theory of prices. Others are able to content themselves with references to the nominality of the unit of value, no wonder, then, that these theories should have achieved such popularity with the man in the street, especially since their kinship with inflationism was bound to commend them strongly to all cheap money enthusiasts. It may be stated as an assured result of investigation into monetary history that at all times and among all peoples the principal coins have been tendered and accepted not by tale without consideration of their quantity and quality, but only as pieces of metal of specific degrees of weight and fineness. Where coins have been accepted by tale, this has always been in the definite belief that the stamp showed them to be of the usual fineness of their kind and of the correct weight. Where there were no grounds for this assumption, weighing and testing were resorted to again. 
Fiscal considerations have led to the promulgation of a theory that attributes to the minting authority the right to regulate the purchasing power of the coinage as it thinks fit. For just as long as the minting of coins has been a government function, governments have tried to fix the weight and content of the coins as they wished. Philip VI of France expressly claimed the right to mint such money and give it such currency and at such rate as we desire and seems good to us. And all medieval rulers thought and did just as he in this matter. Obliging jurists supported them by attempts to discover a philosophical basis for the divine right of kings to debase the coinage and to prove the true value of coins was that assigned to them by the ruler of the country. Nevertheless, in defiance of all official regulations and prohibitions and fixing the price and threats of punishment, commercial practice has always insisted that what has to be considered in valuing coins is not their face value but their value as metal. The value of a coin has always been determined, not by the image and superscription it bears, nor by the proclamation of the mint and market authorities, but by its metal content. Not every kind of money has been accepted at sight, but only those kinds with a good reputation for weight and fineness. In loan contracts, repayment in specific kinds of money has been stipulated for, and in the case of a change in the coinage, fulfillment in terms of metal required. In spite of all fiscal influences, the opinion gradually gained general acceptance, even among the jurists, that it was the metal value, the bonitas intrinsica, as they called it, that was to be considered when repaying money debts. Debasement of the coinage was unable to force commercial practice to attribute to the new and lighter coins the same purchasing power as the old and heavier coins. The value of the coinage fell in proportion to the diminution of its weight and quality. Even price regulations took into account the diminished purchasing power of money due to its debasement. Thus, the Schiffen, or assessors of Schweinitz, in Silesia, used to have the newly minted Fennigs submitted to them, assess their value, and then in consultation with the city council and elders, fix the prices of commodities accordingly. There has been handed down to us from 13th century Vienna a former institutionist, que fit per civium arbitrarum annuitum tempor quo denari renovantur pro rerum venalium qualibet emptione, in which the prices of commodities and services are regulated in connection with the introduction of a new coinage in the years 1460 to 1474. Similar measures were taken on similar occasions in other cities. Wherever disorganization of the coinage had advanced so far that the presence of a stamp on a piece of metal was no longer any help, in determining its actual content, commerce ceased entirely to rely on the official monetary system and created its own system of measuring the precious metals. In large transactions, ingots and trade tokens were used. Thus, the German merchants visiting the fair at Geneva took ingots of refined gold with them and made their purchases with these, employing the weights used at the Paris market instead of using money. This was the origin of the Marcan Scudo, or Scutus Marcarum, which was nothing but the merchant's usual term for 3.765 grams of refined gold. At the beginning of the 15th century, when the Geneva trade was gradually being transferred to Lyon, the gold mark had become such a customary unit of account among the merchants that bills of exchange expressed in terms of it were carried to and from the market. The old Venetian Liri di Grozzi had similar origin. In the gyro banks, which sprang up at all the big commercial centers at the beginning of the modern era, we see a further attempt to free the monetary system from the authorities' abuse of the privilege of minting. The clearinghouse business of these banks was based either on coins of a specific fineness or on ingots. This bank money was commodity money in its most perfect form. The nominalists assert that the monetary unit, in modern countries at any rate, is not a concrete commodity unit that can be defined in suitable technical terms, 
but a nominal quantity of value about which nothing can be said except that it is created by law. Without touching upon the vague and nebulous nature of this phraseology, which will not sustain a moment's criticism from the point of view of the theory of value, let us simply ask, what, then, were the mark, the franc, and the pound before 1914? Obviously, they were nothing but certain weights of gold. It is not mere quibbling to assert that Germany had not a gold standard but a mark standard. According to the letter of the law, Germany was on a gold standard, and the mark was simply the unit of account, the designation of one 2,790th of a kilogram of refined gold. And this in no way affected by the fact that nobody was bound in private dealings to accept gold ingots or foreign gold coins, for the whole aim and intent of state intervention in the monetary sphere is simply to release individuals from the necessity of testing the weight and fineness of the gold they receive, a task which can only be undertaken by experts and which involves very elaborate precautionary measures. The narrowness of the limits within which the weight and fineness of the coins is legally allowed to vary at the time of minting, and the establishment of a further limit to the permissible loss by wear of those in circulation, is a much better means of securing the integrity of the coinage than the use of scales and nitric acid on the part of all who have commercial dealings. Again, the right of free coinage, one of the basic principles of modern monetary law, is a protection in the opposite direction against the emergence of a difference in value between the coined and uncoined metal. In large-scale international trade, where differences that are negligible as far as single coins are concerned have a cumulative importance, coins are valued not according to their number, but according to their weight. That is, they are treated not as coins, but as pieces of metal. It is easy to see why this does not occur in domestic trade. Large payments within a country never involve the actual transfer of the amounts of money concerned, but merely the assignment of claims, which ultimately refer to the stock of precious metal of the central bank. The role played by ingots in the gold reserves of the banks is a proof that the monetary standard consists in the precious metal and not in the proclamation of the authorities. Even for the present-day coins, so far as they are not money substitutes, credit money, or fiat money, the statement is true that they are nothing but ingots whose weight and fineness are officially guaranteed. The money of those modern countries where metal coins with no mint restrictions are used is commodity money, just as much as that of ancient and medieval nations. Chapter 4. Money and the State Section 1. The Position of the State in the Market The position of the State in the market differs in no way from that of any other parties to commercial transactions. Like these others, the state exchanges commodities and money on terms which are governed by the laws of price. It exercises its sovereign rights over its subjects to levy compulsory contributions from them, but in all other respects it adapts itself, like everybody else, to the commercial organization of society. As a buyer or seller, the state has to conform to the conditions of the market. If it wishes to alter any of the exchange ratios established in the market, it can only do this through the market's own mechanism. As a rule, it will be able to act more effectively than anyone else, thanks to the resources at its command outside the market. It is responsible for the most pronounced disturbances of the market because it is able to exercise the strongest influence on demand and supply but it is nonetheless subject to the rules of the market and cannot set aside the laws of the pricing process. In an economic system based on private ownership of the means of production, no government regulation can alter the terms of exchange except by altering the factors that determine them. Kings and republics have repeatedly refused to recognize this, Diocletian's Edict de Pretis Rerum Venalium, the price regulations of the Middle Ages, the maximum prices of the French Revolution, are the most well-known examples of the failure of authoritative interference with the market. 
These attempts at intervention were not frustrated by the fact that they were valid only within the state boundaries and ignored elsewhere. It is a mistake to imagine that similar regulations would have led to the desired result even in an isolated state. It was the functional, not the geographical limitations of the government that rendered them abortive. They could have achieved their aim only in a socialistic state with a centralized organization of production and distribution. In a state that leaves production and distribution to individual enterprise, such measures must necessarily fail of their effect. The concept of money as a creature of law and the state is clearly untenable. It is not justified by a single phenomenon of the market. To ascribe to the state the power of dictating the laws of exchange is to ignore the fundamental principles of money-using society. Section 2. The Legal Concept of Money When both parties to an exchange fulfill their obligations immediately and surrender a commodity for ready cash, there is usually no motive for the judicial intervention of the state. But when the exchange is one of present goods against future goods, it may happen that one party fails to fulfill his obligations, although the other has carried out his share of the contract. Then the judiciary may be invoked. If the case is one of lending or purchase on credit, to name only the most important examples, the court has to decide how a debt contracted in terms of money can be liquidated. Its task thus becomes that of determining, in accordance with the intent of the contracting parties, what is to be understood by money in commercial transactions. From the legal point of view, money is not the common medium of exchange, but the common medium of payment or debt settlement. But money only becomes a medium of payment by virtue of being a medium of exchange. And it is only because it is a medium of exchange that the law also makes it the medium for fulfilling obligations not contracted in terms of money, but whose literal fulfillment is for some reason or another impossible. The fact that the law regards money only as a means of canceling outstanding obligations has important consequences for the legal definition of money. What the law understands by money is in fact not the common medium of exchange, but the legal medium of payment. It does not come within the scope of the legislator or jurist to define the economic concept of money. In determining how monetary debts may be effectively paid off, there is no reason for being too exclusive. It is customary in business to tender and accept in payment certain money substitutes instead of money itself. If the law refused to recognize the validity of money substitutes that are sanctioned by commercial usage, it would only open the door to all sorts of fraud and deceit. This would offend against the principle malitus non est indulgenum. Besides this, the payment of small sums would, for technical reasons, hardly be possible without the use of token money. Even ascribing the power of debt settlement to banknotes does not injure creditors or other recipients in any way, so long as the notes are regarded by the businessman as equivalent to money. But the state may ascribe the power of debt settlement to other objects as well. The law may declare anything it likes to be a medium of payment, and this ruling will be binding on all courts and on all those who enforce the decisions of the courts. But bestowing the property of legal tender on a thing does not suffice to make it money in the economic sense. Goods can become common media of exchange only through the practice of those who take part in commercial transactions and it is the valuations of these persons alone that determine the exchange ratios of the market. Quite possibly, commerce may take into use those things to which the state has ascribed the power of payment, but it need not do so. It may, if it likes, reject them. Three situations are possible when the state has declared an object to be a legal means of fulfilling an outstanding obligation. First, the legal means of payment may be identical with the medium of exchange that the contracting parties had in mind when entering into their agreement, or, 
or, if not identical, it may yet be of equal value with this medium at the time of payment. For example, the state may proclaim gold as a legal medium for settling obligations contracted in terms of gold, or at a time when the relative values of gold and silver are as 1 to 15 and a half. It may declare that liabilities in terms of gold may be settled by payment of 15 and a half times the quantity of silver. Such an arrangement is merely the legal formulation of the presumable intent of the agreement. It damages the interests of neither party. It is economically neutral. The case is otherwise when the state proclaims as medium of payment something that has a higher or lower value than the contractual medium. The first possibility may be disregarded, but the second, of which numerous historical examples could be cited, is important. From the legal point of view, in which the fundamental principle is the protection of vested rights, such a procedure on the part of the state can never be justified, although it might sometimes be vindicated on social or fiscal grounds. But it always means not the fulfillment of obligations, but their complete or partial cancellation. When notes that are appraised commercially at only half their face value are proclaimed legal tender, this amounts fundamentally to the same thing as granting debtors legal relief from half of their liabilities. State declarations of legal tender affect only those monetary obligations that have already been contracted. But commerce is free to choose between retaining its old medium of exchange or creating a new one for itself. And when it adopts a new medium, so far as the legal power of the contracting parties reaches, it will attempt to make it into a standard of deferred payments also, in order to deprive of its validity, at least for the future, the standard to which the state has ascribed complete powers of debt settlement. When, during the last decade of the 19th century, the Bimetallist Party in Germany gained so much power that the possibility of experiment with its inflationist proposals had to be reckoned with, Gold clauses began to make their appearance in long-term contracts. The recent period of currency depreciation has had a similar effect. If the state does not wish to render all credit transactions impossible, it must recognize such devices as these and instruct the courts to acknowledge them. And, similarly, when the state itself enters into ordinary business dealings, when it buys or sells, guarantees loans or borrows, makes payments or receives them, it must recognize the common business medium of exchange as money. The legal standard, the particular group of things that are endured with the property of unlimited legal tender, is in fact valid only for the settlement of existing debts, unless business usage itself adopts it as a general medium of exchange. Section 3. The Influence of the State on the Monetary System State activity in the monetary sphere was originally restricted to the manufacture of coins. To supply ingots of the greatest possible degree of similarity in appearance, weight, and fineness, and provide them with a stamp that was not too easy to imitate, and that could be recognized by everybody as a sign of the state coinage, was, and still is, the premier task of state monetary activity. Beginning with this, the influence of the state in the monetary sphere has gradually extended. Progress in monetary technique has been slow. At first, the impression on a coin was merely a proof of the genuineness of its material, including its degree of fineness, while the weight had to be separately checked at each payment. In the present state of knowledge, this cannot be stated dogmatically, and in any case, the development is not likely to have followed the same lines everywhere. Later, different kinds of coins were distinguished, all the separate coins of any particular kind being regarded as interchangeable. The next step, after the innovation of classified money, was the development of the parallel standard. This consisted in the juxtaposition of two monetary systems one based on gold, commodity money, and one on silver. The coins belonging to each separate system constituted a self-contained group, 
Their weights bore a definite relation to each other, and the state gave them a legal relation also, in the same proportion, by sanctioning the commercial practice which had gradually been established of regarding different coins of the same metal as interchangeable. This stage was reached without further state influence. All the state had done till then in the monetary sphere was to provide the coins for commercial use. As controller of the mint, it supplied in handy form pieces of metal of specific weight and fineness, stamped in such a way that everybody could recognize without difficulty what their metallic content was and whence they originated. As legislator, the state attributed legal tender to these coins. The significance of this has just been expounded, and as judge, it applied this legal provision. But the matter did not end at this stage. For about the last 200 years, the influence of the state on the monetary system has been greater than this. One thing, however, must be made clear. Even now the state has not the power of directly making anything into money, that is to say, into a common medium of exchange. Even nowadays, it is only the practice of the individuals who take part in business that can make a commodity into a medium of exchange. But the state's influence on commercial usage, both potential and actual, has increased. It has increased first because the state's own importance as an economic agent has increased, because it occupies a greater place as buyer and seller, as payer of wages and levier of taxes, than in past centuries. In this there is nothing that is remarkable or that needs special emphasis. It is obvious that the influence of an economic agent on the choice of a monetary commodity will be the greater in proportion to its share in the dealings of the market, and there is no reason to suppose that there should be any difference in the case of the one particular economic agent, the state. But besides this, the state exercises a special influence on the choice of the monetary commodity, which is not due to its commercial position, nor to its authority as legislator and judge, but to its official standing as controller of the mint, and to its power to change the character of the money substitutes in circulation. The influence of the state on the monetary system is usually ascribed to its legislative and judicial authority. It is assumed that the law, which can authoritatively alter the tenor of existing debt relations and force new contracts of indebtedness in a particular direction, enables the state to exercise a deciding influence in the choice of the commercial medium of exchange. Nowadays, the most extreme form of this argument is to be found in Knapp's State Theory of Money. But very few German writers are completely free from it, Helferich may be mentioned as an example. It is true that this writer declares, with regard to the origin of money, that it is perhaps doubtful whether it was not the function of the common medium of exchange alone that sufficed to make a thing money, and to make money the standard of deferred payments of every kind. Nevertheless, he constantly regards it as quite beyond any sort of doubt that for our present economic organization, certain kinds of money in some countries, and whole monetary systems in other countries, are money, and function as a medium of exchange only because compulsory payments and obligations contracted in terms of money must or may be fulfilled in terms of these particular objects. It would be difficult to agree with views of this nature. They fail to recognize the meaning of state intervention in the monetary sphere. By declaring an object to be fitted in the juristic sense for the liquidation of liabilities expressed in terms of money, the state cannot influence the choice of a medium of exchange which belongs to those engaged in business. History shows that those states that have wanted their subjects to accept a new monetary system have regularly chosen other means than this of achieving their ends. The establishment of a legal ratio for the discharge of obligations incurred under the regime of the superseded kind of money constitutes a merely secondary measure which is significant only in connection with the change of standard which is achieved by other means. The provision that taxes are in future to be paid in the new kind of money 
and that other liabilities imposed in terms of money will be fulfilled only in the new money, is a consequence of the transition to the new standard. It proves effective only when the new kind of money has become a common medium of exchange in commerce generally. A monetary policy can never be carried out merely by legislative means, by an alteration in the legal definitions of the content of contracts of indebtedness and of the system of public expenditure, it must be based on the executive authority of the state as controller of the mint and as issuer of claims to money, payable on demand, that can take the place of money in commerce. The necessary measures must not merely be passively recorded in the protocols of legislative assemblies and official gazettes, but often at great financial sacrifice, must be actually put into operation. A country that wishes to persuade its subjects to go over from one precious metal standard to another cannot rest content with its expressing this aspiration in appropriate provisions of the civil and fiscal law. It must make the new money take the commercial place of the old. Exactly the same is true of the transition from a credit money or fiat money standard, to commodity money. No statesman faced with the task of such a change has ever had even a momentary doubt about the matter. It is not the enactment of a legal ratio and the order that taxes are to be paid in the new money that are the decisive steps, but the provision of the necessary quantity of the new money and the withdrawal of the old. This may be confirmed by a few historical examples. First, the impossibility of modifying the monetary system merely by the exercise of authority may be illustrated by the ill success of bimetallistic legislation. This was once thought to offer a simple solution of a big problem. For thousands of years, gold and silver had been employed side by side as commodity money. But the continuance of this practice had constantly grown more burdensome, for the parallel standard or simultaneous employment as currency of two kinds of commodity, has many disadvantages. Since no spontaneous assistance was to be expected from the individuals engaged in business, the state decided to intervene in the hopes of cutting the Gordian knot. Just as it had previously removed certain obvious difficulties by declaring that debts contracted in terms of thalers might be discharged by payment of twice as many half-thalers or four times as many quarter thalers, so it now proceeded to establish a fixed ratio between the two different precious metals. Debts payable in silver, for instance, could be discharged by payment of one fifteen and a half times the same weight of gold. It was thought that this had solved the problem, while in fact the difficulties that it involved had not even been suspected, as events were to prove. All the results followed that are attributed by Gresham's law to the legislative equating of coins of unequal value. In all debt settlements and similar payments, only that money was used which the law rated more highly than the market. When the law had happened to hit upon the existing market ratio as its par, then this effect was delayed a little until the next movement in the prices of the precious metals but it was bound to occur as soon as the difference arose between the legislative and market ratios of the two kinds of money. The parallel standard was thus turned not into a double standard, as the legislators had intended, but into an alternative standard. The primary result of this was a decision, for a little while at least, between the two precious metals. Not that this was what the state had intended, on the contrary, the state had no thought whatever of deciding in favor of the use of one or the other metal. It had hoped to secure the circulation of both. But the official regulation, which in declaring the reciprocal substitutability of gold and silver money, overestimated the market ratio of the one in terms of the other, merely succeeded in differentiating the utility of the two for monetary purposes. The consequence was the increased employment of one of the metals and the disappearance of the other. The legislative and judicial intervention of the state had completely failed. It had been demonstrated, in striking fashion, that the state alone could not make a commodity into a common medium of exchange, that is, into money, 
but that this could be done only by the common action of all the individuals engaged in business. But what the state fails to achieve through legislative means may be to a certain degree within its power as controller of the mint. It was in the latter capacity that the state intervened when the alternative standard was replaced by permanent monumentalism. This happened in various ways. The transition was quite simple and easy when the action of the state consisted in preventing a return to the temporary undervalued metal in one of the alternating monometallic periods by rescinding the right of free coinage. The matter was even simpler in those countries where one or other metal had gained the upper hand before the state had reached the stage necessary for the modern type of regulation, so that all that remained for the law to do was to sanction a situation that was already established. The problem was much more difficult when the state attempted to persuade businessmen to abandon the metal that was being used and adopt the other. In this case, the state had to manufacture the necessary quantity of the new metal, exchange it for the old currency, and either turn the metal thus withdrawn from circulation into token coinage, or sell it for non-monetary use, or for recoinage abroad. The reform of the German monetary system after the foundation of the Reich in 1871 may be regarded as a perfect example of the transition from one metallic commodity standard to another. The difficulties that this involved, and that were overcome by the help of the French war indemnity, are well known. They were involved in the performance of two tasks, the provision of the gold and the disposal of the silver. This, and nothing else, was the essence of the problem that had to be solved when the decision was taken to change the standard. The Reich completed the transition to gold by giving gold and claims to gold in exchange for the silver money and claims to silver money held by its citizens. The corresponding alterations in the law were mere accompaniments of the change. The change of standard occurred in just the same way in Austria-Hungary, Russia, and other countries that reformed their monetary systems in succeeding years. Here also the problem was merely that of providing the requisite quantities of gold and setting them in circulation among those engaged in business in place of the media previously employed. This process was extraordinarily facilitated, and, what was even more to the point, the amount of gold necessary for the changeover was considerably decreased by the device of permitting the coins constituting the old fiat money or credit money to remain wholly or partly in circulation while fundamentally changing their economic character by transforming them into claims that were always convertible into the new kind of money. This gave a different outward appearance to the transaction, but it remained in essence the same. It is scarcely open to question that the steps taken by those countries that adopted this kind of monetary policy consisted essentially in the provision of quantities of metal. The exaggeration of the importance and monetary policy of the power at the disposal of the state in its legislative capacity can only be attributed to superficial observation of the processes involved in the transition from commodity money to credit money. This transition has normally been achieved by means of a state declaration that inconvertible claims to money were as good means of payment as money itself. As a rule, it has not been the object of such a declaration to carry out a change of standard and substitute credit money for commodity money. In the great majority of cases, the state has taken such measures merely with certain fiscal ends in view. It has aimed to increase its own resources by the creation of credit money. In the pursuit of such a plan as this, the diminution of the money's purchasing power could hardly seem desirable. And yet it has always been this depreciation in value which, through the coming into play of Gresham's law, has caused the change of monetary standards. It would be quite out of harmony with the facts to assert that cash payments had ever been stopped, i.e. that the permanent convertibility of notes had been suspended with the intention of effecting a transition to a credit standard. This result has always come to pass against the will of the state, not in accordance with it. 
Business usage alone can transform a commodity into a common medium of exchange. It is not the state, but the common practice of all those who have dealings in the market that creates money. It follows that state regulation attributing general power of debt liquidation to a commodity is unable of itself to make that commodity into money. If the state creates credit money, and this is naturally true in a still greater degree of fiat money, it can do so only by taking things that are already in circulation as money substitutes, that is, as perfectly secure and immediately convertible claims to money, and isolating them for purposes of valuation by depriving them of their essential characteristic of permanent convertibility. Commerce would always protect itself against any other method of introducing a government credit currency. This attempt to put credit money into circulation has never been successful, except when the coins or notes in question have already been in circulation as money substitutes. This is the limit of the constantly overestimated influence of the state on the monetary system. What the state can do in certain circumstances, by means of its position as controller of the mint, by means of its power of altering the character of money substitutes and depriving them of their standing as claims to money that are payable on demand, and above all means of those financial resources which permit it to bear the cost of a change of currency, is to persuade commerce to abandon one sort of money and adopt another. That is all. Chapter 5. Money as an Economic Good Section 1. Money Neither a Production Good Nor a Consumption Good It is usual to divide economic goods into the two classes of those which satisfy human needs directly and those which only satisfy them indirectly, i.e. consumption goods, or goods of the first order, and production goods, or goods of higher orders. The attempt to include money in either of these groups meets with insuperable difficulties. It is unnecessary to demonstrate that money is not a consumption good. It seems equally incorrect to call it a production good. Of course, if we regard the twofold division of economic goods as exhaustive, we shall have to rest content with putting money in one group or the other. This has been the position of most economists, and since it has seemed altogether impossible to call money a consumption good, there has been no alternative but to call it a production good. This apparently arbitrary procedure has usually been given only a very cursory vindication. Rosher, for example, thought it sufficient to mention that money is the chief instrument of every transfer. Vermstes Verkzeud Jaden Verkeers. In opposition to Rosher, Keynes made room for money in the classification of goods by replacing the twofold division into production goods and consumption goods by a threefold division into means of production, objects of consumption, and media of exchange. His arguments on this point, which are unfortunately scanty, have hardly attracted any serious attention and have often been misunderstood. Thus, Helfrich attempts to confute Keynes's proposition that a sales and purchase transaction is not in itself an act of production, but an act of interpersonal transfer by asserting that the same sort of objection might be made to the inclusion of means of transport among instruments of production on the grounds that transport is not in itself an act of production, but an act of interlocal transfer, and that the nature of goods is no more altered by transport than by a change of ownership. Obviously, it is the ambiguity of the German word Verkehr that has obscured the deeper issues here involved. On the one hand, Verkir bears a meaning that may be roughly translated by the word commerce, i.e. the exchange of goods and services on the part of individuals. But it also means the transfer through space of persons, goods, and information. These two groups of things denoted by the German word Verkir have nothing in common but their name. It is therefore impossible to countenance the suggestion of a relationship between the two meanings of the word that is involved in the practice of speaking of verkir in a broader sense. 
by which is meant the transfer of goods from one person's possession to that of another, and verkir in the narrower sense, by which is meant the transfer of goods from one point in space to another. Even popular usage recognizes two distinct meanings here, not a narrower and broader version of the same meaning. The common nomenclature of the two meanings, as also their incidental confusion, may well be attributable to the fact that exchange transactions often, but by no means always, go hand in hand with acts of transport, through space and vice versa. But, obviously, this is no reason why science should impute an intrinsic similarity to these essentially different processes. It should never have been called in question that the transportation of persons, goods, and information is to be reckoned part of production, so far as it does not constitute an act of consumption, as do pleasure trips, for example. All the same, two things have hindered recognition of this fact. The first is the widespread misconception of the nature of production. There is a naive view of production that regards it as the bringing into being of matter that did not previously exist, as creation in the true sense of the word. From this it is easy to derive a contrast between the creative work of production and the mere transportation of goods. This way of regarding the matter is entirely inadequate. In fact, the role played by man in production always consists solely in combining his personal forces with the forces of nature in such a way that the cooperation leads to some particular desired arrangement of material. No human act of production amounts to more than altering the position of things in space and leaving the rest to nature. This disposes of one of the objections to regarding transportation as a productive process. The second objection arises from insufficient insight into the nature of goods. It is often overlooked that, among other natural qualities, the position of a thing in space has important bearings on its capacity for satisfying human wants. Things that are of perfectly identical technological composition must yet be regarded as specimens of different kinds of goods if they are not in the same place and in the same state of readiness for consumption, or further production. Till now the position of a good in space has been recognized only as a factor determining its economic or non-economic nature. It is hardly possible to ignore the fact that drinking water in the desert and drinking water in a well-watered mountain district, despite their chemical and physical similarities and their equal thirst-quenching properties, have nevertheless a totally different significance for the satisfaction of human wants. The only water that can quench the thirst of the traveler in the desert is the water that is on the spot, ready for consumption. Within the group of economic goods itself, however, the factor of situation has been taken into consideration only for goods of certain kinds. Those whose position has been fixed, whether by man or nature, and even among these, Attention has seldom been given to any but the most outstanding example, land. As far as movable goods are concerned, the factor of situation has been treated as negligible. This attitude is in consonance with commercial technology. The microscope fails to reveal any difference between two lots of beet sugar, of which one is warehoused in Prague and the other in London. But for the purposes of economics, it is better to regard the two lots of sugar as goods of different kinds. Strictly speaking, only those goods should be called goods of the first order, which are already where they can immediately be consumed. All other economic goods, even if they are ready for consumption in the technological sense, must be regarded as goods of higher orders, which can be transmuted into goods of the first order, only by combination with the complementary good, means of transport. Regarded in this light, means of transport are obviously production goods. Production, says Wieser, is the utilization of the more advantageous among remote conditions of welfare. There is nothing to prevent us from interpreting the word remote in its literal sense for once, and not just figuratively. We have seen that transfer through space is one sort of production, and means of transport, therefore, 
so far as they are not consumption goods, such as pleasure yachts and the like, must be included among production goods. Is this true of money as well? Are the economic services that money renders comparable with those rendered by means of transport? Not in the least. Production is quite possible without money. There is no need for money either in the isolated household or in the socialized community. Nowhere can we discover a good of the first order of which we could say that the use of money was a necessary condition of its production. It is true that the majority of economists reckon money among production goods. Nevertheless, arguments from authority are invalid. The proof of a theory is in its reasoning, not in its sponsorship, and with all due respect for the masters, it must be said that they have not justified their position very thoroughly in this matter. This is most remarkable in Bombauerk. As has been said, Cadiz recommends the substitution of a threefold classification of economic goods into objects of consumption, means of production, and media of exchange for the customary twofold division into consumption goods and production goods. In general, Bombauer treats Keynes with the greatest respect, and whenever he feels obliged to differ from him, criticizes his arguments most carefully. But in the present case, he simply disregards them. He unhesitatingly includes money in his concept of social capital and incidentally specifies it as a product destined to assist further production. He refers briefly to the objection that money is an instrument, not of production, but of exchange. But instead of answering this objection, he embarks on an extended criticism of those doctrines that treat stocks of goods in the hands of producers and middlemen as goods ready for consumption, instead of as intermediate products. Bumbauer's argument proves conclusively that production is not completed until the goods have been brought to the place where they are wanted, and that it is illegitimate to speak of goods being ready for consumption until the final process of transport is completed. But it contributes nothing to our present discussion, for the chain of reasoning gives way just at the critical link. After having proved that the horse and wagon with which the farmer brings home his corn and wood must be reckoned as means of production and as capital, Bombauerk adds that, logically, all the objects and apparatus of bringing home, in the broader economic sense, the things that have to be transported, the roads, railways, and ships, and the commercial tool money, must be included in the concept of capital. This is the same jump that Rosher makes. It leaves out of consideration the difference between transport, which consists in an alteration of the utility of things, and exchange, which constitutes a separate economic category altogether. It is illegitimate to compare the part played by money in production with that played by ships and railways. Money is obviously not a commercial tool in the same sense as account books, exchange lists, the stock exchange, or the credit system. Bombauer's argument, in its turn, has not remained uncontradicted. Jacobi objects that, while it treats money and the stocks of commodities in the hands of producers and middlemen as social capital, it nevertheless maintains the view that social capital is a pure economic category and independent of all legal definitions, although money and the commodity aspect of consumption goods are peculiar to a commercial type of economic organization. The invalidity of this criticism, so far as it is an objection to regarding commodities as production goods, is implied by what has been said above. There is no doubt that Bombauerk is in the right here and not his critic. It is otherwise with the second point, the question of the inclusion of money. Admittedly, Jacobi's own discussion of the capital concept is not beyond criticism, and Bombauerk's refusal to accept it is probably justified, but that does not concern us at present. We are only concerned with the problem of the concept of goods. On this point, as well, Bombauerk disagrees with Jacobi. In the third edition of Volume 2 of his masterpiece on capital and interest, he argues that even a complex socialistic organization could hardly do without undifferentiated orders or certificates of some sort, like money, which refer to the product awaiting distribution. 
This particular argument of his was not directly aimed at our present problem. Nevertheless, it is desirable to inquire whether the opinion expressed in it does not contain something that may be useful for our purpose as well. Every sort of economic organization needs not only a mechanism for production, but also a mechanism for distributing what is produced. It will scarcely be questioned that the distribution of goods among individual consumers constitutes a part of production, and that, in consequence, we should include among the means of production not only the physical instruments of commerce, such as stock exchanges, account books, documents, and the like, but also everything that serves to maintain the legal system, which is the foundation of commerce, as, for example, fences, railings, walls, locks, safes, and paraphernalia of the law courts, and the equipment of organs of government entrusted with the production of property. In a socialistic state, this category might include, among other things, Bombauer's undifferentiated certificates, to which, however, we cannot allow the description, like money, for instance, money is not a certificate, it will not do to say of a certificate that it is like money. Money is always an economic good, and to say of a claim, which is what a certificate is, that it is like money, is only to drop back into the old practice of regarding rights and business connections as goods. Here we can invoke Bombauer's own authority against himself. What prevents us, nevertheless, from reckoning money among these distribution goods, and so among production goods, and incidentally the same objection applies to its inclusion among consumption goods, is the following consideration. The loss of a consumption good or production good results in the loss of human satisfaction. It makes mankind poorer. The gain of such a good results in an improvement of the human economic position. It makes mankind richer. The same cannot be said of the loss or gain of money. Both changes in the available quantity of production goods or consumption goods and changes in the available quantity of money involve changes in values. But, whereas the changes in the value of the production goods and consumption goods do not mitigate the loss or reduce the gain of satisfaction resulting from the changes in their quantity, the changes in the value of money are accommodated in such a way to the demand for it that, despite increases or decreases in its quantity, the economic position of mankind remains the same. An increase in the quantity of money can no more increase the welfare of the members of a community than a diminution of it can decrease their welfare. Regarded from this point of view, those goods that are employed as money are indeed what Adam Smith called them, dead stock which produces nothing. We have shown that, under certain conditions, indirect exchange is a necessary phenomenon of the market. The circumstance that goods are desired and acquired in exchange not for their own sakes but only in order to be disposed of in further exchange can never disappear from our type of market dealing because the conditions that make it inevitable are present in the overwhelming majority of all exchange transactions. Now, the economic development of indirect exchange leads to the employment of a common medium of exchange, to the establishment and elaboration of the institution of money. Money, in fact, is indispensable in our economic order. But as an economic good, it is not a physical component of the social distributive apparatus in the way that account books, prisons, or firearms are. No part of the total result of production is dependent on the collaboration of money, even though the use of money may be one of the fundamental principles on which the economic order is based. Production goods derive their value from that of their products. Not so money, for no increase in the welfare of the members of a society can result from the availability of an additional quantity of money. The laws which govern the value of money are different from those which govern the value of production goods and from those which govern the value of consumption goods. All that these have in common is their general underlying principle, the fundamental economic law of value. This is a complete justification of the suggestion put forward by Keynes that economic goods should be divided into means of production, objects of consumption, and media of exchange for 
After all, the primary object of economic terminology is to facilitate investigation into the theory of value. Money as a part of private capital. We have not undertaken this investigation into the relationship between money and production goods merely for its terminological interest. What is of importance for its own sake is not our ultimate conclusion, but the incidental light shed by our argument upon those peculiarities of money that distinguish it from other economic goods. These special characteristics of the common medium of exchange will receive closer attention when we turn to consider the laws that regulate the value of money and its variations. But the result of our reasoning, too, the conclusion that money is not a production good, is not entirely without significance. It will help us to answer the question whether money is capital or not. This question, in its turn, is not an end in itself, but it provides a check upon the answer to a further problem concerning the relations between the equilibrium rate of interest and the money rate of interest, which will be dealt with in the third part of this book. If each conclusion confirms the other, then we may assume, with a considerable degree of assurance, that our arguments have not led us into error. The first grave difficulty in the way of any investigation into the relation between money and capital arises from the difference of opinion that exists about the definition of the concept of capital. The views of scholars on the definition of capital are more divergent than their views on any other point in economics. None of the many definitions that have been suggested has secured general recognition. Nowadays, in fact, the controversy about the theory of capital rages more fiercely than ever. If, from among the large number of conflicting concepts, we select that of Baumbauert to guide us in our investigation into the relation of money to capital, we could justify our procedure merely by reference to the fact that Baumbauert is the best guide for any serious attempt to study the problem of interest, even if such a study leads eventually and by no means entirely without indebtedness to the labor that Baumbauert bestowed on this problem, to conclusions that differ widely from those which he himself arrived at. Furthermore, all those weighty arguments with which Baumbauert established his concept and defended it against his critics support such a choice. But quite apart from these, a reason that appears to be quite decisive is provided by the fact that no other concept of capital has been developed with equal clarity. This last point is particularly important. It is not the object of the present discussion to arrive at any kind of conclusion respecting terminology or to provide any criticism of concepts but merely to shed some light on one or two points that are of importance for the problem of the relations between the equilibrium and the money rates of interest. Hence, it is less important for us to classify things correctly than to avoid vague ideas about their nature. Various opinions may be held as to whether money should be included in the concept of capital or not. The delimitation of concepts of this nature is merely a question of expediency, in connection with which it is quite easy for differences of opinion to arise. But the economic function of money is a matter about which it should be possible to arrive at perfect agreement. Of the two concepts of capital that Baumbauer distinguishes following the traditional economic terminology, that of what is called private or acquisitive capital is both the older and the wider. This was the original root idea from which the narrower concept of social or productive capital was afterwards separated. It is therefore logical to begin our investigation by inquiring into the connection between private capital and money. Bombauer defines private capital as the aggregate of the products that serve as a means to the acquisition of goods. It has never been questioned that money must be included in this category. In fact, the development of the scientific concept of capital starts from the notion of an interest-bearing sum of money. This concept of capital has been broadened little by little until, at last, it has taken the form which it bears in modern scientific discussion. On the whole, 
in approximate coincidence with popular usage. The gradual evolution of the concept of capital has meant, at the same time, an increasing understanding of the function of money as capital. Early in history, the lay mind discovered an explanation of the fact that money on loan bears interest, that money, in fact, works. But such an explanation as this could not long satisfy scientific requirements. Science, therefore, countered it with the fact that money itself is barren. Even in ancient times, general recognition must have been accorded to the view which later in the shape of the maxim pecunia pecunium parer non potest was to be the basis of all discussion of the problem of interest for hundreds and even thousands of years. And Aristotle undoubtedly did not state it in the famous passage in his politics as the new doctrine but as a generally accepted commonplace. Despite its obviousness, this perception of the physical unfruitfulness of money was a necessary step on the way to full realization of the problem of capital and interest. If sums of money on loan do bear fruit, and it is not possible to explain this phenomenon by the physical productivity of the money, then other explanations must be sought. The next step towards an explanation was provided by the observations that, after a loan is made, the borrower, as a rule, exchanges the money for other economic goods, and that those owners of money who wish to obtain a profit from their money without lending it do the same. This was the starting point for the extension of the concept of capital referred to above, and for the development of the problem of the money rate of interest into the problem of the natural rate of interest. It is true that centuries passed before these further steps were accomplished. At first there was a complete halt in the development of the theory of capital. Further progress was, in fact, not desired. What was already attained sufficed perfectly, for the aim of science then was not to explain reality, but to vindicate ideals. And public opinion disproved of the taking of interest. Even later, when the taking of interest was recognized in Greek and Roman law, it was still not considered respectable, and all the writers of classical times strove to outdo one another in condemning it. When the church adopted this proscription of interest and attempted to support its attitude by quotations from the Bible, it cut the ground away from beneath all unauthorized attempts to deal with the matter. Every theorist who turned his attention to the problem was already convinced that the taking of interest was harmful, unnatural, and uncharitable, and found his principal task in the search for new objections to it. It was not for him to explain how interest came to exist, but to sustain the thesis that it was reprehensible. In such circumstances, it was easy for the doctrine of sterility of money to be taken over uncritically by one writer from another as an extraordinarily powerful argument against the payment of interest, and thus, not for the sake of its content, but for the sake of the conclusion it supported, to become an obstacle in the way of the development of interest theory. It became a help and no longer a hindrance to this development when a move was made towards the construction of a new theory of capital after the downfall of the old canonist theory of interest. Its first effect, then, was to necessitate an extension of the concept of capital and, consequently, of the problem of interest. In popular usage and in terminology of scholars, capital was no longer sums of money on loan, but accumulated stocks of goods. The doctrine of the unfruitfulness of money has another significance for our problem. It sheds light on the position of money within the class of things constituting private capital. Why do we include money and in capital? Why is the interest paid for sums of money on loan? How is it possible to use sums of money even without lending them so that they yield an income? There can be no doubt about the answers to these questions. Money is an acquisitive instrument only when it is exchanged for some other economic good. In this respect, money may be compared with those consumption goods that form part of private capital only because they are not consumed by their owners themselves, but are used for the acquisition 
of other goods or services by means of exchange. Money is no more acquisitive capital than these consumption goods are. The real acquisitive capital consists in the goods for which the money or the consumption goods are exchanged. Money that is lying idle, that is, money that is not exchanged for other goods, is not a part of capital. It produces no fruit. Money is part of the private capital of an individual only if, and so far as it constitutes a means by which the individual in question can obtain other capital goods. Section 3. Money Not a Part of Social Capital By social or productive capital, Bombauerk means the aggregate of the products intended for employment and further production. If we accept the views expounded above, according to which money cannot be included among productive goods, then neither can it be included in social capital. It is true that Bombauerk includes it in social capital, as the majority of the economists that preceded him had done. This attitude follows logically from regarding money as a productive good. This is its only justification, and in endeavoring to show that money is not a productive good, we have implied how baseless a justification it is. In any case, perhaps we may suggest that those writers who include money among productive goods and, consequently, among capital goods, are not very consistent. They usually reckon money as a part of social capital, in that division of their systems where they deal with the concepts of money and capital. But certain obvious further conclusions are not drawn from this. On the contrary, where the doctrine of the nature of money as capital should be logically applied, it appears to have been suddenly forgotten. In reviewing the determinants of the rate of interest, writers emphasize over and over again that it is not the greater or smaller quantity of money that is of importance, but the greater or smaller quantity of other economic goods. To reconcile this assertion, which is indubitably a correct summary of the matter, with the other assertion that money is a productive good is simply impossible. Chapter 6. The Enemies of Money Section 1. Money in the Socialist Community It has been shown that under certain conditions, which occur the more frequently as division of labor and the differentiation of wants are extended, indirect exchange becomes inevitable, and that the evolution of indirect exchange gradually leads to the employment of a few particular commodities, or even one commodity only, as a common medium of exchange. When there is no exchange of any sort, and hence no indirect exchange, the use of media of exchange naturally remains unknown. This was the situation when the isolated household was the typical economic unit, and this, according to socialist aspirations, is what it will be again one day in that purely socialistic order where production and distribution are to be systematically regulated by a central body. This vision of the future socialistic system has not been described in detail by its prophets, and, in fact, it is not the same vision which they all see. There are some among them who allow a certain scope for exchange of economic goods and services, and so far as this is the case, the continued use of money remains possible. On the other hand, the certificates or orders that the organized society would distribute to its members cannot be regarded as money. Supposing that a receipt was given, say, to each laborer for each hour's labor, and that the social income, so far as it was not employed for the satisfaction of collective needs or the support of those not able to work, was distributed in proportion to the number of receipts in the possession of each individual, so that each receipt represented a claim to an aliquot part of the total amount of goods to be distributed. Then, the significance of any particular receipt as a means of satisfying the wants of an individual, in other words, its value, would vary in proportion to the size of the total dividend. If, with the same number of hours of labor, the income of the society in a given year was only half as big as in the previous year, 
then the value of each receipt would likewise be halved. The case of money is different. A decrease of 50% in the real social income would certainly involve a reduction in the purchasing power of money. But this reduction in the value of money need not bear any direct relation to the decrease in the size of the income. It might accidentally happen that the purchasing power of money was exactly halved also, but it need not happen so. This difference is of fundamental importance. In fact, the exchange value of money is determined in a totally different way from that of a certificate or warrant. Titles like these are not susceptible of an independent process of valuation at all. If it is certain that a warrant or order will always be honored on demand, then its value will be equal to that of the goods to which it refers. If this certainty is not absolute, the value of the warrant will be correspondingly less. If we suppose that a system of exchange might be developed even in a socialist society, not merely the exchange of labor certificates, but, say, the exchange of consumption goods between individuals, then we may conceive of a place for the function of money even within the framework of such a society. This money would not be so frequently and variously employed as in an economic order based on private ownership of the means of production, but its use would be governed by the same fundamental principles. These considerations dictate the attitude towards money that must be assumed by any attempt to construct an imaginary social order if self-contradiction is to be avoided. So long as such a scheme completely excludes the free exchange of goods and services, then it follows, logically, that it has no need for money. But so far as any sort of exchange at all is allowed, it seems that indirect exchange achieved by means of a common medium of exchange must be permitted also. Section 2. Money Cranks Superficial critics of the capitalistic economic system are in the habit of directing their attacks principally against money. They are willing to permit the continuance of private ownership of the means of production and consequently, given the present stage of division of labor, of free exchange of goods also, and yet they want this exchange to be achieved without any medium, or at least without a common medium, or money. They obviously regard the use of money as harmful, and hope to overcome all social evils by eliminating it. Their doctrine is derived from notions that have always been extraordinarily popular in lay circles during periods in which the use of money has been increasing. All the processes of our economic life appear in a monetary guise, and those who do not see beneath the surface of things are only aware of monetary phenomena and remain unconscious of deeper relationships. Money is regarded as the cause of theft and murder, of deception and betrayal, Money is blamed when the prostitute sells her body and when the bribed judge perverts the law. It is money against which the moralist declaims when he wishes to oppose excessive materialism. Significantly enough, avarice is called the love of money, and all evil is attributed to it. The confused and vague nature of such notions as these is obvious. It is not so clear whether it is thought that a return to direct exchange by itself will be able to overcome all the disadvantages of the use of money, or whether it is thought that other reforms will be necessary as well. The world makers and world improvers responsible for these notions feel no obligation to follow up their ideas inexorably to their final consequences. They prefer to call a halt at the point where the difficulties of the problem are just beginning. And this, incidentally, accounts for the longevity of their doctrines. So long as they remain nebulous, they offer nothing for criticism to seize upon. Even less worthy of serious attention are those schemes of social reform which, while not condemning the use of money in general, object to the use of gold and silver. In fact, such hostility to the precious metals has something very childish in it. When Thomas More, for example, endows the criminals in his utopia with golden chains and the ordinary citizens with gold and silver chamber pots, it is something of the spirit that leads primitive mankind to wreak vengeance 
on lifeless images and symbols. It is hardly worthwhile to devote even a moment to such fantastic suggestions, which have never been taken seriously. All the criticism of them that was necessary has been completed long ago. But one point, which usually escapes notice, must be emphasized. Among the many confused enemies of money, there is one group that fights with other theoretical weapons than those used by its usual associates. These enemies of money take their arguments from the prevailing theory of banking and propose to cure all human ills by means of an elastic credit system automatically adapted to the need for currency. It will surprise none who are acquainted with the unsatisfactory state of banking theory to find that scientific criticism has not dealt with such proposals as it should have done, and that it has, in fact, been incapable of doing so. The rejection of schemes such as Ernest Solvay's social compatibilism is to be attributed solely to the practical man's timidity and not to any strict proof of the weaknesses of the schemes which has indeed not been forthcoming. All the banking theorists whose views are derived from the system of Took and Fullerton, and this includes nearly all present-day writers, are helpless with regard to Solvay's theory and others of the same kind. They would like to condemn them, since their own feelings, as well as the trustworthy judgments of practical men, warn them against the airy speculations of reformers of this type, but they have no arguments against a system which, in the last analysis, involves nothing but the consistent application of their own theories. The third part of this book is devoted exclusively to problems of the banking system. There, the theory of the elasticity of credit is subjected to a detailed investigation, the results of which perhaps render any further discussion of this kind of doctrine unnecessary. Part 2. The Value of Money Chapter 1. The Concept of the Value of Money Section 1. Subjective and Objective Factors in the Theory of the Value of Money The central element in the economic problem of money is the objective exchange value of money, popularly called its purchasing power. This is the necessary starting point of all discussion. For it is only in connection with its objective exchange value that those peculiar properties of money that have differentiated it from commodities are conspicuous. This must not be understood to imply that subjective value is of less importance in the theory of money than elsewhere. The subjective estimates of individuals are the basis of the economic valuation of money just as of that of other goods, and these subjective estimates are ultimately derived, in the case of money as in the case of other economic goods, from the significance attaching to a good or complex of goods as the recognized necessity condition for the existence of a utility, given certain ultimate aims on the part of some individual. Nevertheless, while the utility of other goods depends on certain external facts, the objective use value of the commodity, and certain internal facts, the hierarchy of human needs, i.e., on conditions that do not belong to the category of the economic at all, but are partly of a technological and partly of a psychological nature. The subjective value of money is conditioned by its subjective exchange value, i.e., by a characteristic that falls within the scope of economics. In the case of money, Subjective use value and subjective exchange value coincide. Both are derived from objective exchange value, for money has no utility other than that arising from the possibility of obtaining other economic goods in exchange for it. It is impossible to conceive of any function of money, qua money, that can be separated from the fact of its objective exchange value. As far as the use value of a commodity is concerned, it is immaterial whether the commodity also has exchange value or not. But for money to have use value, the existence of exchange value is essential. This peculiarity of the value of money can also be expressed by saying that, 
As far as the individual is concerned, money has no use value at all, but only subjective exchange value. This, for example, is the practice of Raw and Bombauerk. Whether the one or the other phraseology is employed, scientific investigation of the characteristic will lead to the same conclusions. There is no reason to enter upon a discussion of this point, especially since the distinction between value in use and value in exchange no longer holds the important place in theory of value that it used to have. All that we are concerned with is to show that the task of economics in dealing with the value of money is a bigger one than its task in dealing with the value of commodities. When explaining the value of commodities, the economist can and must be content to take subjective use value for granted and leave investigation of its origins to the psychologist. But the real problem of value of money only begins when it leaves off in the case of commodity values, viz. at the point of tracing the objective determinants of its subjective value. For there is no subjective value of money without objective exchange value. It is not the task of the economist, but of the natural scientist, to explain why corn is useful to man and valued by him, but it is the task of the economist alone to explain the utility of money. Consideration of the subjective value of money without discussion of its objective exchange value is impossible. In contrast to commodities, Money would never be used unless it had an objective exchange value or purchasing power. The subjective value of money always depends on the subjective value of other economic goods that can be obtained in exchange for it. Its subjective value is, in fact, a derived concept. If we wish to estimate the significance that a given sum of money has, in view of the known dependence upon it of a certain satisfaction, we can do this only on the assumption that the money possesses a given objective exchange value. The exchange value of money is the anticipated use value of the things that can be obtained with it. Whenever money is valued by anyone, it is because he supposes it to have a certain purchasing power. It might possibly be objected that the mere possession of money of an unidentified amount of objective exchange value is not alone sufficient to guarantee the possibility of using it as a medium of exchange. That it is also necessary that this purchasing power should be present in a certain degree, neither too great nor too small, but such that the proportion between the value of the units of money and that of the units of commodity is a convenient one for carrying through the ordinary exchange transactions of daily life. That, even if it were true that half of the money in a country could perform the same service as the whole stock if the value of the monetary unit were doubled, yet it is doubtful if a similar proposition could be asserted of the case in which its value was increased a millionfold or diminished to one millionth in inverse correspondence with changes in the quantity of it, since such a currency would hardly be capable of fulfilling the functions of a common medium of exchange so well as the currencies in actual use, that we should try to imagine a commodity money of which a whole ton, or one of which only a thousandth of a milligram was equivalent to a dollar, and think of the inconveniences, the insuperable obstacles, in fact, which the employment of such a medium would inevitably place in the way of commerce. However true this may be, the question of the actual dimensions of the exchange ratio between money and commodities and of the size of the monetary unit is not an economic problem. It is a question that belongs to discussion of the technical conditions that make any particular good suitable for use as money. The relative scarcity of the precious metals, great enough to give them a high objective exchange value, but not so great as that of the precious stones or radium, and therefore not great enough to make their exchange value too high, must indeed be reckoned, along with such of the other characteristics as their practically unlimited divisibility, their malleability, and their powers of resistance to destructive external influences, as among the factors that were once decisive in causing them to be recognized as the most marketable goods and consequently to be employed as money. But nowadays, as monetary systems have developed, 
the particular level of value of the previous metals no longer has any important bearing on their use as money. The modern organization of the clearing system and the institution of fiduciary media have made commerce independent of the volume and weight of the monetary material. Section 2. The Objective Exchange Value of Money It follows from what has been said that there can be no discussion of the problem of the value of money without consideration of its objective exchange value. Under modern conditions, objective exchange value, which Wieser called Verkerschwert, or value in business transactions, is the most important kind of value because it governs the social, and not merely the individual aspect of economic life. Except in its explanation of the fundamentals of value theory, economics deals almost exclusively with objective exchange value. And while this is true to some extent of all goods, including those which are useful apart from any exchange value which they possess, it is still truer of money. The objective exchange value of goods is their objective significance in exchange, or, in other words, their capacity in given circumstances to procure a specific quantity of other goods as an equivalent in exchange. It should be observed that even objective exchange value is not really a property of the goods themselves bestowed on them by nature, for in the last resort, it also is derived from the human process of valuing individual goods. But the exchange ratios that are established between different goods in commercial transactions and are determined by the collective influence of the subjective valuations of all the persons doing business in the market present themselves to separate individuals who usually have an infinitesimal influence on the determination of the ratios as accomplished facts, which in most cases have to be accepted unconditionally. It has thus been easy for false abstractions from this state of affairs to give rise to the opinion that each good comes to the market endowed with a definite quantity of value independent of the valuations of individuals. From this point of view, goods are not exchanged for one another by human beings, they simply exchange. Objective exchange value, as it appears in the subjective theory of value, has nothing except its name in common with the old idea developed by the classical school of a value in exchange inherent in things themselves. In the value theory of Smith and Ricardo, and in that of their successors, value in exchange plays the leading part. These theories attempt to explain all the phenomena of value by starting from value in exchange, which they interpret as labor value or cost of production value. For modern value theory, their terminology can claim only a historical importance, and a confusion of the two concepts of exchange value need no longer be feared. This removes the objections that have recently been made to the continued use of the expression objective exchange value. If the objective exchange value of a good is its power to command a certain quantity of other goods in exchange, its price is this actual quantity of other goods. It follows that the concepts of price and objective exchange value are by no means identical. But it is, nevertheless, true that both obey the same laws. For when the law of price declares that a good actually commands a particular price, and explains why it does so, it of course implies that the good is able to command this price, and explains why it is able to do so. The law of price comprehends the law of exchange value. By objective exchange value of money, we are accordingly to understand the possibility of obtaining a certain quantity of other economic goods in exchange for a given quantity of money, and by the price of money, this actual quantity of other goods. It is possible to express the exchange value of a unit of money in units of any other commodity and speak of the commodity price of money. But, in actual life, this phraseology and the concept it expresses are unknown. For nowadays, money is the sole indicator of prices. Section 3 the problems involved in the theory of the value of money. 
The theory of money must take account of the fundamental difference between the principles which govern the value of money and those which govern the value of commodities. In the theory of the value of commodities, it is not necessary at first to pay any attention to objective exchange value. In this theory, all phenomena of value and price determination can be explained with subjective use value as the starting point. It is otherwise in the theory of the value of money, for since money, in contrast to other goods, can fulfill its economic function only if it possesses objective exchange value, an investigation into its subjective value demands an investigation first into this objective exchange value. In other words, the theory of the value of money leads us back through subjective exchange value to objective exchange value. Under the present economic system, which is founded on the division of labor and the free exchange of products, producers, as a rule, do not work directly on their own behalf but with a view to supplying the market. Consequently, their economic calculations are determined not by the subjective use values of their products, but by their subjective exchange values. Valuations which ignore the subjective exchange value and, consequently, the objective exchange value of a product and take account only of its subjective use value are nowadays most exceptional. They are on the whole limited to those cases in which the object has a sentimental value. But if we disregard those things to which certain individuals attach a symbolic significance because they remind them of experiences or persons that they wish to remember, while in the eyes of others for which they have not this personal interest, the things possess a very much lower value or even no value at all, it cannot be denied that human valuations of goods are based upon their exchange value. It is not use value, but exchange value that appears to govern the modern economic order. Nevertheless, if we trace to its deepest springs first the subjective and then the objective exchange value of commodities, we find that, in the last resort, it is still the subjective use value of things that determine the esteem in which they are held. For, quite apart from the fact that the commodities acquired in exchange for products are always valued according to their subjective use value, the only valuations that are of final importance in the determination of prices and objective exchange value are those based on the subjective use value that the products have for those persons who are the last to acquire them through the channels of commerce and who acquire them for their own consumption. The case of money is different. Its objective exchange value cannot be referred back to any sort of use value independent of the existence of this objective exchange value. In the origins of monetary systems, money is still a commodity which eventually ceases to circulate on reaching the hands of a final buyer or consumer. In the early stages of the history of money, there were even monetary commodities whose natural qualities definitely precluded their employment as money for more than a short time. An ox or a sack of corn cannot remain in circulation forever. It has sooner or later to be withdrawn for consumption if that part of its value, which does not depend on its employment as money, is not to be diminished by a deterioration of its substance. In a developed monetary system, on the other hand, we find commodity money of which large quantities remain constantly in circulation and are never consumed or used in industry, credit money whose foundation, the claim to payment, is never made use of, and possibly even fiat money which has no use at all except as money. Many of the most eminent economists have taken it for granted that the value of money and of the material of which it is made depends solely on its industrial employment and that the purchasing power of our present-day metallic money, for instance, and consequently the possibility of its continued employment as money, would immediately disappear if the properties of the monetary material as a useful metal were done away with by some accident or other. Nowadays this opinion is no longer tenable, not merely because there is a whole series of phenomena which it leaves unaccounted for, but chiefly because it is in any case opposed to the fundamental laws of the theory of economic value. 
to assert that the value of money is based on the non-monetary employment of its material is to eliminate the real problem altogether. Not only have we to explain the possibility of fiat money, the material of which has a far lower value without the official stamp than with it, we must also answer the question whether the possibility of a monetary employment of the commodity money material affects its utility and, consequently, its value, and if so, to what extent. The same problem arises in the case of credit money. Part of the stock of gold at the command of mankind is used for monetary purposes, part for industrial. A change from one kind of use to the other is always possible, Ingots pass from the vaults of banks to the workshops of goldsmiths and gilders, who also directly withdraw current coins from circulation and melt them down. On the other hand, things made of gold, even with a high value as works of art, find their way to the mint when unfavorable market conditions render a sale at anything higher than the bullion price impossible. One and the same price of metal can even fulfill both purposes simultaneously as will be seen if we think of ornaments that are used as money, or of a coin that is worn by its owner as jewelry until he parts with it again. Investigations into the foundations of the value of money must eliminate those determinants that arise from the properties of the monetary material as a commodity, since these present no peculiarity that could distinguish the value of money from that of other commodities. The value of commodity money is of importance for monetary theory only in so far as it depends on the peculiar economic position of the money, on its function as common medium of exchange. Changes in the value of the monetary material that arise from its characteristics as a commodity are consequently to be considered only so far as they seem likely to make it more or less suitable for performing the function of money. Apart from this, monetary theory must take the value of the monetary material that arises from its industrial usefulness as given. The material of which commodity money is made must have the same value whether it is used as money or otherwise. Whether a change in the value of gold originates in its employment as money or in its employment as a commodity, in either case, the value of the whole stock changes uniformly. It is otherwise with credit money and fiat money. With these, the substance that bears the impression is essentially insignificant in the determination of the value of the money. In some circumstances, it may have a relatively high exchange value comprising a considerable fraction of the total exchange value of the individual coin or note. But this value, which is not based on the monetary properties of the coin or note, only becomes of practical importance at the moment when the value based on the monetary property vanishes, i.e., at the moment when the individuals participating in commerce cease to use the coin or note in question as a common medium of exchange. When this is not the case, the coins or notes bearing the monetary impression must have a higher exchange value than other pieces of the same material so long as these are not marked out by any special characteristics. Again, in the case of credit money, the claims used as money have similarly a different exchange value from other claims of the same kind that are not used as money. The hundred gulden notes, which circulated as money in Austria-Hungary before the reform of the currency, had a higher exchange value than, say, a government security with a nominal value of a hundred gulden notwithstanding the fact that the latter bore interest and the former did not. Until gold was used as money, it was valued merely on account of the possibility of using it for ornamental purposes. If it had never been used as money, or if it had ceased to be so used, its present-day value would be determined solely by the extent to which it was known to be useful in industry. But additional opportunities of using it provided an addition to the original reasons for esteeming it. Gold began to be valued partly because it could be used as a common medium of exchange. It is not surprising that its value consequently rose, or that at least a decrease in its value, which possibly would have occurred for other reasons, was counterbalanced. Nowadays, the value of gold, our principal modern monetary material, 
is based on both possibilities of employment, on that for monetary purposes and on that for industrial purposes. It is impossible to say how far the present value of money depends on its monetary employment and how far on its industrial employment. When the institution of money was first established, the industrial basis of the value of the precious metals may have preponderated. But with progress in the monetary organization of economic life, the monetary employment has become more and more important. It is certain that, nowadays, the value of gold is largely supported by its monetary employment and that its demonetization would affect its price in an overwhelming fashion. The sharp decline in the price of silver since 1873 is recognized as largely due to the demonetization of this metal in most countries. And when, between 1914 and 1918, many countries replaced gold by bank notes and treasury notes so that gold flowed to those countries that had remained on a gold standard, the value of gold fell very considerably. The value of the materials that are used for the manufacture of fiat money and credit money is also influenced by their use as money as well as by all their other uses. The production of token coins is nowadays one of the most important uses of silver, for example. Again, when the minting of coins from nickel was begun over 50 years ago, the price of nickel rose so sharply that the director of the English Mint stated in 1873 that if minting from nickel were continued, the cost of the metal alone would exceed the face value of the coins. If we prefer to regard this sort of use as industrial and not monetary, however, it is because token coins are not money but money substitutes, and consequently the peculiar interactions between changes in the value of money and changes in the value of the monetary material are absent in these cases. The task of the theory of the value of money is to expound the laws which regulate the determination of the objective exchange value of money. It is not its business to concern itself with the determination of the value of the material from which the commodity money is made, so far as this value does not depend on the monetary, but on the other employment of this material. Neither is it its task to concern itself with the determination of the value of those materials that are used for making the concrete embodiments of fiat money. It discusses the objective exchange value of money only in so far as this depends on its monetary function. The other forms of value present no special problems for the theory of the value of money. There is nothing to be said about the subjective value of money that differs in any way from what economics teaches of the subjective value of other economic goods. And all that is important to know about the objective use value of money may be summed up in the one statement that it depends on the objective exchange value of money. Chapter 2. The Determinants of the Objective Exchange Value, or Purchasing Power, of Money Part 1. The Element of Continuity in the Objective Exchange Value of Money Section 1. The dependence of the subjective valuation of money on the existence of objective exchange value. According to modern value theory, price is the resultant of the interaction in the market of subjective valuations of commodities and price goods. From beginning to end, it is the product of subjective valuations. Goods are valued by the individuals exchanging them. According to their subjective use values, and their exchange ratios are determined within that range where both supply and demand are in exact quantitative equilibrium. The law of price, stated by Menger and Bombauerk, provides a complete and numerically precise explanation of these exchange ratios. It accounts exhaustively for all the phenomena of direct exchange. Under bilateral competition, market price is determined within a range whose upper limit is set by the valuations of the lowest bidder among the actual buyers and the highest offerer among the excluded would-be sellers and whose lower limit is set by the valuations of the lowest offerer among the actual sellers and the highest bidder among the excluded would-be buyers. This law of price is just as valid for indirect as for direct exchange. 
The price of money, like other prices, is determined in the last resort by the subjective valuations of buyers and sellers. But, as has been said already, the subjective use value of money, which coincides with its subjective exchange value, is nothing but the anticipated use value of the things that are to be bought with it. The subjective value of money must be measured by the marginal utility of the goods for which the money can be exchanged. It follows that a valuation of money is possible only on the assumption that the money has a certain objective exchange value. Such a point de pui is necessary before the gap between satisfaction and useless money can be bridged. Since there is no direct connection between money as such and any human want, individuals can obtain an idea of its utility and consequently of its value only by assuming a definite purchasing power. But it is easy to see that this supposition cannot be anything but an expression of the exchange ratio ruling at the time in the market between the money and commodities. Once an exchange ratio between money and commodities has been established in the market, it continues to exercise an influence beyond the period during which it is maintained. It provides the basis for the further valuation of money. Thus, the past objective exchange value of money has a certain significance for its present and future valuation. The money prices of today are linked with those of yesterday and before, and with those of tomorrow and after. But this alone will not suffice to explain the problem of the element of continuity in the value of money. It only postpones the explanation. To trace back the value that money has today to that which it had yesterday, the value that it had yesterday to that which it had the day before, and so on, is to raise the question of what determined the value of money in the first place. Consideration of the origin of the use of money and of the particular components of its value that depend on its monetary function suggest an obvious answer to this question. The first value of money was clearly the value which the goods used as money possessed, thanks to their suitability for satisfying human wants in other ways, at the moment when they were first used as common media of exchange. When individuals began to acquire objects, not for consumption, but to be used as media of exchange, they valued them according to the objective exchange value with which the market already credited them by reason of their industrial usefulness. And only as an additional consideration on account of the possibility of using them as media of exchange. The earliest value of money links up with the commodity value of the monetary material. But the value of money since then has been influenced not merely by the factors dependent on its industrial uses, which determine the value of the material of which the commodity money is made, but also by those which result from its use as money. Not only its supply and demand for industrial purposes, but also its supply and demand for use as a medium of exchange have influenced the value of gold from that point of time onwards when it was first used as money. Section 2. The necessity for a value independent of the monetary function before an object can serve as money. If the objective exchange value of money must always be linked with the pre-existing market exchange ratio between money and other economic goods, since otherwise individuals would not be in a position to estimate the value of the money, it follows that an object cannot be used as money unless, at the moment when its use as money begins, it already possesses an objective exchange value based on some other use. This provides both a refutation of those theories which derive the origin of money from a general agreement to impute fictitious value to things intrinsically valueless and a confirmation of Manger's hypothesis concerning the origin of the use of money. This link with the pre-existing exchange value is necessary not only for commodity money, but equally for credit money and fiat money. No fiat money could ever come into existence if it did not satisfy this condition. Let us suppose that, among those ancient and modern kinds of money about which it may be doubtful whether they should be reckoned as credit money or fiat money, 
there have actually been representatives of pure fiat money. Such money must have come into existence in one of two ways. It may have come into existence because money substitutes already in circulation, i.e. claims payable in money on demand, were deprived of their character as claims, and yet still used in commerce as media of exchange. In this case, the starting point for their valuation lay in the objective exchange value that they had at the moment when they were deprived of their character as claims. The other possible case is that in which coins that once circulated as commodity money are transformed into fiat money by cessation of free coinage, either because there was no further minting at all or because minting was continued only on behalf of the treasury. No obligation of conversion being de jure or de facto assumed by anybody, and nobody having any grounds for hoping that such an obligation ever would be assumed by anybody. Here the starting point for the valuation lies in the objective exchange value of the coins at the time of the cessation of free coinage. Before an economic good begins to function as money, it must already possess exchange value based on some other cause than its monetary function. But money that already functions as such may remain valuable even when the original source of its exchange value has ceased to exist. Its value, then, is based entirely on its function as common medium of exchange. Section 3 the Significance of Pre-Existing Prices in the Determination of Market Exchange Ratios From what has just been said, the important conclusion follows that a historically continuous component is contained in the objective exchange value of money. The past value of money is taken over by the present and transformed by it. The present value of money passes on into the future and is transformed in its turn. In this, there is a contrast between the determination of the exchange value of money and that of the exchange value of other economic goods. All pre-existing exchange ratios are quite irrelevant so far as the actual levels of the reciprocal exchange ratios of other economic goods are concerned. It is true that if we look beneath the concealing monetary veil to the real exchange ratios between goods, we observe a certain continuity. Alterations in real prices occur slowly as a rule, but this stability of prices has its cause in the stability of the price determinants, not in the law of price determination itself. Prices change slowly because the subjective valuations of human beings change slowly. Human needs and human opinions as to the suitability of goods for satisfying those needs are no more liable to frequent and sudden changes than are the stocks of goods available for consumption or the manner of their social distribution. The fact that today's market price is seldom very different from yesterday's is to be explained by the fact that the circumstances that determined yesterday's price have not greatly changed overnight, so that today's price is a resultant of nearly identical factors. If rapid and erratic variations in prices were usually encountered in the market, the conception of objective exchange value would not have attained the significance that it is actually accorded both by consumer and producer. In this sense, reference to an inertia of prices is unobjectionable, although the errors of earlier economists should warn us of real danger that the use of terms borrowed from mechanics may lead to a mechanical system, i.e., to one that abstracts erroneously from the subjective valuations of individuals. But any suggestion of a causal relationship between past and present prices must be decisively rejected. It is not disputed that there are institutional forces in operation which oppose changes in prices that would be necessitated by changes in valuations, and which are responsible when changes in prices that would have been caused by changes in supply and demand are postponed, and when small or transitory changes in the relations between supply and demand lead to no corresponding change in prices at all. It is quite permissible to speak of an inertia of prices in this sense. 
Even the statement that the closing price forms the starting point for the transactions of the next market may be accepted if it is understood in the sense suggested above. If the general conditions that determined yesterday's price have altered but little during the night, today's prices should be but little different from that of yesterday. And in practice, it does not seem incorrect to make yesterday's the starting point. Nevertheless, there is no causal connection between past and present prices as far as the relative exchange ratios of economic goods, not including money, are concerned. The fact that the price of beer was high yesterday cannot be of the smallest significance as far as today's price is concerned. We need only think of the effect upon the prices of alcoholic drinks that would follow a general triumph of the prohibition movement. Anybody who devotes attention to market activities is daily aware of alterations in the exchange ratios of goods, and it is quite impossible for anybody who is well acquainted with economic phenomena to accept a theory which seeks to explain price changes by a supposed constancy of prices. It may incidentally be remarked that to trace the determination of prices back to their supported inertia, as even Zweidnik in his pleadings for this assumption is obliged to admit, is to resign at the outset any hope of explaining the ultimate causes of prices and to be content with explanations from secondary causes. It must unreservedly be admitted that an explanation of the earliest forms of exchange transaction can be shown to have existed, a task to the solution of which the economic historian has so far contributed but little, would show that the forces that counteract sudden changes in prices were once stronger than they are now. But it must positively be denied that there is any sort of connection between those early prices and those of the present day. That is, if there really is anybody who believes it possible to maintain the assertion that the exchange ratios of economic goods, not the money prices, that prevail today on the German stock exchanges, are in any sort of causal connection with those that were valid in the days of Ermann or Barbarossa. If all the exchange ratios of the past were erased from human memory, the process of market price determination might certainly become more difficult because everybody would have to construct a new scale of valuations for himself, but it would not become impossible. In fact, People the whole world over are engaged daily and hourly in the operation from which all prices result. The decision as to the relative significance enjoyed by specific quantities of goods as conditions for the satisfaction of wants. It is so far as the money prices of goods are determined by monetary factors that a historically continuous component is included in them, without which their actual level cannot be explained. This component, too, is derived from exchange ratios which can be entirely explained by reference to the subjective valuations of the individuals taking part in the market, even though these valuations were not originally grounded upon the specifically monetary utility alone of these goods. The valuation of money by the market can only start from a value possessed by the money in the past and this relationship influences the new level of the objective exchange value of money. The historically transmitted value is transformed by the market without regard to what has become its historical content. But it is not merely the starting point for today's objective exchange value of money. It is an indispensable element in its determination. The individual must take into account the objective exchange value of money as determined in the market yesterday, before he can form an estimate of the quantity of money that he needs today. The demand for money and the supply of it are thus influenced by the value of money in the past, but they in their turn modify this value until they are brought into equilibrium. Section 4. The Applicability of the Marginal Utility Theory to Money Demonstration of the fact that search for the determinants of the objective exchange value of money always leads us back to a point where the value of money is not determined in any way by its use as a medium of exchange, 
but solely by its other functions, prepares the way for developing a complete theory of the value of money on the basis of the subjective theory of value and its peculiar doctrine of marginal utility. Until now, the subjective school has not succeeded in doing this. In fact, among the few of its members who have paid any attention at all to the problem, there have been some who have actually attempted to demonstrate its insolubility. The subjective theory of value has been helpless in the face of the task here confronting it. There are two theories of money which, whatever else we may think of them, must be acknowledged as having attempted to deal with the whole problem of the value of money. The objective theories of value succeeded in introducing a formally unexceptional theory of money into their systems, which deduces the value of money from its cost of production. It is true that the abandonment of this monetary theory is not merely to be ascribed to those shortcomings of the objective theory of the value in general, which led to its supersession by the theory of the modern school. Apart from this fundamental weakness, the cost of production theory of the value of money exhibited one feature that was an easy target for criticism. While it certainly provided a theory of commodity money, even if only a formally correct one, it was unable to deal with the problem of credit money and fiat money. Nevertheless, it was a complete theory of money insofar as it did at least attempt to give a full explanation of the value of commodity money. The other similarly complete theory of the value of money is that version of the quantity theory associated with the name of Davanzati. According to this theory, all the things that are able to satisfy human wants are conventionally equated with all the monetary metal. From this, since what is true of the whole is also true of its parts, the exchange ratios between commodity units and units of money can be deduced. Here we are confronted with a hypothesis that is not in any way supported by facts. To demonstrate its untenability once more would nowadays just be a waste of time. Nevertheless, it must not be overlooked that Davanzati was the first who attempted to present the problem as a whole and to provide a theory that would explain not merely the variations in an existing exchange ratio between money and other economic goods, but also the origin of this ratio. The same cannot be said of other versions of the quantity theory. These all tacitly assume a certain value of money as given and absolutely refuse to investigate further into the matter. They overlook the fact that what is required is an explanation of what determines the exchange ratio between money and commodities, and not merely of what causes changes in this ratio. In this respect, the quantity theory resembles various general theories of value, many versions of the doctrine of supply and demand, for example, which have not attempted to explain price as such, but have been content to establish a law of price variations. These forms of the quantity theory are in fact nothing but the application of the law of supply and demand to the problem of the value of money. They introduce into monetary theory all the strong points of this doctrine, and, of course, all its weak points as well. The revolution in economics since 1870 has not yet been any more successful in leading to an entirely satisfactory solution of this problem. Of course, this does not mean that the progress of the science has left no trace on monetary theory in general, and on the theory of the value of money in particular. It is one of the many services of the subjective theory of value to have prepared the way for a deeper understanding of the nature and value of money. The investigations of Manger have placed the theory on a new basis, but till now one thing has been neglected. Neither Manger nor any of the many investigators who have tried to follow him have even so much as attempted to solve the fundamental problem of the value of money. Broadly speaking, they have occupied themselves with checking and developing the traditional views and here and there expounding them more correctly and precisely, but they have not provided an answer to the question, what are the determinants of the objective exchange value of money? 
Menger and Jevons have not touched upon the problem at all. Carver and Kinley have contributed nothing of real importance to its solution. Walrus and Kemmerer assume a given value of money and develop what is merely a theory of variations in the value of money. Kemmerer, it is true, approaches very close to a solution of the problem, but passes it by. Wieser expressly refers to the incomplete nature of the previous treatment. In his criticism of the quantity theory, he argues that the law of supply and demand, in its older form, the application of which to the problem of money constitutes the quantity theory, has a very inadequate content, since it gives no explanation at all of the way in which value is really determined or of its level at any given time but confines itself without any further explanation merely to stating the direction in which value will remove in consequence of variations in supply or demand, i.e., in an opposite direction to changes in the former and in the same direction as changes in the latter. He further argues that it is no longer possible to rest content with the theory of the economic value of money which deals so inadequately with the problem that since the supersession of the old law of supply and demand is applied to commodities, the case for which it was originally constructed, a more searching law must also be sought to apply to the case of money. But Wieser does not deal with the problem whose solution he himself states to be the object of his investigation. For in the further course of his argument, he declares that the concepts of supply of money and demand for money as a medium of exchange, are useless for his purpose and puts forward a theory which attempts to explain variations in the objective exchange value of money, objective in er Tauschwitz des Geldes, by reference to the relationship that exists in an economic community between money income and real income. For while it is true that reference to the ratio between money income and real income may well serve to explain variations in the objective exchange value of money, Wieser nowhere makes the attempt to evolve a complete theory of money, an attempt which, admittedly, the factors of supply and demand being excluded from consideration, would be certain to fail. The very objection that he raises against the old quantity theory that it affirms nothing concerning the actual determination of value, or the level at which it must be established at any time, must also be raised against his own doctrine. And this is all the more striking inasmuch as it was Wieser who, by revealing the historical element in the purchasing power of money, laid the foundation for the further development of the subjective theory of the value of money. The unsatisfactory results offered by the subjective theory of value might seem to justify the opinion that this doctrine, and especially its proposition concerning the significance of marginal utility, must necessarily fall short as a means of dealing with the problem of money. Characteristically enough, it was a representative of the new school, Wicksell, who first expressed this opinion. Wetzel considers the principle which lies at the basis of all modern investigation into theory of value, viz. the concept of marginal utility, may well be suited to explaining the determination of exchange ratios between one commodity and another, but that it has practically no significance at all, or at most an entirely secondary significance, in explaining the exchange ratios between money and other economic goods. Wixell, however, does not appear to detect any sort of objection to the marginal utility theory in this assertion. According to his argument, the objective exchange value of money is not determined at all by the processes of the market in which the money and other economic goods are exchanged. If the money price of a single commodity or group of commodities is wrongly assessed in the market, then the resulting maladjustments of the supply and demand and the production and consumption of the commodity or group of commodities will sooner or later bring about the necessary correction. If, on the other hand, all commodity prices or the average price level should for any reason be raised or lowered, there is no factor in the circumstances of the commodity market that could bring about a reaction. 
Consequently, if there is to be any reaction at all against a price assessment that is either too high or too low, it must in some way or other originate outside the commodity market. In the further course of his argument, Wicksell arrives at the conclusion that the regulator of money prices is to be sought in the relations of the commodity market to the money market, in the broadest sense of the term. The cause which influences the demand for raw materials, labor, the use of land, and other means of production, and thus indirectly determines the upward or downward movement of commodity prices, is the ratio between the money rate of interest, Darlenschwins, and the natural or equilibrium rate of interest, Naturalische Kapitalzins, by which we are to understand that rate of interest which would be determined by supply and demand if real capital was itself lent directly without the intermediation of money. Wicksell imagines that this argument of his provides a theory of the determination of the objective exchange value of money. In fact, however, all that he attempts to prove is that forces operate from the loan market on the commodity market which prevent the objective exchange value of money from rising too high or falling too low. He never asserts that the rate of interest on loans determines the actual level of this value in any way. In fact, to assert this would be absurd. But if we are to speak of a level of money prices that is too high or too low, we must first state how the ideal level with which the actual level is compared has been established. It is in no way sufficient to show that the position of equilibrium is returned to after any disturbance if the existence of this position of equilibrium is not first explained. Indubitably, this is the primary problem, and its solution leads directly to that of the other. Without it, further inquiry must remain unfruitful for the state of equilibrium can only be maintained by those forces which first established it and continue to re-establish it. If the circumstances of the loan market can provide no explanation of the genesis of the exchange ratio subsisting between money and other economic goods, then neither can they help to explain why this ratio does not alter. The objective exchange value of money is determined in the market where money is exchanged for commodities and commodities for money. To explain its determination is the task of the theory of the value of money. But Wexel is of the opinion that the laws of the exchange of commodities contain in themselves nothing that could determine the absolute level of money prices. This amounts to a denial of all possibility of scientific investigation in this sphere. Helferich also is of the opinion that there is an insurmountable obstacle in the way of applying the marginal utility theory to the problem of money. For while the marginal utility theory attempts to base the exchange value of goods on the degree of their utility to the individual, the degree of utility of money to the individual quite obviously depends on its exchange value, since money can have utility only if it has exchange value, and the degree of the utility is determined by the level of the exchange value. Money is valued subjectively according to the amount of consumable goods that can be obtained in exchange for it, or according to what other goods have to be given in order to obtain the money needed for making payments. The marginal utility of money to any individual, i.e., the marginal utility derivable from the goods that can be obtained with any given quantity of money, or that must be surrendered for the required money, presupposes a certain exchange value of the money. So, the latter cannot be derived from the former. Those who have realized the significance of historically transmitted values in the determination of the objective exchange value of money will not find great difficulty in escaping from this apparently circular argument. It is true that valuation of the monetary unit by the individual is possible only on the assumption that an exchange ratio already exists in the market between the money and other economic goods. Nevertheless, it is erroneous to deduce from this that a complete and satisfactory explanation of the determination of the objective exchange value of money 
cannot be provided by the marginal utility theory. The fact that this theory is unable to explain the objective exchange value of money entirely by reference to its monetary utility, that to complete its explanation, as we were able to show, it is obliged to go back to that original exchange value, which was based not on a monetary function at all, but on other uses of the object that was to be used as money, this must not in any way be reckoned to the discredit of the theory, for it corresponds exactly to the nature and origin of the particular objective exchange value under discussion. To demand of a theory of the value of money that it should explain the exchange ratio between money and commodities solely with reference to the monetary function and without the assistance of the element of historical continuity in the value of money is to make demands of it that run quite contrary to its nature and its proper task. The theory of the value of money as such can trace back the objective exchange value of money only to that point where it ceases to be the value of money and becomes merely the value of a commodity. At this point, the theory must hand over all further investigation to the general theory of value, which will then find no further difficulty in the solution of the problem. It is true that the subjective valuation of money presupposes an existing objective exchange value, but the value that has to be presupposed is not the same as the value that has to be explained. What has to be presupposed is yesterday's exchange value, and it is quite legitimate to use it as an explanation of that of today. The objective exchange value of money, which rules in the market today, is derived from yesterday's under the influence of the subjective valuations of the individuals frequenting the market, just as yesterday's in its turn was derived under the influence of subjective valuations from the objective exchange value possessed by the money the day before yesterday. If in this way we continually go farther and farther back, we must eventually arrive at a point where we no longer find any component in the objective exchange value of money that arises from valuations based on the function of money as a common medium of exchange, where the value of money is nothing other than the value of an object that is useful in some other way than as money. But this point is not merely an instrumental concept of theory, it is an actual phenomenon of economic history, making its appearance at the moment when indirect exchange begins. Before it was usual to acquire goods in the market, not for personal consumption, but simply in order to exchange them again for the goods that were really wanted, each individual commodity was only accredited with that value given by the subjective valuations based on its direct utility. It was not until it became customary to acquire certain goods merely in order to use them as media of exchange that people began to esteem them more highly than before, on account of this possibility of using them in indirect exchange. The individual valued them in the first place because they were useful in the ordinary sense, and then additionally because they could be used as media of exchange. Both sorts of valuation are subject to the law of marginal utility. Just as the original starting point of the value of money was nothing but the result of subjective valuations, so also is the present-day valuation of money. But Helfrich manages to bring forward yet another argument for the inapplicability of the marginal utility theory to money. Looking at the economic system as a whole, it is clear that the notion of marginal utility rests on the fact that, given a certain quantity of goods, only certain wants can be satisfied and only a certain set of utilities provided. With given wants and a given set of means, the marginal degree of utility is determined also. According to the marginal utility theory, this fixes the value of the goods in relation to the other goods that are offered as an equivalent in exchange and fixes it in such a manner that that part of the demand that cannot be satisfied with a given supply is excluded by the fact that it is not able to offer an equivalent corresponding to the marginal utility of the goods demanded. 
Now, Helfrich objects that while the existence of a limited supply of any goods except money is in itself sufficient to imply the limitation of their utility also, this is not true of money. The utility of a given quantity of money depends directly upon the exchange value of the money, not only from the point of view of the individual, but also for society as a whole. The higher the value of the unit in relation to other goods, the greater will be the quantity of these other goods that can be paid for by means of the same sum of money. The value of goods in general result from the limitation of the possible utilities that can be obtained from a given supply of them, and while it is usually higher according to the degree of utility which is excluded by the limitation of supply, the total utility of the supply itself cannot be increased by an increase in its value, but, in the case of money, the utility of a given supply can be increased ad lib by an increase in the value of the unit. The error in this argument is to be found in its regarding the utility of money from the point of view of the community instead of from that of the individual. Every valuation must emanate from somebody who is in a position to dispose in exchange of the object valued. Only those who have a choice between two economic goods are able to form a judgment as to value, and they do this by preferring the one to the other. If we start with valuations from the point of view of society as a whole, we tacitly assume the existence of a socialized economic organization in which there is no exchange and in which the only valuations are those of the responsible official body. Opportunities for valuation in such a society would arise in the control of production and consumption, as, for example, in deciding how certain production goods were to be used when there were alternative ways of using them. But in such a society there would be no room at all for money. Under such conditions, a common medium of exchange would have no utility and consequently no value either. It is therefore illegitimate to adopt the point of view of the community as a whole when dealing with the value of money. All consideration of the value of money must obviously presuppose a state of society in which exchange takes place and must take as its starting point individuals acting as independent economic agents within such a society. That is to say, individuals engaged in valuing things. Section 5. Monetary and Non-Monetary Influences Affecting the Objective Exchange Value of Money Now, the first part of the problem of the value of money having been solved, it is at last possible for us to evolve a plan of further procedure. We no longer are concerned to explain the origin of the objective exchange value of money. This task has already been performed in the course of the preceding investigation. We now have to establish the laws which govern variations in existing exchange ratios between money and the other economic goods. This part of the problem of the value of money has occupied economists from the earliest times, although it is the other that ought logically to have been dealt with first. For this reason, as well as for many others, what has been done towards its elucidation does not amount to very much. Of course, this part of the problem is also much more complicated than the first part. In investigations into the nature of changes in the value of money, it is usual to distinguish between two sorts of determinants of the exchange ratio that connects money and other economic goods, those that exercise their effect on the money side of the ratio and those that exercise their effect on the commodity side. This distinction is extremely useful. Without it, in fact, all attempts at a solution would have to be dismissed beforehand as hopeless. Nevertheless, its true meaning must not be forgotten. The exchange ratios between commodities, and the same is naturally true of the exchange ratios between commodities and money, result from determinants which affect both terms in the exchange ratio. But existing exchange ratios between goods may be modified by a change in determinants connected only with one of the two sets of exchanged objects. 
Although all the factors that determine the valuation of a good remain the same, its exchange ratio with another good may alter if the factors that determine the valuation of this second good alter. If of two persons I prefer A to B, this preference may be reversed, even though my feelings for A remains unchanged, if I contract a closer friendship with B. Similarly with the relationships between goods and human beings. He who today prefers the consumption of a cup of tea to that of a dose of quinine may make a contrary valuation tomorrow, even though his liking for tea has not diminished, if he has, say, caught a fever overnight. Whereas the factors that determine prices always affect both sets of the goods that are to be exchanged, those of them which merely modify existing prices may sometimes be restricted to one set of goods only. Part 2. Fluctuations in the objective exchange value of money evoked by changes in the ratio between the supply of money and the demand for it. Section 6. The Quantity Theory That the objective exchange value of money as historically transmitted is affected not only by the industrial use of the material from which it is made, but also by its monetary use, is a proposition which hardly any economist would nowadays deny. It is true that lay opinion was molded entirely by the contrary belief until very recent times. To a naive observer, money made out of precious metal was sound money, because the piece of precious metal was an intrinsically valuable object, while paper money was bad money because its value was only artificial. But even the layman who holds this opinion accepts the money in the course of business transactions, not for the sake of its individual use value, but for the sake of its objective exchange value, which depends largely upon its monetary employment. He values a gold coin not merely for the sake of its industrial use value, say, because of the possibility of using it as jewelry, but chiefly on account of its monetary utility. But, of course, to do something and to render an account to oneself of what one does and why one does it are quite different things. Judgment upon the shortcomings of popular views about money and its value must be lenient, for even the attitude of science toward this problem has not always been free from error. Happily, the last few years have seen a gradual but definite change in popular monetary theory. It is now generally recognized that the value of money depends partly on its monetary function. This is due to the increased attention that has been devoted to questions of monetary policy since the commencement of the great controversy about the standards. The old theories proved unsatisfactory. It was not possible to explain phenomena such as those of the Austrian or Indian currency systems without invoking the assumption that the value of money originates partly in its monetary function. The naivete of the numerous writings which attack this opinion, and their complete freedom from the restraining influence of any sort of knowledge of the theory of value, may occasionally lead the economists to regard them as unimportant. But they may at least claim to have performed the service of shaking deep-rooted prejudices and stimulating a general interest in the problem of prices. No doubt they are a gratifying indication of a growing interest in economic questions. If this is kept in mind, it is possible to think more generously of many erroneous monetary theories. It is true that there has been no lack of attempts to explain the peculiar phenomena of modern monetary systems in other ways, but they have all been unsuccessful. Thus, in particular, Laughlin's theory comes to grief in failing to take account of the special aspects of the value of money that are associated with the specifically monetary functions. Quite correctly, Laughlin stresses as the peculiar characteristic of money substitutes their constant and immediate convertibility into money. Nevertheless, he would seem to be mistaken on a fundamental point when he applies the name of token money to such currencies as the rupee from 1893 to 1899 and the Russian ruble and Austrian gulden at the time of the suspension of cash payments. 
He accounts for the fact that a piece of paper which is not immediately convertible into gold can have any value at all, by reference to the possibility that it will nevertheless someday be converted. He compares inconvertible paper money with the shares of a concern which is temporarily not paying any dividend, but whose shares may nevertheless have a certain exchange value because of the possibility of future dividends. And, he says, that the fluctuations in the exchange value of such paper money are consequently based upon the varying prospects of its ultimate conversion. The error in this conclusion may be the most simply demonstrated by means of an actual example. Let us select for this purpose the monetary history of Austria, which Laughlin also uses as an illustration. From 1859 onwards, the Austrian National Bank was released from the obligation to convert its notes on demand into silver, and nobody could tell when the state paper money issued in 1866 would be redeemed, or even if it would be redeemed at all. It was not until the later 90s that the transition to metallic money was completed by the actual resumption of cash payments on the part of the Austro-Hungarian Bank. Now, Laughlin attempts to explain the value of the Austrian currency during this period by reference to the prospect of a future conversion of the notes into metallic commodity money. He finds the basis of its value, at first, in an expectation that it would be converted into silver, and afterwards in an expectation that it would be converted into gold, and traces the vicissitudes of its purchasing power to the varying chances of its ultimate conversion. The inadmissibility of this argument can be demonstrated in strike can be argument this argument. In the year 1884, the year is chosen at random, the 5% Austrian government bonds were quoted on the Viennese Stock Exchange at an average rate of 95.81 or 4.19% below par. The quotation was in terms of Austrian paper gulden. The government bonds represented claims against the Austrian state bearing interest at 5%. Thus, both the bonds and the notes were claimed against the same debtor. It is true that these government bonds were not repayable, that is to say not redeemable on the part of the creditor. Nevertheless, seeing that interest was paid on them, this could not prejudice their value in comparison with that of the non-interest-bearing currency notes, which were also not redeemable. Furthermore, the interest on the bonds was payable in paper money, and if the government redeemed them, it could do also this in paper money. In fact, the bonds in question were redeemed voluntarily in 1892, long before the currency notes were converted into gold. The question now arises, how could it come about that the government bonds, bearing interest at 5%, could be valued less highly than the non-interest-bearing currency notes? This could not possibly be attributed, say, to the fact that people hoped that the currency notes would be converted into gold before the bonds were redeemed. There was no suggestion of such an expectation. Quite another circumstance decided the matter. The currency notes were common media of exchange. They were money, and consequently, besides the value that they possessed as claims against the state, they also had a value as money. It is beyond doubt that their value as claims alone would not have been an adequate basis even for a relatively large proportion of their actual exchange value. The date of repayment of the claims that was embodied in these notes was in fact quite uncertain, but in any case very distant. As claims, it was impossible for them to have a higher exchange value than corresponded to the then value of the expectation of their repayment. Now, after the cessation of free coinage of silver, it was fairly obvious that the paper golden, and incidentally the silver golden, would not be converted at a rate appreciably in excess of the average rate at which it circulated in the period immediately preceding the conversion. In any case, after the legal determination of the conversion ratio by the Currency Regulation Law of August 2nd, 1892, it was settled that the conversion of the currency notes would not take place at any higher rate than this. How could it come about, then, that the gold value of the krona, the half-gulden, 
already fluctuated about this rate as early as the second half of the year, 1892, although the date of conversion was then still quite unknown. Usually a claim to a fixed sum, the date of payment of which lies in the uncertain future is valued considerably less highly than the sum to which it refers. To this question, Laughlin's theory cannot provide an answer. Only by taking account of the fact that the monetary function also contributes towards value is it possible to find a satisfactory explanation. The attempts that have so far been made to determine the quantitative significance of the forces emanating from the side of money that affect the exchange ratio existing between money and other economic goods have followed throughout the line of thought of the quantity theory. This is not to say that all the exponents of the quantity theory had realized that the value of money is not determined solely by its non-monetary industrial employment but also, or even solely, by its monetary function. Many quantitative theorists have been of another opinion on this point and have believed that the value of money depends solely on the industrial employment of the monetary material. The majority have had no clear conception of the question at all. Very few have approached its true solution. It is often hard to decide in which class certain of these authors should be placed. Their phraseology is often obscure and their theories not seldom contradictory. All the same, let us suppose that all quantity theorists had recognized the significance of the monetary function in the determination of the value of the monetary material and criticized the usefulness of their theory from this point of view. When the determinants of the exchange ratios between economic goods were first inquired into, Attention was early devoted to two factors whose importance for the pricing process was not to be denied. It was impossible to overlook the well-known connection between variations in the available quantity of goods and variations in prices, and the proposition was soon formulated that a good would rise in price if the available quantity of it diminished. Similarly, the importance of the total volume of transactions in the determination of prices was also realized. Thus, a mechanical theory of price determination was arrived at, the doctrine of supply and demand, which, until very recently, held such a prominent position in our science. Of all explanations of prices, it is the oldest. We cannot dismiss it offhand as erroneous, the only valid objection to it is that it does not go back to the ultimate determinants of prices. It is correct or incorrect according to the content given to the words demand and supply. It is correct if account is taken of all the factors that motivate people in buying and selling. It is incorrect if supply and demand are interpreted and compared in a merely quantitative sense. It was an obvious step to take this theory that had been constructed to explain the reciprocal exchange ratios of commodities and apply it to fluctuations in the relative values of commodities and money also. As soon as people became conscious of the fact of variations in the value of money at all and gave up the naive conception of money as an invariable measure of value, they began to explain these variations also by quantitative changes in supply and demand. It is true that the usual criticism of the quantity theory, often expressed with more resentment than is consonant with that objectivity which alone should be the distinctive mark of scientific investigation, had an easy task so far as it was leveled against the older incomplete version. It was not difficult to prove that the supposition that changes in the value of money must be proportionate to changes in the quantity of money so that, for example, a doubling of the quantity of money would lead to a doubling of prices also, was not in accordance with facts and could not be theoretically established in any way whatever. It was still simpler to show the untenability of the naive version of the theory which regarded the total quantity of money and the total stock of money as equivalent. But all these objections do not touch the essence of the doctrine. Neither can any sort of refutation or limitation of the quantity theory be deduced from the fact that a number of writers claim validity for it only on the assumption of ceteris paribus, 
not even though they state further that this supposition never is fulfilled and never could be fulfilled. The assumption, Ceteris Paribus, is the self-evident appendage of every scientific doctrine, and there is no economic law that can dispense with it. Against such superficial criticism, the quantity theory has been well able to defend itself triumphantly, and through the centuries condemned by some and exalted as an indisputable truth by others, it has always been the very center of scientific discussion. It has been dealt with in an immense literature, far beyond the power of any one person to master. It is true that the scientific harvest of these writings is but small. The theory has been adjudged right or wrong, and statistical data, mostly incomplete and incorrectly interpreted, have been used both to prove and to disprove it, although sufficient care has seldom been taken to eliminate variations brought about by accidental circumstances. On the other hand, investigation on a basis of the theory of value has but seldom been attempted. If we wish to arrive at a just appraisal of the quantity theory, we must consider it in the light of the contemporary theories of value. The core of the doctrine consists in the proposition that the supply of money and the demand for it both affect its value. This proposition is probably a sufficiently good hypothesis to explain big changes in prices, but it is far from containing a complete theory of the value of money. It describes one cause of changes in prices. It is nevertheless inadequate for dealing with the problem exhaustively. By itself, it does not compromise a theory of the value of money. It needs the basis of a general value theory. One after another, the doctrine of supply and demand, the cost of production theory, and the subjective theory of value have had to provide the foundations for the quantity theory. If we make use in our discussion of only one fundamental idea contained in the quantity theory, the idea that a connection exists between variations in the value of money on the one hand and variations in relations between the demand for money and the supply of it on the other hand, our reason is not that this is the most correct expression of the content of the theory from the historical point of view, but that it constitutes that core of truth in the theory which even the modern investigator can and must recognize as useful. Although the historian of economic theory may find this formulation inexact and produce quotations to refute it, he must nevertheless admit that it contains the correct expression of what is valuable in the quantity theory and usable as a cornerstone for a theory of the value of money. Beyond this proposition, the quantity theory can provide us with nothing. Above all, it fails to explain the mechanism of variations in the value of money. Some of its expositors do not touch upon this question at all. The others employ an inadequate principle for dealing with it. Observation teaches us that certain relations of the kind suggested between the available stock of money and the need for money do in fact exist, the problem is to deduce these relations from the fundamental laws of value and so at last to comprehend their true significance. Section 7. The Stock of Money and the Demand for Money The process by which supply and demand are accommodated to one another until a position of equilibrium is established and both are brought into quantitative and qualitative coincidence is the higgling of the market. But supply and demand are only the links in a chain of phenomena, one end of which has this visible manifestation in the market, while the other is anchored deep in the human mind. The intensity with which supply and demand are expressed, and consequently the level of the exchange ratio at which both coincide, depends on the subjective valuations of individuals. This is true not only of the direct exchange ratios between economic goods other than money, but also of the exchange ratio between money on the one hand and commodities on the other. For a long time it was believed that the demand for money was a quantity determined by objective factors and independent of subjective considerations. It was thought that the demand for money in an economic community was determined, on the one hand, 
by the total quantity of commodities that had to be paid for during a given period, and on the other hand by the velocity of circulation of the money. There is an error in the very starting point of this way of regarding the matter, which was first successfully attacked by Menger. It is inadmissible to begin with the demand for money of the community. The individualistic economic community as such, which is the only sort of community in which there is a demand for money, is not an economic agent. It demands money only in so far as its individual members demand money. The demand for money of the economic community is nothing but the sum of the demands for money of the individual economic agents composing it. But for individual economic agents, it is impossible to make use of the formula total volume of transactions divided by velocity of circulation. If we wish to arrive at a description of the demand for money of an individual, we must start with the considerations that influence such an individual in receiving and paying out money. Every economic agent is obliged to hold a stock of the common medium of exchange sufficient to cover his probable business and personal requirements. The amount that will be required depends upon individual circumstances. It is influenced both by the custom and habits of the individual and by the organization of the whole social apparatus of production and exchange. But all of these objective factors always affect the matter only as motivations of the individual. They are never capable of a direct influence upon the actual amount of his demand for money. Here, as in all departments of economic life, it is the subjective valuations of the separate economic agents that alone are decisive. The store of purchasing power held by two such agents whose objective economic circumstances were identical might be quite different if the advantages and disadvantages of such a store were estimated differently by the different agents. The cash balance held by an individual need by no means consist entirely of money. If secure claims to money, payable on demand, are employed commercially as substitutes for money, being tendered and accepted in place of money, then individual stores of money can be entirely or partly replaced by a corresponding store of these substitutes. In fact, for technical reasons, such, for example, as the need for having money of various denominations on hand, this may sometimes prove an unavoidable necessity. It follows that we can speak of a demand for money in a broader and in a narrower sense. The former comprises the entire demand of an individual for money and money substitutes, the second merely his demand for money proper. The former is determined by the will of the economic agent in question. The latter is fairly independent of individual influences, if we disregard the question of denomination referred to above. Apart from this, the question whether a greater or smaller part of the cash balance held by an individual shall consist of money substitutes is only of importance to him when he has the opportunity of acquiring money substitutes which bear interest, such as interest-bearing bank notes, a rare case, or bank deposits. In all other cases, it is a matter of complete indifference to him. The individual's demand and stock of money is the basis of the demand and stock in the whole community. So long as there are no money substitutes in use, the social demand for money and the social stock of money are merely the respective sums of the individual demands and stocks. But this has changed with the advent of money substitutes. The social demand for money in the narrower sense is no longer the sum of the individual demands for money in the narrower sense, and the social demand for money in the broader sense is by no means the sum of the individual demands for money in the broader sense. Part of the money substitutes functioning as money in the cash holdings of individuals are covered by sums of money held as redemption funds at the place where the money substitutes are cashable which is usually, although not necessarily, the issuing concern. We shall use the term money certificates for those money substitutes that are completely covered by the reservation of corresponding sums of money 
and the term fiduciary media for those which are not covered in this way. The suitability of this terminology, which has been chosen with regard to the problem to be dealt with in the third part of the present work, must be demonstrated in that place. It is not to be understood in the light of banking technique, nor in a juristic sense. It is merely intended to serve the ends of economic argument. Only in the rarest cases can any particular money substitutes be immediately assigned to the one or the other group. That is possible only for those money substitutes of which the whole species is either entirely covered by money or not covered by money at all. In the case of all other money substitutes, those the total quantity of which is partly covered by money and partly not covered by money, only an imaginary ascription of the aliquot part to each of the two groups can take place. This involves no fresh difficulty. If, for example, there are banknotes in circulation, one-third of the quantity of which is covered by money and two-thirds not covered, then each individual note is to be reckoned as two-thirds fiduciary medium and one-third money certificate. It is thus obvious that a community's demand for money in the broader sense cannot be the sum of the demands of individuals for money and money substitutes, because to reckon in the demand for money certificates as well as that of the money that serves as a cover for them at the banks and elsewhere is to count the same amount twice over. A community's demand for money in the broader sense is the sum of the demands of the individual economic agents for money proper and fiduciary media, including the demand for cover. And a community's demand for money in the narrower sense is the sum of the demands of the individual economic agents for money and money certificates, this time not including cover. In this part, we shall ignore the existence of fiduciary media and assume that the demands for money of individual economic agents can be satisfied merely by money and money certificates, and consequently that the demand for money of the whole economic community can be satisfied merely by money proper. The third part of this book is devoted to an examination of the important and difficult problems arising from the creation and circulation of fiduciary media. The demand for money and its relations to the stock of money forms the starting point for an explanation of fluctuations in the objective exchange value of money. Not to understand the nature of the demand for money is to fail at the very outset of any attempt to grapple with the problem of variations in the value of money. If we start with the formula that attempts to explain the demand for money from the point of view of the community, instead of from that of the individual, we shall fail to discover the connection between the stock of money and the subjective valuations of individuals, the foundation of all economic activity. But on the other hand, this problem is solved without difficulty if we approach the phenomena from the individual agent's point of view. No long explanation is necessary of the way in which an individual will behave in the market when his demand for money exceeds his stock of it. He who has more money on hand than he thinks he needs will buy, in order to dispose of the superfluous stock of money that lies useless on his hands. If he is an entrepreneur, he will possibly enlarge his business. If this use of the money is not open to him, he may purchase interest-bearing securities, or possibly he may decide to purchase consumption goods. But in any case, he expresses by a suitable behavior in the market the fact that he regards his reserve of purchasing power as too large, and he whose demand for money is less than his stock of it will behave in an exactly contrary fashion. If an individual's stock of money diminishes, his property or income remaining the same, then he will take steps to reach the desired level of reserve purchasing power by suitable behavior in making sales and purchases. A shortage of money means a difficulty in disposing of commodities for money. He who is obliged to dispose of a commodity by way of exchange will prefer to acquire some of the common medium of exchange for it 
and only when this acquisition involves too great a sacrifice will he be content with some other economic good, which will indeed be more marketable than that which he wishes to dispose of, but less marketable than the common medium of exchange. Under the present organization of the market, which leaves a deep gulf between the marketability of money on the one hand and of other economic goods on the other hand, nothing but money enters into consideration at all as a medium of exchange. Only in exceptional circumstances is any other economic good pressed into this service. In the case mentioned, therefore, every seller will be willing to accept a smaller quantity of money than he otherwise would have demanded, so as to avoid the fresh loss that he would have to suffer in again exchanging the commodity that he has acquired, which is harder to dispose of than money, for the commodity that he actually requires for consumption. The older theories, which started from an erroneous conception of the social demand for money, could never arrive at a solution of this problem. Their sole contribution is limited to paraphrases of the proposition that an increase in the stock of money at the disposal of the community, while the demand for it remains the same, decreases the objective exchange value of money, and that an increase of the demand with a constant available stock has the contrary effect, and so on. By a flash of genius, the formulators of the quality theory had already recognized this. We cannot by any means call it an advance, when the formula giving the amount of the demand for money, volume of transactions divided by velocity of circulation, was reduced to its element, or when the attempt was made to give exact precision to the idea of a stock of money, so long as this occurred under a misapprehension of the nature of fiduciary media and of clearing transactions. No approach whatever was made towards the central problem of this part of the theory of money, so long as theorists were unable to show the way in which subjective valuations are affected by variations in the ratio between the stock of money and the demand for money. But this task was necessarily beyond the power of these theories, they break down at the crucial point. Recently, Wieser has expressed himself against employing the collective concept of the demand for money as the starting point for a theory of fluctuations in the objective exchange value of money. He says that in an investigation of the value of money, we are not concerned with the total demand for money. The demand for money to pay taxes with, for example, does not come into consideration, for these payments do not affect the value of money, but only transfer purchasing power from those who pay the taxes to those who receive them. In the same way, capital and interest payments in loan transactions and the making of gifts and bequests merely involve a transference of purchasing power between persons and not an augmentation or diminution of it. A functional theory of the value of money must, in stating its problem, have regard only to those factors by which the value of money is determined. The value of money is determined in the process of exchange. Consequently, the theory of the value of money must take account only of those quantities which enter into the process of exchange. But these objections of Wieser's are not only rebutted by the fact that even the surrender of money in paying taxes, in making capital and interest payments, and in giving presents and bequests, falls into the economic category of exchange. Even if we accept Wieser's narrow definition of exchange, we must still oppose his argument. It is not a peculiarity of money that its value, Wieser obviously means its subjective exchange value, is determined in the process of exchange. The same is true of all other economic goods. For all economic goods, it must therefore be correct to say that the theory of value has to investigate only certain quantities, viz. only those that are involved in the process of exchange. But there is no such thing in economics as a quantity that is not involved in the process of exchange. 
From the economic point of view, a quantity has no other relationships than those which exercise some influence upon the valuations of individuals concerned in some process or other of exchange. This is true even if we admit that value only arises in connection with exchange in the narrow sense intended by Visser. But those who participate in exchange transactions and consequently desire to acquire or dispose of money do not value the monetary unit solely with regard to the fact that they can use it in other acts of exchange, in Visser's narrower sense of the expression but also because they require money in order to pay taxes, to transfer borrowed capital and pay interest, and to make presents. They consider the level of their purchasing power reserves with a view to the necessity of having money ready for all these purposes. And their judgment as to the extent of their requirements for money is what decides the demand for money with which they enter the market. Section 8 the consequences of an increase in the quantity of money while the demand for money remains unchanged or does not increase to the same extent. Those variations in the ratio between the individual's demand for money and his stock of it that arise from purely individual causes cannot as a rule have a very large quantitative influence in the market. In most cases, they will be entirely, or at least partly, compensated by contrary variations emanating from other individuals in the market. But a variation in the objective exchange value of money can arise only when a force is exerted in one direction that is not cancelled by a counteracting force in the opposite direction. If the causes that alter the ratio between the stock of money and the demand for it from the point of view of an individual consist merely in accidental and personal factors that concern that particular individual only, then, according to the law of large numbers, it is likely that the forces arising from this cause and acting in both directions in the market will counterbalance each other. The probability that the compensation will be complete is the greater the more individual economic agents there are. It is otherwise when disturbances occur in the community as a whole of a kind to alter the ratio existing between the individual's stock of money and his demand for it. Such disturbances, of course, cannot have an effect except by altering the subjective valuations of the individual, but they are social economic phenomena in the sense that they influence the subjective valuations of a large number of individuals, if not simultaneously, and in the same degree, at least in the same direction, so that there must necessarily be some resultant effect on the objective exchange value of money. In the history of money, a particularly important part has been played by those variations in its objective exchange value that have arisen in consequence of an increase in the stock of money while the demand for it has remained unchanged or has at least not increased to the same extent. These variations, in fact, were what first attracted the attention of economists. It was in order to explain them that the quantitative theory of money was first propounded. It is perhaps justifiable, therefore, to devote special attention to them and to use them to illuminate certain important theoretical points. In whatever way we care to picture to ourselves the increase in the stock of money, whether as arising from increased production or incorporation of the substance of which commodity money is made, or through a new issue of fiat or credit money, the new money always increases the stock of money at the disposal of certain individual economic agents. An increase in the stock of money in a community always means an increase in the money incomes of a number of individuals, but it need not necessarily mean at the same time an increase in the quantity of goods that are at the disposal of the community. That is to say, it need not mean an increase in the national dividend. An increase in the amount of fiat or credit money is only to be regarded as an increase in the stock of goods at the disposal of society if it permits the satisfaction of a demand for money which would otherwise have been satisfied by commodity money instead. 
Since the material for commodity money would then have had to be procured by the surrender of other goods in exchange or produced at the cost of renouncing some other sort of production. If, on the other hand, the non-existence of the new issue of fiat or credit money would not have involved an increase in the quantity of commodity money, then the increase of money cannot be regarded as an increase of the income or wealth of society. An increase in a community's stock of money always means an increase in the amount of money held by a number of economic agents. Whether these are the issuers of fiat or credit money, or the producers of the substance of which commodity money is made, for these persons, the ratio between the demand for money and the stock of it is altered. They have a relative superfluity of money and a relative shortage of other economic goods. The immediate consequence of both circumstances is that the marginal utility to them of the monetary unit diminishes. This necessarily influences their behavior in the market. They are in a stronger position as buyers. They will now express in the market their demand for the objects they desire most intensively than before. They are able to offer more money for the commodities that they wish to acquire. It will be the obvious result of this that the prices of the goods concerned will rise and that the objective exchange value of money will fall in comparison. But this rise of prices will by no means be restricted to the market for those goods that are desired by those who originally have the new money at their disposal. In addition, those who have brought these goods to market will have their incomes and their proportionate stocks of money increased and in their turn will be in a position to demand more intensively the goods they want so that these goods will also rise in price. Thus, the increase of prices continues, having a diminishing effect until all commodities, some to a greater and some to a lesser extent, are reached by it. The increase in the quantity of money does not mean an increase of income for all individuals. On the contrary, those sections of the community that are the last to be reached by the additional quantity of money have their incomes reduced as a consequence of the decrease in the value of money called forth by the increase in its quantity. This will be referred to later. The reduction in the income of these classes now starts a counter-tendency, which opposes the tendency to a diminution of the value of money due to the increase of income of the other classes without being able to rob it completely of its effect. Those who hold the mechanical version of the quantity theory will be more inclined to believe that the increase in the quantity of money must eventually lead to a uniform increase in the prices of all economic goods, the less clear their concept is of the way in which the determination of prices is affected by it. Thorough comprehension of the mechanism by means of which the quantity of money affects the prices of commodities makes their point of view altogether untenable. Since the increased quantity of money is received in the first place by a limited number of economic agents only and not by all, the increase of prices at first embraces only those goods that are demanded by these persons. Further, it affects these goods more than it afterwards affects any others. When the increase of prices spreads farther, if the increase in the quantity of money is only a single transient phenomenon, it will not be possible for the differential increase of prices of these goods to be completely maintained. A certain degree of adjustment will take place, but there will not be such a complete adjustment of the increases that all prices increase in the same proportion. The prices of commodities after the rise of prices will not bear the same relation to each other as before its commencement. The decrease in the purchasing power of money will not be uniform with regard to different economic goods. Hume, it may be remarked, bases his argument concerning this matter on the supposition that every Englishman is miraculously endowed with five pieces of gold during the night. Mill rightly remarks on this that it would not lead to a uniform increase in the demand for separate commodities. The luxury articles of the poorer classes would rise more in price than the others. All the same, he believes that a uniform increase in the prices of all commodities, 
and this exactly in proportion to the increase in the quantity of money, would occur if the wants and inclinations of the community collectively, in respect to consumption, remain the same. He assumes, no less artificially than Hume, that to every pound or shilling or penny in the possession of any one, another pound, shilling, or penny were suddenly added. But Mill fails to see that even in this case a uniform rise of prices would not occur, even supporting that for each member of the community the proportion between stock of money and total wealth was the same, so that the addition of the supplementary quantity of money did not result in an alteration of the relative wealth of individuals. For even in this quite impossible case, every increase in the quantity of money would necessarily cause an alteration in the conditions of demand, which would lead to a disparate increase in the prices of the individual economic goods. Not all commodities would be demanded more intensively, and not all of those that were demanded more intensively would be affected in the same degree. There is no justification whatever for the widespread belief that variations in the quantity of money must lead to inversely proportionate variations in the objective exchange value of money, so that, for example, a doubling of the quantity of money must lead to a halving of the purchasing power of money. Even assuming that in some way or other, it is confessedly difficult to imagine in what way, every individual's stock of money were to be increased so that his relative position as regards other holders of property was unaltered, it is not difficult to prove that the subsequent variation in the objective exchange value of money would not be proportioned to the variation in the quantity of money. For, in fact, the way in which an individual values a variation in the quantity of money at his disposal is by no means directly dependent on the amount of this variation. But we should have to assume that it was if we wish to conclude that there would be a proportionate variation in the objective exchange value of money. If the possessor of A units of money receives B additional units, then it is not at all true to say that he will value the total stock A plus B exactly as highly as he had previously valued the stock A alone. Because he now has disposal over a larger stock, he will now value each unit less than he did before. But how much less will depend on a whole series of individual circumstances upon subjective valuations that will be different for each individual. Two individuals who are equally wealthy and who each possess a stock of money, A, will not by any means arrive at the same variation in their estimation of money after an increase of B units in each of their stocks of money. It is nothing short of absurdity to assume that, say, doubling the amount of money at the disposal of an individual must lead to a halving of the exchange value that he ascribes to each monetary unit. Let us, for example, imagine an individual who is in the habit of holding a stock of a hundred kronen and assume that a sum of a further hundred kronen is paid by somebody or other to this individual. Mere consideration of this example is sufficient to show the complete unreality of all the theories that ascribe to variations in the quantity of money a uniformly proportionate effect on the purchasing power of money for it involves no essential modification of this example to assume that similar increases in the quantity of money are experienced by all the members of the community at once. The mistake in the argument of those who suppose that a variation in the quantity of money results in an inversely proportionate variation in its purchasing power lies in its starting point. If we wish to arrive at a correct conclusion, we must start with the valuations of separate individuals. We must examine the way in which an increase or decrease in the quantity of money affects the value scales of individuals, for it is from these alone that the variations in the exchange ratios of goods proceed. The initial assumption in the arguments of those who maintain the theory that changes the quantity of money have a proportionate effect on the purchasing power of money is the proposition that if the value of the monetary unit were doubled, 
half of the stock of money at the disposal of the community would yield the same utility as that previously yielded by the whole stock. The correctness of this proposition is not disputed. Nevertheless, it does not prove what it is meant to prove. In the first place, it must be pointed out that the level of the total stock of money and of the value of the money unit are matters of complete indifference as far as the utility obtained from the use of the money is concerned. Society is always in enjoyment of the maximum utility obtainable from the use of money. Half of the money at the disposal of the community would yield the same utility as the whole stock even if the variation in the value of the monetary unit was not proportioned to the variation in the stock of money. But it is important to note that it by no means follows from this that doubling the quantity of money means having the objective exchange value of money. It would have to be shown that forces emanate from the valuations of individual economic agents which are able to bring about such a proportionate variation. This can never be proved. In fact, its contrary is likely. We have already given a proof for this in the case in which an increase in the quantity of money held by an individual economic agent involves at the same time an increase of their income or wealth. But even when the increase in the quantity of money does not affect the wealth or income of the individual economic agents, the effect is still the same. Let us assume that a man gets half his income in the form of interest-bearing securities, and half in the form of money, and that he is in the habit of saving three-quarters of his income, and does this by retaining the securities and using that half of his income, which he receives in cash, in equal parts for paying for current consumption and for the purchase of further securities. Now let us assume that a variation in the composition of his income occurs so that he receives three-quarters of it in cash and only one-quarter in securities. From now on, this man will use two-thirds of his cash receipts for the purchase of interest-bearing securities. If the price of the securities rises, or, which is the same thing, if their rate of interest falls, then in either case he will be less willing to buy and will reduce the sum of money that he would otherwise have employed for their purchase. He is likely to find that the advantage of a slightly increased reserve exceeds that which could be obtained from the acquisition of the securities. In the second case, he will doubtless be inclined to pay a higher price, or more correctly, to purchase a greater quantity at the higher price than in the first case, but he will certainly not be prepared to pay double as much for a unit of securities in the second case as in the first case. As far as the earlier exponents of the quantity theory are concerned, the assumption that variations in the quantity of money would have an inversely proportionate effect on its purchasing power may nevertheless be excusable. It is easy to go astray on this point if the attempt is made to explain the value phenomena of the market by reference to exchange value. But it is inexplicable that those theorists also who suppose they are taking their stand on the subjective theory of value could fall into similar errors. The blame here can only be laid to the account of a mechanical conception of market processes. Thus even Fisher and Brown whose concept of the quantity theory is a mechanical one, and whose attempt to express in mathematical equations the law according to which the value of money is determined, necessarily arrive at the conclusion that variations in the ratio between the quantity of money and the demand for it lead to proportionate variations in the objective exchange value of money. How and through what channels this comes about is not disclosed by the formula, for it contains no reference at all to the only factors that are decisive in causing variations of the exchange ratios, that is, variations in the subjective valuations of individuals. Fisher and Brown give three examples to prove the correctness of their conclusions. In the first, they start with the supposition that the government changes the denomination of the money so that, for example, what was previously called a half dollar is now called a whole dollar. It is obvious, they say, that this will cause an increase in the number of dollars in circulation 
and that prices reckoned in the new dollars will have to be twice as high as they were previously. Fisher and Brown may be right so far, but not in the conclusions that they proceed to draw. What their example actually deals with is not an increase in the quantity of money, but merely an alteration in its name. What does the money referred to in this example really consist of? Is it the stuff of which dollars are made, the claim that lies behind a credit dollar, the token that is used as money, or is it the word dollar? The second example given by Fisher and Brown is no less incorrectly interpreted. They start from the assumption that the government divides each dollar into two and mints a new dollar from each half. Here again, all that occurs is a change of name. In their third example, they do at least deal with a real increase in the quantity of money, but this example is just as artificial and misleading as those of Hume and Mill, which we have already dealt with in some detail. They suppose that the government gives everybody an extra dollar for each dollar that he already possesses. We have already shown that even in this case, a proportionate change in the objective exchange value of money cannot follow. One thing only can explain how Fisher is able to maintain his mechanical quantity theory. To him, the quantity theory seems a doctrine peculiar to the value of money. In fact, he contrasts it outright with the laws of value of other economic goods. He says that if the world's stock of sugar increases from a million pounds to a million hundredweight, it would not follow that a hundredweight would have the value that is now processed by a pound. Money only is peculiar in this respect, according to Fisher. But he does not give the proof of this assertion. With as much justification as that of Fisher and Brown for their mechanical formula for the value of money, a similar formula could be set out for the value of any commodity, and similar conclusions drawn from it. That nobody attempts to do this is to be explained simply and solely by the circumstance that such a formula would so clearly contradict our experience of the demand curves for most commodities that it could not be maintained even for a moment. If we compare two static economic systems, which differ in no way from one another except that in one there is twice as much money as in the other, it appears that the purchasing power of the monetary unit in the one system must be equal to half that of the monetary unit in the other. Nevertheless, we may not conclude from this that a doubling of the quantity of money must lead to a halving of the purchasing power of the monetary unit. For every variation in the quantity of money introduces a dynamic factor into the static economic system. The new position of static equilibrium that is established when the effects of the fluctuations thus set in motion are completed cannot be the same as that which existed before the introduction of the additional quantity of money. Consequently, in the new state of equilibrium, the conditions of demand for money given a certain exchange value of the monetary unit, will also be different. If the purchasing power of each unit of the doubled quantity of money were halved, the unit would not have the same significance for each individual under the new conditions as it had in the static system before the increase in the quantity of money. All those who ascribe to variations in the quantity of money an inverse proportionate effect on the value of the monetary unit are applying to dynamic conditions a method of analysis that is only suitable for static conditions. It is also entirely incorrect to think of the quantity theory as if the characteristics in question affecting the determination of value were peculiar to money. Most of both the earlier and the later adherents of the theory have fallen into this error, and the fierce and often unfair attacks that have been directed against it appear in a better light when we know of this and other errors of a like kind of which its champions have been guilty. Section 9. Criticism of Some Arguments Against the Quantity Theory We have already examined one of the objections that have been brought against the quantity theory, the objection that it only holds good ceteris paribus. 
no more tenable as an objection against the determinateness of our conclusions is referenced to the possibility that an additional quantity of money may be hoarded. This argument has played a prominent role in the history of monetary theory. It was one of the sharpest weapons in the armory of the opponents of the quantity theory. Among the arguments of the opponents of the currency theory, it immediately follows the proposition relating to the elasticity of cash economizing methods of payment, to which it also bears a close relation as far as its content is concerned. We shall deal with it here separately. Nevertheless, all that we can say about it in the present place needs to be set in its proper light by the arguments contained in the third part of this book, which is devoted to the doctrine of fiduciary media. For Fullerton, hordes are the regular doses machina. They absorb the superfluous quantity of money and prevent it from flowing into circulation until it is needed. Thus, they constitute a sort of reservoir, which accommodates the ebb and flow of money in the market to the variations in the demand for money. The sums of money collected in hordes lie there idle, waiting for the moment when commerce needs them for maintaining the stability of the objective exchange value of money, and all those sums of money that might threaten this stability when the demand for money decreases flow back out of circulation into these hordes to slumber quietly until they are called forth again. This tacitly assumes the fundamental correctness of the arguments of the quantity theory, but asserts that there is, nevertheless, a principle inherent in the economic system that always prevents the working out of the processes that the quantitative theory describes. But Fullerton and his followers unfortunately neglected to indicate the way in which variations in the demand for money set in motion the mechanism of the hordes. Obviously, they supposed this to proceed without the will of the transacting parties entering into the matter at all. Such a view surpasses the naivest versions of the quantity theory in its purely mechanical conception of market transactions. Even the most superficial investigation into the problem of the demand for money could not have failed to demonstrate the untenability of the doctrine of hordes. In the first place, it must be recognized that, from the economic point of view, there is no such thing as money lying idle. All money, whether in reserves or literally in circulation, i.e., the process of changing hands at the very moment under consideration, is devoted in exactly the same way to the performance of a monetary function. In fact, since money that is surrendered in an exchange is immediately transferred from the ownership of the one party to that of the other, and no period of time can be discovered in which it is actually in movement, all money must be regarded as at rest in the cash reserve of some individual or other. The stock of money of the community is the sum of the stocks of individuals. There is no such thing as errant money. No money which, even for a moment, does not form part of somebody's stock. All money, that is to say, lies in some individual's stock, ready for eventual use. It is a matter of indifference how soon the moment occurs when the demand for money next arises, and the sum of money in question is paid out. In every household or family, the members of which are at least moderately prosperous, there is a minimum reserve whose level is constantly maintained by replenishment. The fact has already been mentioned that besides objective conditions, subjective factors influencing the individual economic agent help to determine the amount of the individual demand for money. What is called storing money is a way of using wealth. The uncertainty of the future makes it seem advisable to hold a larger or smaller part of one's possessions in a form that will facilitate a change from one way of using wealth to another, or transition from the ownership of one good to that of another, in order to preserve the opportunity of being able without difficulty to satisfy urgent demands that may possibly arise in the future for goods that will have to be obtained by way of exchange. So long as the market has not reached the stage of development in which all, or at least certain, economic goods can be sold, i.e. turned into money, at any time under conditions that are not too unfavorable, 
This aim can be achieved by holding a stock of money of a suitable size. The more active the life of the market becomes, the more can this stock be diminished. At the present day, the possession of certain sorts of securities which have a large market so they can be realized without delay and without very considerable cost, at least in normal times, may make the holding of large cash reserves to a certain extent unnecessary. The demand for money for storage purposes is not separable from the demand for money for other purposes. Hoarding money is nothing but the custom of holding a greater stock of it than is usual with other economic agents at other times or in other places. The hoarded sums of money do not lie idle, whether they are regarded from the social or from the individual point of view. They serve to satisfy a demand for money just as much as any other money does. Now, the adherents of the banking principle seem to hold the opinion that the demand for storing purposes is elastic and conforms to variations in the demand for money or other purposes in such a way that the total demand for money, i.e. that for storing purposes and that for other purposes taken together, adjusts itself to the existing stock of money without any variation in the objective exchange value of the monetary unit. This view is entirely mistaken. In fact, the conditions of demand for money, including the demand for storage purposes, is independent of the circumstances of the supply of money. The contrary supposition can be supported only by supposing a connection between the quantity of money and the rate of interest, that is, by asserting that the variations arising from changes in the ratio between the demand for money and the supply of it influence to a different degree the prices of goods of the first order and those of goods of higher orders, so that the proportion between the prices of these two classes of goods is altered. The question of the tenability of this proposition, which is based on the view that the rate of interest is dependent on the greater or lesser quantity of money, will have to be brought up again in Part 3. There, the opportunity will also arise for showing that the cash reserves of the banks that issue fiduciary media no more act as a buffer in this way than these mythical hordes do. There is no such thing as a reserve store of money out of which commerce can at any time supply its extra requirements or into which it can direct its surpluses. The doctrine of the importance of hoards for stabilizing the objective exchange value of money has gradually lost its adherence with the passing of time. Nowadays, its supporters are few. Even Deal's membership of this group is only apparent. He agrees it is true with the criticism directed by Fullerton against the currency theory. On the other hand, he concedes that Fullerton's expressions, inert and dormant, are erroneously applied to reserves of money, since these reserves are not idle but merely serve a different purpose from that served by circulating money. He also agrees that sums of money in such reserves and sums used for purposes of payment are not sharply distinguishable, and that the same sums serve now one purpose and now the other. In spite of this, however, he supports Fullerton as against Ricardo. He says that even if the sums taken out of the reserves must again be replaced out of the stocks of money present in the community, this need not occur immediately. A long period may elapse before it is necessary, and that in any case it follows that the mechanical connection which Ricardo assumes to exist between the quantity of money in circulation and the prices of commodities cannot be accepted, even with regard to hoards. Deal does not show in greater detail why a long period may elapse before the sums supposed to be taken from the reserves are replaced, but he does admit the fundamental correctness of the criticism leveled at Fullerton's arguments. It is possible to grant the sole reservation that he makes if we interpret it as meaning that time may and must elapse before changes in the quantity of money express themselves all over the market in a variation of the objective exchange value of money. For that the increase in the individual stock of money which results from the inflow of the additional quantity of money must bring about a change in the subjective valuations of the individuals, 
and that this occurs immediately, and begins immediately to have an effect in the market, can hardly be denied. On the other hand, an increase in an individual's demand for money while his stock remains the same, or a decrease in his stock while his demand remains the same, must lead, at once, to changes in subjective valuations which must be expressed in the market, even if not all at once. In an increase of the objective exchange value of money, it may be admitted that every variation in the quantity of money will impel the individual to check his judgment as to the extent of his requirements for money, and that this may result in a reduction of his demand in the case of a diminishing stock of money, and an augmentation of it in the case of an increasing stock. But the assumption that such a limitation or extension must occur has no logical foundation not to speak of the assumption that it must occur in such a degree as to keep the objective exchange value of money stable. A weightier objection is the denial of the practical importance of the quantity theory that is implied in the attribution to the present organization of the money, payment, and credit system of a tendency to cancel out variations in the quality of money and prevent them from becoming effective. It is said that the fluctuation velocity of the circulation of money and the elasticity of methods of payment made possible by the credit system and the progressive improvement of banking organization and technique, i.e., the facility with which methods of payment can be adjusted to expanded or contracted business, have made the movement of prices as far as is possible independent of variations in the quantity of money, especially since there exists no quantitative relation between money and its substitutes, i.e. between the stock of money and the volume of transactions and payments. It is said that if in such circumstances we still wish to preserve the quantity theory, we must not base it merely upon current money, but extend it to embrace all money whatever, including not only all the tangible money substitutes that are capable of circulation, but also every transaction of the banking system or agreement between two parties to a contract that replaces a payment of money. It is admitted that this would make the theory quite useless in practice, but it would secure its theoretical universality. And it is not denied that this raises an almost insoluble problem, that of the conditions under which credit comes into being and of the manner in which it affects the determination of value and prices. The answer to this is contained in the third part of the present work, where the problem of the alleged elasticity of credit is discussed. Section 10. Further Applications of the Quantity Theory In general, the quantity theory has not been used for investigating the consequences that would follow a decrease in the demand for money while the stock of money remained the same. There has been no historical motive for such an investigation. The problem has never been a live one, for there has never been even a shadow of justification for attempting to solve controversial questions of economic policy by answering it. Economic history shows us a continual increase in the demand for money. The characteristic feature of the development of the demand for money is its intensification. The growth of division of labor and consequently of exchange transactions, which have constantly become more and more indirect and dependent on the use of money, have helped to bring this about, as well as the increase of population and prosperity. The tendencies which result in an increase in the demand for money became so strong in the years preceding the war that even if the increase in the stock of money had been very much greater than it actually was, the objective exchange value of money would have been sure to increase. Only the circumstance that this increase in the demand for money was accompanied by an extraordinarily large expansion of credit, which certainly exceeded the increase in the demand for money in the broader sense, can serve to explain the fact that the objective exchange value of money during this period not only failed to increase, but actually decreased. Another factor that was concerned in this is referred to later in this chapter. 
If we were to apply the mechanical version of the quantity theory to the case of a decrease in the demand for money while the stock of money remained unaltered, we should have to conclude that there would be a uniform increase in all commodity prices, arithmetically, proportional to the change in the ratio between the stock of money and the demand for it. We should expect the same results as would follow upon an increase in the stock of money while the demand for it remained the same. But the mechanical version of the theory, based as it is upon the erroneous transference of static law to the dynamic sphere, is just as inadequate in this case as in the other. It cannot satisfy us because it does not explain what we want to have explained. We must build up a theory that will show us how a decrease in the demand for money, while the stock of it remains the same, affects prices by affecting the subjective valuations of money on the part of individual economic agents. A diminution of the demand for money, while the stock remained the same, would in the first place lead to the discovery by a number of persons that their cash reserves were too great in relation to their needs. They would, therefore, enter the market as buyers with their surpluses. From this point, a general rise in prices would come into operation, a diminution of the exchange value of money. More detailed explanation of what would happen then is unnecessary. Very closely related to this case is another whose practical significance is incomparably greater. Even if we think of the demand for money as constantly increasing, it may happen that the demand for particular kinds of money diminishes, or even ceases altogether, so far as it depends upon their characteristics as general media of exchange, and this is all we have to deal with here. If any given kind of money is deprived of its monetary characteristics, then, naturally, it also loses the special value that depends on its use as a common medium of exchange, and only retains that value which depends upon its other employment. In the course of history this has always occurred when a good has been excluded from the constantly narrowing circle of common media of exchange. Generally speaking, we do not know much about this process, which to a large extent took place in times about which our information is scanty. But recent times have provided an outstanding example, the almost complete demonetization of silver. Silver, which previously was widely used as money, has been almost entirely expelled from this position. And there can be no doubt that at a time not very far off, perhaps in a few years only, it will have played out its part as money altogether. The result of the demonetization of silver has been the diminution of its objective exchange value. The price of silver in London fell from 60 pounds, 9 shillings, and 10 pence on an average in 1870 to 23 pounds, 12 shillings, and 16 pence on an average in 1909. The value was bound to fall because the sphere of its employment had contracted. Similar examples can be provided from the history of credit money also. For instance, the notes of the southern states in the American Civil War may be mentioned, which, as the successes of the northern states increased, lost pari passu in their monetary value as well as their value as claims. More deeply than with the problem of the consequences of a diminishing demand for money while the stock of it remains the same, which possesses only a small practical importance, the adherents of the quantity theory have occupied themselves with the problem of a diminishing stock of money while the demand for it remains the same, and with that of an increasing demand for money while the stock of it remains the same. It was believed that complete answers to both questions could easily be obtained in accordance with the mechanical version of the quantity theory, if the general formula which appeared to embrace the essence of the problems was applied to them. Both cases were treated as inversions of the case of an increase in the quantity of money while the demand for it remained the same, and from this the corresponding conclusions were drawn. Just as the attempt was made to explain the depreciation of credit money simply by reference to the enormous increase in the quantity of money, so the attempt was made to explain the depression of the 70s and 80s by reference to an increase of the demand for money while the quantity of money did not increase sufficiently. 
This proposition lay at the root of most of the measures of currency policy of the 19th century. The aim was to regulate the value of money by increasing or diminishing the quantity of it. The effects of these measures appeared to provide an inductive proof of the correctness of the superficial version of the quantity theory and incidentally concealed the weakness of its logic. This supposition alone can explain why no attempt was ever made to exhibit the mechanism of the increase of the value of money as a result of the decrease in the volume of circulation. Here again, the old theory needs to be supplemented, as has been done in our argument above. Normally, the increase in the demand for money is slow, so that any effect on the exchange ratio between money and commodities is discernible only with difficulty. Nevertheless, cases do occur in which the demand for money in the narrower sense increases suddenly and to an unusually large degree so that the prices of commodities drop suddenly. Such cases occur when the public loses faith in the issuer of fiduciary media at a time of crisis and the fiduciary media cease to be capable of circulation. Many examples of this sort are known to history, one of them is provided by the experiences of the United States in the late autumn of 1907. And it is possible that similar cases may occur in the future. 3. A special cause of variations in the objective exchange value of money arising from the peculiarities of indirect exchange. Section 11. Dearness of Living those determinants of the objective exchange value of money that have already been considered exhibit no sort of special peculiarity. So far as they are concerned, the exchange value of money is determined no differently from the exchange value of other economic goods. But there are other determinants of variations in the objective exchange value of money which obey a special law. No complaint is more widespread than that against dearness of living. There has been no generation that has not grumbled about the expensive times that it lives in, but the fact that everything is becoming dearer simply means that the objective exchange value of money is falling. It is extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, to subject such assertions as this to historical and statistical tests. The limits of our knowledge in this direction will have to be referred to in the chapter dealing with the problem of the measurability of variations in the value of money. Here we must be content to anticipate the conclusions of this chapter and state that we can expect no support from investigations into the history of prices or from the methods employed in such investigations. The statements of the average man, even though it may very easily happen that these are founded on self-deception, and even though they are so much at the mercy of variations in the subjective valuations of the individual, would almost form a better substantiation of the fact of a progressive fall in the objective exchange value of money than can be provided by all the contents of voluminous statistical publications. Certainly, it can be afforded only by demonstration that chains of causes exist, which are capable of evoking this sort of movement in the objective exchange value of money, and would evoke it unless they were cancelled by some counteracting force. This path, which alone can lead to the desired goal, has already been trodden by many investigators. With what success? We shall see. Section 12 Wagner's Theory The Influence of the Permanent Predominance of Supply Side over Demand Side on the Determination of Prices With many others, and in agreement with general popular opinion, Wagner assumes the predominance of a tendency toward the diminution of objective exchange value of money. He holds that this phenomenon can be explained by the fact that the supply side is almost invariably the stronger and the most capable of pursuing its own acquisitive interest. Even apart from actual cartels, rings, and combinations, and in spite of all the competition of individual sellers among themselves, he claims that the supply side has more solidarity than the opposing demand side. He argues further that the tradesmen engaged in retail trade are more interested in an increase of prices 
than their customers are in the continuance of the old prices or in price reductions for the amount of the tradesman's earnings and, consequently, their whole economic and social position depends largely on the prices they obtain, while as a rule only special and therefore relatively unimportant interests of the customers are involved. Hence, the growth on the supply side of a tendency towards the maintenance and raising of prices, which acts as a kind of a permanent pressure in the direction of higher prices, more energetically and more universally than the opposing tendency on the demand side. Prices certainly are kept down and reduced in retail trade with the object of maintaining and expanding sales and increasing total profits, and competition may and often does make this necessary. But neither influence, according to Wagner, is in the long run so generally and markedly effective as the interest in and striving for higher prices, which is in fact able to compete with and overcome their resistance. In this permanent predominance of the supply side over the demand side, Wagner sees one of the causes of the general increases in prices. Wagner, that is to say, attributes the progressive fall in the objective exchange value of money to a series of factors which have no effect on the determination of wholesale prices, but only in the determination of retail prices. Now, it is a well-known phenomenon that the retail prices of consumption goods are affected by numerous influences, which prevent them from responding rapidly and completely to movements of wholesale prices. And among the peculiar determinants of retail prices, those predominate which tend to keep them above the level corresponding to wholesale prices. It is, for instance, well known that retail prices adapt themselves more slowly to decreases in wholesale prices than to increases. But it must not be overlooked that the adjustment must eventually take place, all the same, and the retail prices of consumption goods always participate in the movements of prices of production goods, even if they lag behind them, and that it is only small, transient movements in wholesale trade that have no effect on retail trade. Even if we are willing to admit the existence of a permanent predominance of the supply side over the demand side, it would still be decidedly questionable whether we could deduce a tendency towards a general increase of dearness from it. If no further cause could be shown to account for an increase of wholesale prices, and Wagner does not attempt this at all, then we can argue a progressive increase of retail prices only if we are prepared to assume that the time lag between the movements of retail and of wholesale prices is continually increasing. But Wagner makes no such assumption, and it would be very difficult to support it if he did. It may be said, in fact, that modern commercial development has brought about a tendency toward a more rapid adjustment of retail prices to wholesale and manufacturer's prices. Multiple and chain stores and cooperative societies follow the movements of wholesale prices much more closely than peddlers and small shopkeepers. It is entirely incomprehensible why Wagner should connect this tendency to a general rise of prices arising from the predominance of the supply side over the demand side, with the individualistic system of free competition or freedom of trade, and declare that it is under such a system that the tendency is clearest and operates with the greatest force and facility. No proof is given of this assertion, which is probably a consequence of Wagner's antipathy to economic liberalism. Neither could one easily be devised. The more developed the freedom of trade, the more easily and quickly are movements in the wholesale prices reflected in retail prices, especially downward movements. Where legislative and other limitations on freedom of trade place small producers and retailers in a favored position, the adjustment is slower, and sometimes complete adjustment may even be prevented altogether. A striking example of this is afforded by the Austrian attempts during the last generation to favor craftsmen and small shopkeepers in their competition against factories and large stores, together with the subsequent considerable rise in prices between 1890 and 1914. 
It is not under free competition that the conditions which Wagner calls the permanent predominance of supply side over the demand side are most strongly in evidence, but in those circumstances where the development of free competition is opposed by the greatest obstacles. Wieser's theory, the influence on the value of money exerted by a change in the relations between natural economy and money economy. Wieser's attempt to explain an increase in the money prices of goods, unaccompanied by any considerable change in their value in terms of other goods, is not entirely satisfactory either. He holds the opinion that most of the changes in the value of money that have actually occurred are to be attributed to changes in the relation between the natural economy and the money economy. When the money economy flourishes, the value of money is reduced. When it decays, the value of money rises again. In the early stages of a money economy, most wants are still satisfied by methods of the natural economy. It lives in its own house and itself produces the greater part of what it needs. The sale of its products constitutes only a supplementary source of income. Consequently, the cost of living of the producer, or what comes to the same thing, the value of his labor, is not fully allowed for or not allowed for at all in the cost of the products that are sold. All that is included is the cost of the raw materials used and the wear and tear of those tools or other instruments that have to be specially constructed, which in any case do not amount to much under conditions of extensive production. So it is with the buyer also. The wants that he satisfies by purchase are not among his more important wants, and the use values that he has to estimate are not very great. Then gradually all this changes. The extension of the sphere of the money economy introduces into cost calculations factors that were not included before, but were dealt with on a natural economic principle. The list of the costs that are reckoned in monetary terms grows longer, and each new element in the cost calculation is estimated by comparison with the factors already expressed in money, and added to them with the effect of raising prices. Thus a general rise of prices occurs. But this is not interpreted as a consequence of the changes in supply conditions, but as a fall in the value of money. According to Wieser, if it is not possible to explain the increasing rise in the prices of commodities as originating in monetary factors alone, that is, in variations in the relations between the supply of money and the demand for it, then we must seek another reason for these changes in the general level of prices. Now it is impossible to find the reason by reference to such fluctuations in the values of commodities as are caused by factors belonging to the commodity side of the price ratio. For nowadays, we are not worse supplied with goods than our forefathers were. But to Wieser, no other explanation seems more natural than that which attributes the diminution of the purchasing power of money to the extension of the money economy, which was its historical accompaniment. For Wieser, in fact, it is this very inertia of prices which has helped to bring about the change in the value of money during each period of fresh progress. It must have been this that caused the older prices to be raised by the amount of the additional values involved whenever new factors were co-opted into that part of the process of production that was regulated by the money economy. But the higher the money prices of commodities rise, the lower must the value of money fall in comparison. Increasing dearness thus appears as an inevitable symptom of the development of a growing money economy. It cannot be denied that this argument of Wieser's reveals important points in connection with the market and the determination of prices, which, if followed up, have important bearings on the determination of the exchange ratios between the various economic goods other than money. Nevertheless, so far as Wieser's conclusions relate to the determination of money prices, they exhibit serious shortcomings. In any case, before his argument could be accepted as correct, it would have to be proved that not forces emanating from the money side, but only forces emanating from the commodity side are here involved. Not the valuation of money, but only that of the commodities could have experienced the transformation supposed to be manifested in the alteration of the exchange ratio. 
but the chain of reasoning as a whole must be rejected. The development of facilities for exchanging means that the new recruits to the economy increase their subjective valuations of those goods which they wish to dispose of. Goods which they previously valued solely as objects of personal use are now valued additionally on account of their exchangeability for other goods. This necessarily involves a rise in their subjective value in the eyes of those who possess them and are offering them for exchange. Goods which are to be disposed of in exchange are now no longer valued in terms of the use value that they would have had for their owners if consumed by them, but in terms of the use value of the goods that may be obtained in exchange for them. The latter value is always higher than the former, for exchanges only occur when they are profitable to both of the parties concerned. But on the other hand, and Wieser does not seem to have thought of this, the subjective value of the goods acquired in exchange sinks. The individuals acquiring them no longer ascribe to them the significance corresponding to their position in a subjective scale of values or utilities. They ascribe to them only the smaller significance that belongs to the other goods that have to be surrendered in order to get them. Let us suppose that the scale of values of a possessor of an apple, a pear, and a glass of lemonade is as follows. 1. An apple. 2. A piece of cake. 3. A glass of lemonade. 4. A pear. If now this man is given the opportunity of exchanging his pear for a piece of cake, this opportunity will increase the significance that he attaches to the pear. He will now value the pear more highly than the lemonade. If he is given the choice between relinquishing either the pear or the lemonade, he will regard the loss of the lemonade as the lesser evil. But this is balanced by his reduced valuation of the cake. Let us assume that our man possesses a piece of cake, as well as the pear, the apple, and the lemonade. Now, if he is asked whether he could better put up with the loss of the cake or of the lemonade, he will, in any case, prefer to lose the cake, because he can make good this loss by surrendering the pear, which ranks below the lemonade in his scale of values. The possibility of exchange introduces considerations of the objective exchange value of goods into the economic decisions of every individual. The original primary scale of use values is replaced by the derived secondary scale of exchange and use values, in which economic goods are ranked not only with regard to their use values, but also according to the value of the goods that can be obtained for them in exchange. There has been a transposition of the goods. The order of their significance has been altered. But if one good is placed higher then, there can be no question of it, some other must be placed lower. This arises simply from the very nature of the scale of values, which constitutes nothing but an arrangement of the subjective valuations in order of the significance of the objects valued. The extension of the sphere of exchange has the same effects on the objective exchange values as on subjective values. Here also, every increase of value on the one side must be opposed by a decrease of value on the other side. In fact, the alteration of an exchange ratio between two goods in such a way that both become dearer is inconceivable. And this cannot be avoided by the interposition of money. When it is asserted that the objective exchange value of money has experienced an alteration, some special cause for this must be demonstrated. Apart from the bare fact of the extension of the sphere of exchange. But nobody has ever provided this demonstration. Wieser commences by contrasting, after the fashion of economic historians, the natural economy and the money economy. These terms fail to provide that scientific abstraction of concepts that is the indispensable basis of all theoretical investigation. It remains uncertain whether the contrast of the exchangeless state with an order of society based upon exchange is intended or a contrast between conditions of direct exchange and of indirect exchange based upon the use of money. It seems most likely that Wieser intends to contrast an exchangeless state with one of exchange through money. 
This is certainly the sense in which the expressions natural economy and money economy are used by economic historians, and this definition corresponds to the actual course of economic history after the full development of the institution of money. Nowadays, when new geographical areas or new spheres of consumption are brought within the scope of exchange, there is a direct transition from the exchangeless state to that of the money economy. But this has not always been so, and in many cases the economists must make a clear distinction. Wieser speaks of the townsman who is in the habit of spending his summer holiday in the country and of always finding cheap prices there. One year, when this townsman goes on holiday, he finds that prices have suddenly become higher all around. The village has meanwhile been brought within the scope of the money economy. The farmer now sells their milk and eggs and poultry in the town and demand from their summer visitors the prices that they can hope to get at market. But what Wieser describes here is only half the process. The other half is worked out in the town, where the milk, eggs, and poultry coming on the market from the newly tapped sources of supply in the village exhibit a tendency towards a reduction of price. The inclusion of what has hitherto been a natural economy within the scope of an exchange system involves no one-sided rise of prices, but a leveling of prices. The contrary effect would be evoked by any contraction of the scope of the exchange system. It would have an inherent tendency to increase the differences between prices. Thus, we should not use this phenomenon, as Wieser does, to substantiate the propositions about variations in the objective exchange value of money. Section 14. The Mechanisms of the Market as a Force Affecting the Objective Exchange Value of Money Nevertheless, the progressive rise of prices and its complement, the fall in the value of money, may quite well be explained from the monetary side by reference to the nature of money and monetary transactions. The modern theory of prices has stated all its propositions with a view to the case of direct exchange, even where it does include indirect exchange within the scope of its considerations it does not take sufficient account of the peculiarity of that kind of exchange which is dependent upon the help of the common medium of exchange or money. This, of course, does not constitute an objection to the modern theory of prices. The laws of price determination which it has established for the case of direct exchange are also valid for the case of indirect exchange, and the nature of an exchange is not altered by the use of money. Nevertheless, the monetary theorist has to contribute an important addition to the general theory of prices. If a would-be buyer thinks that the price demanded by a would-be seller is too high because it does not correspond to his subjective valuations of the goods in question, a direct exchange will not be feasible unless the would-be seller reduces his demands. But by indirect exchange, with money entering into the case, even without such a reduction, there is still a possibility that the transaction may take place. In certain circumstances, the would-be buyer may decide to pay the higher price demanded if he can hope similarly to obtain a better price than he had reckoned upon for those goods and services that he himself has to dispose of. In fact, this will very often be the best way for the would-be buyer to obtain the greatest possible advantage from the transaction. Of course, this will not be true, as in the case of transactions like those of the stock exchange or in individual bargaining, when both parties cooperate immediately in the determination of prices and consequently are able to give direct expression to their subjective estimates of commodity and medium of exchange. But there are cases in which prices appear to be determined one-sidedly by the seller and the buyer is obliged to abstain from purchase when the price demanded is too high. In such a case, when the abstention of the purchaser indicates to the seller that he has overreached his demand, the seller may reduce his price again, and, of course, in doing so, may possibly go too far, or not far enough. But under certain conditions, a different procedure may be substituted for this roundabout process, 
the buyer may agree to the price demanded and attempt to recoup himself elsewhere by screwing up the prices of the goods that he himself has for sale. Thus, a rise in the price of food may cause the laborers to demand higher wages. If the entrepreneurs agree to the laborers' demands, then they, in turn, will raise the prices of their products, and then the food producers may perhaps regard this rise in the price of manufactured goods as a reason for a new rise in the price of food. Thus increases in prices are linked together in an endless chain and nobody can indicate where the beginning is and where the end, or which is cause and which is effect. In modern selling policies, fixed prices play a large part. It is customary for cartels and trusts, and in fact all monopolists, including the state, to fix the prices of their products independently without consulting the buyers. They appear to prescribe prices to the buyer. The same is often true in retail trade. Now this phenomenon is not accidental. It is an inevitable phenomenon of the unorganized market. In the unorganized market, the seller does not come into contact with all the buyers, but only with single individuals or groups. Bargaining with these few persons would be useless, for it is not their valuations alone, but those of all the would-be purchasers of the good in question that are decisive for price determination. Consequently, the seller fixes a price that in his opinion corresponds approximately to what the price ought to be, in which it is understandable that he is more likely to aim too high than too low, and waits to see what the buyers will do. In all of those cases in which he alone appears to fix prices, he lacks exact knowledge of the buyer's valuations. He can make more or less correct assumptions about them, and there are merchants who, by close observation of the market and of the psychology of buyers, have become quite remarkably expert at this. But there can be no certainty. In fact, estimates often have to be made of the effects of uncertain and future processes. The sole way by which sellers can arrive at reliable knowledge about the valuations of consumers is the way of trial and error. Therefore, they raise prices until the abstention of the buyers shows them they have gone too far. But even though the price may seem too high, given the current value of money, the buyer may still pay it if he can hope in the same way to raise the price which he fixes and believes that this will lead more quickly to his goal than abstention from purchasing, which might not have its full effect for a long time and might also involve a variety of inconveniences to him. In such circumstances, the seller is deprived of his sole reliable check upon the reasonableness of the prices he demands. He sees that these prices are paid, thinks that the profits of his business are increasing proportionately, and only gradually discovers that the fall in the purchasing power of money deprives him of part of the advantage he has gained. Those who have carefully traced the history of prices must agree that this phenomenon repeats itself a countless number of times. It cannot be denied that much of this passing on of price increases has indeed reduced the value of money, but has by no means altered the exchange ratios between other economic goods in the intended degree. In order to guard against any possible misunderstanding, it should be explicitly stated that there is no justification for drawing the conclusion from this that all increases of prices can be passed on in this way, and so, perhaps, for assuming that there is a fixed exchange ratio between the different economic goods and human efforts. To be consistent, we should then have to ascribe the rise in the money prices of goods to the vain efforts of human greed. A rise in the money price of a commodity does, as a rule, modify its exchange ratio to the other commodities, although not always in the same degree as that in which its exchange ratio to money has been altered. The champions of the mechanical version of the quantity theory may perhaps admit the fundamental correctness of this line of argument, but still object that every variation in the objective exchange value of money that does not start from changes in the relations between the supply of money and the demand for it must be automatically self-correcting. If the objective exchange value of money falls, then the demand for money must necessarily increase since in order to cope with the volume of transactions a larger sum of money is necessary. 
If it were permissible to regard a community's demand for money as the quotient obtained by dividing the volume of transactions by the velocity of circulation, this objection would be justified. But the error in it has already been exposed. The dependence upon the demand for money on objective conditions, such as the number and size of the payments that have to be coped with, is only an indirect dependence through the medium of subjective valuations of individuals. If the money prices of commodities have risen, and each separate purchase now demands more money than before, this need not necessarily cause individuals to increase their stocks of money. It is quite possible, despite the rise of prices, that individuals will form no intention of increasing their reserves, that they will not increase their demand for money. They will probably endeavor to increase their money incomes. In fact, this is one way in which the general rise of prices expresses itself. But increases of money incomes is by no means identical with increases of money reserves. It is, of course, possible that individuals' demands for money may rise with prices, but there is not the least ground for assuming that this will occur, and in particular for assuming that such an increase will occur in such a degree that the effect of the decrease in the purchasing power of money is completely cancelled. Quite as justifiably, the contrary assumption might also be hazarded, namely, that the avoidance of unnecessary expenditure forced upon the individual by the rise of prices would lead to a revision of views concerning the necessary level of cash reserves, and that the resultant decision would certainly not be for an increase, but rather for even a decrease in the amount of money to be held. But here again it must be observed that this is a matter of variation brought about through dynamic agencies. The static state for which the contention attributed to the adherence of the mechanical version of the quantity theory would be valid is disturbed by the fact that the exchange ratios between individual commodities are necessarily modified. Under certain conditions, the technique of the market may have the effect of extending this modification to the exchange ratio between money and other economic goods, too. Section 15 the influence of the size of the monetary unit and its subdivisions on the objective exchange value of money. The assertion is often encountered that the size of the monetary unit exerts a certain influence on the determination of the exchange ratio between money and the other economic goods. In this connection, the opinion is expressed that a large monetary unit tends to raise the money prices of commodities while a small monetary unit is likely to increase the purchasing power of money. Considerations of this sort played a notable part in Austria at the time of the currency regulation of the year 1892 and were decisive in causing the new krona, or half gulden, to be substituted for the previous larger unit, the gulden. So far as this assertion touches the determination of wholesale prices, it can hardly be seriously maintained. But in retail trade, the size of the monetary unit admittedly has a certain significance, which, however, must not be overestimated. Money is not indefinitely divisible. Even with the assistance of money substitutes for expressing fractional sums that for technical reasons cannot conveniently be expressed in the actual monetary material, a method that has been brought to perfection in the modern system of token coinage, it seems entirely impossible to provide commerce with every desired fraction of the monetary unit in a form adapted to the requirements of a rapid and safe transaction of business. In retail trade, rounding off must necessarily be resorted to. The retail prices of the less valuable commodities, and among these are the prices of the most important articles of daily use, and those of certain services, such as the carriage of letters and passenger transport on railways and tramways, must be adjusted in some way to the available coinage. The coinage can only be disregarded in the case of commodities whose nature allows them to be subdivided to any desired extent. In the case of commodities that are not so divisible, 
The prices of the smallest quantity of them that is offered for independent sale must coincide with the value of one or more of the available coins. But in the case of both groups of commodities, continual subdivision of quantities for retail sale is hindered by the fact that small values cannot be expressed in the available coinage. If the smallest available fractional coin is too large to express exactly the price of some commodity, then the matter may be adjusted by exchanging several units of the commodity, on the one hand, against one or more coins on the other. In the retail market for fruit, vegetables, eggs, and other similar commodities, prices such as 2 for 3 heller, 5 for 8 heller, and so on, are everyday phenomena. But in spite of this, there remain a large number of fine shades of value that are inexpressible. Ten fennings of the currency of the German Reich, equivalent to one twenty-seven thousand nine hundredth kilogram of gold, could not be expressed in coins of the Austrian krona currency, eleven heller, equivalent to eleven three hundred twenty-eight thousandths kilogram of gold, or too little, twelve heller, equivalent to three eighty-two thousandths kilogram of gold, were too much. Consequently, there had to be small differences between prices which otherwise would have been kept equal in both countries. This tendency is intensified by the circumstance that the prices of particularly common goods and services are usually expressed not merely in such fractions of the monetary unit as can be expressed in coins, but in amounts corresponding as nearly as possible to the denominations of the coinage. Everybody is familiar with the tendency toward rounding off, which retail prices exhibit, and this is based almost entirely on the denominations of money and money substitutes. Still greater is the significance of the denominations of the coinage in connection with certain prices for which custom prescribes payment in round figures. The chief examples of this are tips, fees, and the like. Section 16. A Methodological Comment in a review devoted to the first edition of this book, Professor Walter Lotz deals with the criticism that I have brought forward against Laughlin's explanation of the value of Austrian silver gulden in the years 1879 to 1892. His arguments are particularly interesting inasmuch as they offer an excellent opportunity of exemplifying the difference that exists between the conception and solution of problems in modern economic theory based on the subjective theory of value on the one hand, and under the empirical realistic treatment of the historically and socio-politically oriented schools of Schmaler and Brentano on the other. According to Professor Lotz, it is a question of taste whether my arguments are recognized as having any value. He does not find them impressive. He says that he himself was not at first able to agree with Laughlin's view until Laughlin mentioned information which makes his arguments at least very probable. Laughlin, in fact, told him that in the 80s he received the information from the leading house of Viennese high finance that people were reckoning with the fact that the paper Gulden would be eventually converted at some rate or the other. Professor Lotz adds to this, Certainly it was also of importance that the circulation of paper gulden and silver gulden was quantitatively very moderate and that these means of payment were accepted by the public banks at their nominal value. All the same, the expectations for the future that the leading house of Viennese high finance had reason to nurse cannot have been quite without effect on the international valuation of the Austrian paper gulden. Consequently, it may be justifiable in view of this information to ascribe some weight to Laughlin's argument in spite of von Mises. The mysterious communication made to Laughlin by the leading house of Viennese high finance and handed on by him to Professor Lotz was a secret de Chanel. The innumerable articles devoted to the question of the standard that appeared during the 80s in the Austrian and Hungarian papers, especially in the New Free Press, always assumed that Austria-Hungary would go over to the gold standard. Preparation for this step had been made as early as 1879 by the suspension of the free coinage of silver. All the same, proof of this fact, which is denied by nobody, or at least not by me, 
in no way solves the problem we are concerned with as Professor Lotz apparently supposes it to do. It merely indicates the problem that we have to solve. The fact that the Goulden was eventually to be converted into gold at some rate or other does not explain why it was at the same time valued at a certain amount and not higher or lower. If the Goulden were to be converted into gold and the national debt certificates into Goulden, how did it come about that the interest-bearing national debt bonds were valued less highly than the Goulden notes and coin Goulden, which did not bear interest? That is what we have to explain. It is obvious that our problem is only just beginning at the point where it is finished with for Professor Lotz. It is true that Professor Lotz is prepared to admit that it was also of importance that the circulation of paper Goulden and silver Goulden was quantitatively very moderate, and he grants the validity of yet a third explanation in addition, namely that this means of payment was accepted by the Treasury at its nominal value. But the relationship of these explanations to each other remains obscure. Possibly it has not occurred to Professor Lotz that the first and second are difficult to reconcile. For if the Goulden was valued only in consideration of its eventual conversion into gold, it is fair to assume that it could have made no difference whether more or fewer Goulden were in circulation, so long, say, as the funds available for conversion were not limited to a given amount. The third attempt at an explanation is altogether invalid, since the nominal value of the Goulden was only the Goulden over again, and the very point at issue is to account for the purchasing power of the Goulden. The sort of procedure that Professor Lutz adopts here for solving a problem of economic science must necessarily end in failure. It is not enough to collect the opinions of businessmen, even if they are leading men or belong to leading houses, and then serve them up to the public, garnished with a few on the one hand, and on the other hand an admittedly, or so, a sprinkling of all the sames. The collection of facts is not science by a long way. There are no grounds for ascribing authoritative significance to the opinions of businessmen. For economics, these opinions are nothing more than material, to be worked upon and evaluated. When the businessman tries to explain anything, he becomes as much a theorist as anybody else, and there is no reason for giving a preference to the theories of the practical merchant or farmer. It is, for instance, impossible to prove the cost of production theory of the older school by invoking the innumerable assertions of businessmen that explain variations in prices by variations in costs of production. Nowadays there are many who, busied with the otiose accumulation of material, have lost their understanding for the specifically economic in the statement and solution of problems. It is high time to remember that economics is something other than the work of the reporter, whose business is to ask X, the banker, and Y, the commercial magnate, what they think of the economic situation. Chapter 3 the problem of the existence of local differences in the objective exchange value of money. Section 1. Interlocal Price Relations Let us at first ignore the possibility of various kinds of money being employed side by side and assume that, in a given district, one kind of money serves exclusively as the common medium of exchange. The problem of the reciprocal exchange ratios of different kinds of money will then form the subject matter of the next chapter. In this chapter, however, let us imagine an isolated geographical area of any size whose inhabitants engage in mutual trade and use a single good as common medium of exchange. It makes no immediate difference whether we think of this region as composed of several states or as part of one large state, or as a particular individual state. It will not be necessary until a later stage in our argument to mention certain incidental modifications of the general formula which result from the differences in the legal concepts of money in different states. It has already been mentioned that two economic goods, which are of similar constitution in all other respects, 
are not to be regarded as members of the same species if they are not both ready for consumption at the same place. For many purposes it seems more convenient to regard them as goods of different species related to one another as goods of higher and lower orders. Only in the case of money is it permissible, in certain circumstances, to ignore the factor of position in space. For the utility of money, in contrast to that of other economic goods, is to a certain extent free from the limitations of geographical distance. Checks and clearing systems, and similar institutions, have a tendency to make the use of money more or less independent of the difficulties and costs of transport. They have had the effect of permitting gold stored in the cellars of the Bank of England, for instance, to be used as a common medium of exchange anywhere in the world. We can easily imagine a monetary organization which, by the exclusive use of notes or clearinghouse methods, allows all transfers to be made with the instrumentality of sums of money that never change their position in space. If we assume, further, that the costs associated with every transaction are not influenced by the distance between the two parties to the contract and between each of them and the place where the money is, it is well known that this condition is already realized in some cases, for example, in charges made for postal and money order services, then there is sufficient justification for ignoring differences in the geographical situation of money. But a corresponding abstraction with regard to other economic goods would be inadmissible. No institution can make it possible for coffee in Brazil to be consumed in Europe. Before the consumption good, coffee in Europe, can be made out of the production good, coffee in Brazil, this production good must first be combined with the complementary good, means of transport. If differences due to the geographical position of money are disregarded in this way, we get the following law for the exchange ratio between money and other economic goods. Every economic good that is ready for consumption, in the sense in which that phrase is usually understood in commerce and technology, has a subjective use value qua consumption good at the place where it is and qua production good at those places to which it may be brought for consumption. These valuations originate independently of each other. But for the determination of the exchange ratio between money and commodities, both are equally important. The money price of any commodity in any place, under the assumption of completely unrestricted exchange, and disregarding the differences arising from the time taken in transit, must be the same as the price at any other place, augmented or diminished by the money cost of transport. Now there is no further difficulty in including in this formula the cost of transport of money, or a further factor on which the banker and exchange dealer lay great weight, viz. the costs arising from the recoinage which may be necessary. All these factors, which it is not necessary to enumerate in further detail, have a combined effect on the foreign exchange rate, cable rate, etc., the resultant of which must be included in our calculation as a positive or negative quantity. To prevent any possible misunderstanding, it should be once more explicitly remarked that we are concerned here only with the rate of exchange between places in which the same kind of money is in use, although it is a matter of indifference whether the same coins are legal tender in both places. The essentially different problems of the rate of exchange between different kinds of money will not occupy us until the following chapter. Section 2. Alleged Local Differences in the Purchasing Power of Money In contrast to the law of interlocal price relations that has just been explained is the popular belief in local variations in the purchasing power of money. The assertion is made again and again that the purchasing power of money may be different in different markets at the same time, and statistical data are continually being brought forward to support this assertion. Few economic opinions are so firmly rooted in the lay mind as this. Travelers are in the habit of bringing it home with them, usually as a piece of knowledge gained by personal observation. Few visitors to Austria from Germany at the beginning of the 20th century had any doubts that the value of money was higher in Germany than in Austria. 
that the objective exchange value of gold, our commodity money, stood at different levels in different parts of the world, pass for established truth in even economic literature. We have seen where the fallacy lies in this, and may spare ourselves unnecessary repetition. It is the leaving out of account of the positional factor in the nature of economic goods, a relic of the crudely materialist conception of the economic problem, that is to blame for the confusion of ideas. All the alleged local differences in the purchasing power of money can easily be explained in this way. It is not permissible to deduce a difference in the purchasing power of money in Germany and in Russia from the fact that the price of wheat is different in these countries, for wheat in Russia and wheat in Germany represent two different species of goods. To what absurd conclusions should we not come if we regarded goods lying in bond in a customs or excise warehouse and goods of the same technological species on which the duty or tax had already been paid as belonging to the same species of goods in the economic sense? We should then apparently have to suppose that the purchasing power of money could vary from building to building or from district to district within a single town. Of course, if there are those who prefer to retain commercial terminology and think it better to distinguish species of goods merely by their external characteristics, we cannot say that they shall not do this. To contend over terminological questions would be an idle enterprise. We are not concerned with words, but with facts. But if this form of expression, in our opinion, the less appropriate, is employed, Care must be taken in some way to make full allowance for distinctions based on differences in the places at which the commodities are situated ready for consumption. It is not sufficient merely to take account of costs of transport and of customs duties and indirect taxes. The effect of direct taxes, for example, the burden of which is to a large extent transferable, also must be included in the calculation. It seems better to us to use the terminology suggested above, which stresses with greater clearness that the purchasing power of money shows a tendency to come to the same level throughout the world, and that the alleged differences in it are almost entirely explicable by differences in the quality of the commodities offered and demanded, so that there is only a small and almost negligible remainder left over that is due to differences in the quality of the offered and demanded money. The existence of the tendency itself is hardly questioned, but the force which it exerts, and hence its importance also, are estimated variously, and the old classical proposition that money, like every other commodity, always seeks out the market in which it has the highest value is said to be mistaken. Wieser has said in this connection that the monetary transactions involved in exchange are induced by the commodity transactions that they constitute an auxiliary movement which proceeds only so far as it is necessary to permit the completion of the principal movement. But the international movement of commodities, Wieser declares, is even nowadays noticeably smaller in comparison with domestic trade. The transmitted national equilibrium of prices is broken through for relatively few commodities whose prices are world prices. Consequently, the transmitted value of money is still for the most part as significant as ever. It will not be otherwise until, in place of the national organization of production and labor which still prevails today, a complete world organization has been established, but it will be a long while before this happens. At present, the chief factor of production, labor, is still subject to national limitations everywhere. A nation adopts foreign advances in technique and organization only to the degree permitted by its national characteristics and, in general, does not very easily avail itself of opportunities of work abroad, whereas within the nation entrepreneurs and wage laborers move about to a considerable extent. Consequently, wages everywhere retain the national level at which they have been historically determined, and thus the most important element in costs remains nationally determined at this historical level, and the same is true of most other cost elements. On the whole, 
the transmitted value of money forms the basis of further social calculations of costs and values. Meanwhile, the international contacts are not yet strong enough to raise national methods of production to a single world level and to efface the differences in the transmitted national exchange values of money. It is hardly possible to agree with these arguments, which smack a little too much of the cost of production theory of value and are certainly not to be reconciled with the principles of the subjective theory. Nobody would wish to dispute the fact that costs of production differ greatly from one another in different localities, but it must be denied that this exercises an influence on the price of commodities and on the purchasing power of money. The contrary follows too clearly from the principles of the theory of prices and is too clearly demonstrated day by day in the market to need any special proof in addition. The consumer who seeks the cheapest supply and the producer who seeks the most paying sale concur in the endeavor to liberate prices from the limitations of the local market. Intending buyers do not bother much about the national cost of production when those abroad are lowered. And because this is so, the producer working with the higher cost of production calls for protective duties. That differences in the wages of labor in different countries are unable to influence the price levels of commodities is best shown by the circumstance that even the countries with high levels of wages are able to supply the markets of the countries with low levels of wages. Local differences in the prices of commodities whose natures are technologically identical are to be explained on the one hand by differences in the cost of preparing them for consumption, expenses of transport, cost of retailing, etc., and on the other hand by the physical and legal obstacles that restrict the mobility of commodities and human beings. Section 3. Alleged Local Differences in the Cost of Living there is a certain connection between the assertion of local differences in the purchasing power of money and the widespread belief in local differences in the cost of living. It is supposed to be possible to live more cheaply in some places than in others. It might be supposed that both statements come to the same thing and that it makes no difference whether we say that the Austrian crown was worth less in 1913 than the 85 finnings which corresponded to its gold value, or that living was dearer in Austria than in Germany. But this is not correct. The propositions are by no means identical. The opinion that living is more expensive in one place than in another in no way implies the proposition that the purchasing power of money is different. Even with complete equality of the exchange ratio between money and other economic goods, it may happen that an individual is involved in unequal costs in securing the same level of satisfaction in different places. This is especially likely to be the case when residence in a certain place awakens wants which the same individual would not have been conscious of elsewhere. Such wants may be social or physical in nature. Thus, the Englishman of the richer classes is able to live more cheaply on the continent because he is obliged to fulfill a series of social duties at home that do not exist for him abroad. Again, living in a large town is dearer than in the country, if only because the immediate propinquity in town of so many possibilities of enjoyment stimulates desires and calls forth wants that are unknown to the provincial. Those who often visit theaters, concerts, art exhibitions, and similar places of entertainment naturally spend more money than those who live in otherwise similar circumstances but have to go without these pleasures. The same is true of the physical wants of human beings. In tropical areas, Europeans have to take a series of precautions for the protection of health, which would be unnecessary in the temperate zones. All those wants whose origin is dependent on local circumstances demand for their satisfaction a certain stock of goods which would otherwise be used for the satisfaction of other wants, and consequently they diminish the degree of satisfaction that a given stock of goods can afford. Hence the statement that the cost of living is different in different localities only means that the same individual cannot secure the same degree of satisfaction from the same stock of goods in different places. 
We have just given one reason for this phenomenon, but besides this, the belief in local differences in the cost of living is also supported by reference to local differences in the purchasing power of money. It would be possible to prove the incorrectness of this view. It is no more appropriate to speak of a difference between the purchasing power of money in Germany and in Austria than it would be justifiable to conclude from differences between the prices charged by hotels on the peaks and in the valleys of the Alps that the objective exchange value of money is different in the two situations, and to formulate some such proposition as that the purchasing power of money varies inversely with the height above sea level. The purchasing power of money is the same everywhere. Only the commodities offered are not the same. They differ in a quality that is economically significant, the position in space of the place at which they are ready for consumption. But although the exchange ratios between money and economic goods of completely similar constitution in all parts of a unitary market area in which the same sort of money is employed are at any time equal to one another, and all apparent exceptions can be traced back to differences in the spatial quality of the commodities, it is nevertheless true that price differentials evoked by the difference in position and hence an economic quality, of the commodities may, under certain circumstances, constitute a subjective justification of the assertion that there are differences in the cost of living. He who voluntarily visits Carlsbad, on account of his help, would be wrong in deducing from the higher price of houses and food there that it is impossible to get as much enjoyment from a given sum of money in Carlsbad as elsewhere, and that consequently living is dearer there. This conclusion does not allow for the difference in quality of the commodities whose prices are being compared. It is just because of this difference in quality, just because it has a certain value for him, that the visitor comes to Carlsbad. If he has to pay more in Carlsbad for the same quantity of satisfactions, this is due to the fact that in paying for them, he is also paying the price of being able to enjoy them in the immediate neighborhood of the medicinal springs. The case is different for the businessman and laborer and official who are merely tied to Carlsbad for their occupations. The propinquity of the waters has no significance for the satisfaction of their wants, and so their having to pay extra on account of it for every good and service that they buy will since they obtain no additional satisfaction from it, appear to them as a reduction of the possibilities of the enjoyment that they might otherwise have. If they compare their standard of living with that which they could achieve with the same expenditure in a neighboring town, they will arrive at the conclusion that living is really dearer at the spa than elsewhere. They will then only transfer their activity to the dearer spa if they believe they will be able to secure there a sufficiently higher money income to enable them to achieve the same standard of living as elsewhere. But in comparing the standards of satisfaction attainable, they will leave out of account the advantages of being able to satisfy their wants in the spa itself because this circumstance has no value in their eyes. Every kind of wage will therefore, under the assumption of complete mobility, be higher in the spa than in other, cheaper places. This is generally known as far as it applies to contract wages, but it is also true of official salaries. The government pays a special bonus to those of its employees who have to take up their duties in dear places, in order to put them on a level with those functionaries who are able to live in cheaper places. The laborers, too, have to be compensated by higher wages for the higher cost of living. This also is the clue to the meaning of the sentence, living is dearer in Austria than in Germany, a sentence which has a certain meaning even though there is no difference between the purchasing power of money in the two countries. The differences in prices in the two areas do not refer to commodities of the same nature. What are supposed to be identical commodities really differ in an essential point. They are available for consumption in different places. Physical causes on the one hand, social causes on the other, give to this distinction a decisive importance in the determination of prices. He who values the opportunity of working in Austria, as an Austrian, among Austrians, 
who has been brought up to work and earn money in Austria and cannot get a living anywhere else on account of language difficulties, national customs, economic conditions, and the like, would nevertheless be wrong in concluding from a comparison of domestic and foreign commodity prices that living was dearer at home. He must not forget that part of every price he pays is for the privilege of being able to satisfy his wants in Austria. An independent renter with free choice of domicile is in a position to decide whether or not he prefers a life of apparently limited satisfactions in his native country among his own kindred to one of apparently more abundant satisfaction among strangers in a foreign land. But most people are spared the trouble of such a choice. For most, staying at home is a matter of necessity, immigration an impossibility. To recapitulate, the exchange ratio subsisting between commodities and money is everywhere the same. But men and their wants are not everywhere the same. And neither are commodities. Only if these distinctions are ignored is it possible to speak of local differences in the purchasing power of money or to say that living is dearer in one place than in another. Chapter 4. The Exchange Ratio Between Money of Different Kinds Section 1. The Twofold Possibility of the Coexistence of Different Kinds of Money The existence of an exchange ratio between two sorts of money is dependent upon both being used side by side at the same time by the same economic agents as common media of exchange. We could, perhaps, conceive of two economic areas, not connected in any other way, being linked together only by the fact that each exchanged the commodity it used for money against that used for money by the other, in order, then, to use the acquired monetary commodity otherwise than as money. But this would not be a case of an exchange ratio between different kinds of money simply arising from their monetary employment. If we wish successfully to conduct our investigation as an investigation into the theory of money, then even in the present chapter we must disregard the non-monetary uses of the material of which commodity money is made, or, at least, take account of them only where this is necessary for the complete clarification of all the processes connected with our problem. Now, the assertion that, apart from the effects of the industrial use of the monetary material, an exchange ratio can be established between two sorts of money only when both are used as money simultaneously and side by side, is not the usual view. That is to say, Prevailing opinion distinguishes two cases, that in which two or more domestic kinds of money exist side by side in the parallel standard, and that in which the money in exclusive use at home is of a kind different from the money used abroad. Both cases are dealt with separately, although there is no theoretical difference between them as far as the determination of the exchange ratio between the two sorts of money is concerned. If a gold standard country and a silver standard country have business relations with each other and constitute a unitary market for certain economic goods, then it is obviously incorrect to say that the common medium of exchange consists of gold only for the inhabitants of the gold standard country and of silver only for those of the silver standard country. On the contrary, from the economic point of view, both metals must be regarded as money for each area. Until 1873, gold was just as much a medium of exchange for the German buyer of English commodities as silver was for the English buyer of German commodities. The German farmer, who wished to exchange corn for English steel goods, could not do so without the instrumentality of both gold and silver. Exceptional cases might arise where a German sold in England for gold and bought again with gold, or where an Englishman sold in Germany for silver and bought with silver. But this merely demonstrates more clearly still the monetary characteristic of both metals for the inhabitants of both areas. Whether the case is one of an exchange through the instrumentality of money used once or used more than once, 
The only important point is that the existence of international trade relations results in the consequence that the money of each of the single areas concerned is money also for all the other areas. It is true that there are important differences between that money which plays the chief part in domestic trade, is the instrument of most exchanges, predominates in the dealings between consumers and sellers of consumption goods, and in loan transactions, and is recognized by the law as legal tender, and that money which is employed in relatively few transactions, is hardly ever used by consumers in their purchases, does not function as an instrument of loan operations, and is not legal tender. In popular opinion, the former money only is domestic money, the latter foreign money. Although we cannot accept this if we do not want to close the way to an understanding of the problem that occupies us, we must nevertheless emphasize that it has great significance in other connections. We shall have to come back to it in the chapter which deals with the social effects of fluctuations in the objective exchange value of money. Section 2. The Static or Natural Exchange Ratio Between Different Kinds of Money For the exchange ratio between two or more kinds of money, whether they are employed side by side in the same country, the parallel standard, or constitute what is popularly called foreign money and domestic money, it is the exchange ratio between individual economic goods and the individual kinds of money that is decisive. The different kinds of money are exchanged in a ratio corresponding to the exchange ratios existing between each of them and the other economic goods. If one kilogram of gold is exchanged for m kilograms of a particular sort of commodity, and one kilogram of silver for one to fifteen and a half kilograms of the same sort of commodity, then the exchange ratio between gold and silver will be established at one to fifteen and a half. If some disturbance tends to alter this ratio between the two sorts of money, which we shall call the static or natural ratio, then automatic forces will be set in motion that will tend to re-establish it. Let us consider the case of two countries, each of which carries on its domestic trade with the aid of one sort of money only, which is different from that used by the other country. If the inhabitants of two areas with different currencies who have previously exchanged their commodities directly without the intervention of money begin to make use of money in the transaction of their business, they will base the exchange ratio between the two kinds of money on the exchange ratio between each kind of money and the commodities. Let us assume that a gold standard country and a silver standard country had exchanged cloth directly for wheat on such terms that one meter of cloth was given for one bushel of wheat. Let the price of cloth in the country of its origin be one gram of gold per meter, that of wheat 15 grams of silver per bushel. If international trade is now put on a monetary basis, then the price of gold in terms of silver must be established at 15. If it were established higher, say at 16, then indirect exchange through the instrumentality of money would be disadvantageous from the point of view of the owners of the wheat as compared with direct exchange. In indirect exchange for a bushel of wheat, they would obtain only 15 sixteenths of a meter of cloth as against a whole meter in direct exchange. The same disadvantage would arise for the owners of the cloth if the price of gold was established at anything lower, say, at 14 grams of silver. This, of course, does not imply that the exchange ratios between the different kinds of money have actually developed in this manner. It is to be understood as a logical, not a historical, explanation. Of course, the two precious metals, gold and silver, it must especially be remarked that their reciprocal exchange ratios have slowly developed with the development of their monetary position. If no other relations than those of barter exist between the inhabitants of two areas, then the balances in favor of one party or the other cannot arise. The objective exchange values of the quantities of commodities and services surrendered by each of the contracting parties must be equal. 
whether present goods or future goods are involved. Each constitutes the price of the other. This fact is not altered in any way if the exchange no longer proceeds directly, but indirectly through the intermediary ship of one or more common media of exchange. The surplus of the balance of payments that is not settled by the consignment of goods and services, but by the transmission of money, was long regarded merely as a consequence of the state of international trade. It is one of the great achievements of classical political economy to have exposed the fundamental error involved in this view. It demonstrated that international movements of money are not consequences of the state of trade, that they constitute not the effect but the cause of a favorable or unfavorable trade balance. The precious metals are distributed among individuals and hence among nations according to the extent and intensity of their demands for money. No individual and no nation need fear at any time to have less money than it needs. Government measures designed to regulate the international movement of money in order to ensure that the community shall have the amount it needs are just as unnecessary and inappropriate as, say, intervention to ensure a sufficiency of corn or iron or the like. This argument dealt the mercantilist theory its death blow. Nevertheless, statesmen are still greatly exercised by the problem of the international distribution of money. For hundreds of years, the Midas theory, systematized by mercantilism, has been the rule followed by governments in taking measures of commercial policy. In spite of Hume, Smith, and Ricardo, it still dominates men's minds more than would be expected. Phoenix-like, it rises again and again from its own ashes, and indeed it would be hardly possible to overcome it with objective argument, for it numbers its disciples among that great host of the half-educated who are proof against any argument, however simple, if it threatens to rob them of long-cherished illusions that have become too dear to part with. It is only regrettable that these lay opinions not only predominate in discussions of economic policy on the part of legislators, the press, even the technical journals, and businessmen, but still occupy much space even in scientific literature. The blame for this must again be laid to the account of obscure notions concerning the nature of fiduciary media and their significance as regards the determination of prices. The reasons which, first in England and then in all other countries, were urged in favor of the limitation of the fiduciary note issue have never been understood by modern writers, who know them only at second or third hand. That they in general plead for their retention, or only demand such modifications as leave the principle untouched, merely expresses their reluctance to replace an institution which, on the whole, has indubitably justified itself by a system whose effects they, to whom the phenomena of the market constitute an insoluble riddle, are naturally least of all able to foresee. When these writers seek for a motive in present-day banking policy, they can find none but that characterized by the slogan, Protection of the National Stock of the Precious Metals. We can pass the more lightly over these views in the present place since we shall have further opportunity, in Part 3, to discuss the true meaning of the bank laws that limit the note issue. Money does not flow to the place where the rate of interest is highest. Neither is it true that it is the richest nations that attract money to themselves. The proposition is as true of money as of every other economic good, that its distribution among individual economic agents depends on its marginal utility. Let us first completely abstract from all geographical and political concepts, such as country and state, and imagine a state of affairs in which money and commodities are completely mobile within a unitary market area. Let us further assume that all payments, other than those cancelled out by offsetting or mutual balancing of claims, are made by transferring money, and not by the cession of fiduciary media. That is to say, that uncovered notes and deposits are unknown. This supposition, again, is similar to that of the purely metallic currency of the English currency school, although with the help of our precise concept of fiduciary media, we are able to avoid the obscurities and shortcomings of their point of view. 
In a state of affairs corresponding to these suppositions of ours, all economic goods, including, of course, money, tend to be distributed in such a way that a position of equilibrium between individuals is reached. When no further active exchange that any individual could undertake would bring them any gain, any increase of subjective value. In such a position of equilibrium, the total stock of money, just like the total stocks of commodities, is distributed among individuals according to the intensity with which they are able to express their demand for it in the market. Every displacement of the forces affecting the exchange ratio between money and other economic goods brings about a corresponding change in this distribution until a new position of equilibrium is reached. This is true of individuals, but it is also true of all the individuals in a given area taken together. For the goods possessed and the goods demanded by a nation are only the sums of the goods possessed and the goods demanded by all the economic agents, private as well as public, which make up the nation, among which the state as such admittedly occupies an important position, but a very far from dominant one. Trade balances are not causes, but merely concomitants of movements of money. For if we look beneath the veil with which the forms of monetary transactions conceal the nature of exchanges of goods, then it is clear that, even in international trade, commodities are exchanged for commodities through the instrumentality of money. Just as the single individual does, so also all the individuals in an economic community taken together wish in the last analysis to acquire not money, but other economic goods. If the state of the balance of payments is such that movements of money would have to occur from one country to the other, independently of any altered estimation of money on the part of their respective inhabitants, then operations are induced which re-establish equilibrium. Those persons who receive more money than they need will hasten to spend the surplus again as soon as possible, whether they buy production goods or consumption goods. On the other hand, those persons whose stock of money falls below the amount they need will be obliged to increase their stock of money, either by restricting their purchases or by disposing of commodities in their possession. The price variations in the markets of the countries in question that occur for these reasons give rise to transactions which must always re-establish the equilibrium of the balance of payments. A credit or debit balance of payments that is not dependent upon an alteration in the conditions of demand for money can only be transient. Thus, international movements of money, so far as they are not of a transient nature and consequently soon rendered ineffective by movements in the contrary direction, are always called forth by variations in the demand for money. Now it follows from this that a country, in which fiduciary media are not employed, is never in danger of losing its stock of money to another country. Shortage of money and superabundance of money can no more be a permanent experience for a nation than for an individual. Ultimately, they are spread out uniformly among all economic agents using the same economic good as common medium of exchange, and naturally, their effects on the objective exchange value of money, which brings about the adjustment between the stock of money and the demand for it, are finally uniform for all economic agents. Measures of economic policy which aim at increasing the quantity of money circulating in a country could be successful, so far as the money circulates in other countries also, only if they brought about a displacement in the relative demands for money. Nothing is fundamentally altered in all this by the employment of fiduciary media. So far as there remains a demand for money in the narrower sense, despite the use of fiduciary media, it will express itself in the same way. There are many gaps in the classical doctrine of international trade. It was built up at a time when international exchange relations were largely limited to dealings in present goods. No wonder, then, that its chief reference was to such goods, or that it left out of account the possibility of an international exchange of services and of present goods for future goods. It remained for a later generation to undertake the expansion and the correction here necessary, a task that was all the easier since all that was wanted was a consistent expansion of the same doctrine 
to cover these phenomena as well. The classical doctrine had further restricted itself to that part of the problem presented by international metallic money. The treatment with which credit money had to be content was not satisfactory, and this shortcoming has not been entirely remedied yet. The problem has been regarded too much from the point of view of the technique of the monetary system and too little from the theory of exchange of goods. If the latter point of view had been adopted, it would have been impossible to avoid commencing the investigation with the proposition that the balance of trade between two areas with different currencies must always be in equilibrium without the emergence of a balance needing to be corrected by the transport of money. If we take a gold standard and a silver standard country as an example, then there still remains the possibility that the money of the one country will be put to a non-monetary use in the other. Such a possibility must naturally be ruled out of account. The relations between two countries with fiat money would be the best example to take. If we merely make our example more general by supposing that metallic money may be in use, then only the monetary use of the metallic money must be considered. It is then immediately clear that goods and services can only be paid for with other goods and services. That, in the last analysis, there can be no question of payment in money. Chapter 5 The Problem of Measuring the Objective Exchange Value of Money and Variations in It Section 1 The History of the Problem The problem of measuring the objective exchange value of money and its variations has attracted much more attention than its significance warrants. If all the columns of figures and tables and curves that have been prepared in its connection could perform what has been promised of them, then we should certainly have to agree that the tremendous expenditure of labor upon their construction would not have been in vain. In fact, nothing less has been hoped from them than the solution of the difficult questions connected with the problem of objective exchange value of money. But it is very well known and has been almost ever since the methods were discovered, that such aids cannot avail here. The fact that, in spite of all this, the improvement of methods of calculating index numbers is still worked at most zealously, and that they have even been able to achieve a certain popularity that is otherwise denied to economic investigation, may well appear puzzling. It becomes explicable if we take into account certain peculiarities of the human mind. Like the king in Rukert's Vishayt de Brahmanen, the layman always tends to seek for formula that sum up the results of scientific investigation in a few words. But the briefest and most pregnant expression for such summaries is in figures. Simple numerical statement is sought for even where the nature of the case excludes it. The most important results of research in the social sciences leave the multitude apathetic, but any set of figures awakens its interest. Its history becomes a series of dates, its economics a collection of statistical data. No objection is more often brought against economics by laymen than that there are no economic laws, and if an attempt is made to meet this objection, then almost invariably the request is made that an example of such a law should be named and expounded as if fragments of systems whose study demands years of thought on the part of the expert could be made intelligible to the novice in a few minutes. Only by letting fall morsels of statistics is it possible for the economic theorist to maintain his prestige in the face of questions of this sort. Great names in the history of economics are associated with various systems of index numbers. Indeed, it was but natural that the best brain should have been the most attracted by this extraordinarily difficult problem, but in vain. Closer investigation shows us how little the inventors of the various index number methods themselves thought of their attempts, how justly, as a rule, they were able to estimate their importance. He who cares to go to the trouble of demonstrating the uselessness of index numbers for monetary theory and the concrete tasks of monetary policy, will be able to select a good proportion of his weapons from the writings of the very men who invented them. 
Section 2. The Nature of the Problem The objective exchange value of the monetary unit can be expressed in units of any individual commodity. Just as we are in the habit of speaking of a money price of the other exchangeable goods, so we may conversely speak of the commodity price of money, and have then so many expressions for the objective exchange value of money as there are commercial commodities that are exchanged for money. But these expressions tell us little. They leave unanswered the question that we want to solve. There are two parts to the problem of measuring the objective exchange value of money. First, we have to obtain numerical demonstration of the fact of variations in the objective exchange value of money. Then, the question must be decided whether it is possible to make a quantitative examination of the causes of particular price movements, with special reference to the question whether it would be possible to produce evidence of such variations in the purchasing power of money as lie on the monetary side of the ratio. So far as the first-named problem is concerned, it is self-evident that its solution must assume the existence of a good or complex of goods of unchanging objective exchange value. The fact that such goods are inconceivable needs no further elucidation. For a good of this sort could exist only if all the exchange ratios between all goods were entirely free from variations. With the continually varying foundations on which the exchange ratios of the market ultimately rest, this presumption can never be true of a social order based upon the free exchange of goods. To measure is to determine the ratio of one quantity to another, which is invariable, or assumed to be invariable. Invariability in respect of the property to be measured, or at least the legitimacy of assuming such invariability, is a sine qua non of all measurement. Only when this assumption is admissible is it possible to determine the variations that are to be measured. Then, if the ratio between the measure and the object to be measured alter, this can only be referred to causes directly affecting the latter. Thus, the problems of measuring the two kinds of variation in the objective exchange value of money go together. If the one is proved to be soluble, then so also is the other, and proof of the insolubility of one is also proof of the insolubility of the other. Section 3 Measures of Calculating Index Numbers Nearly all the attempts that have hitherto been made to solve the problem of measuring the objective exchange value of money have started from the idea that if the price movements of a large number of commodities were combined by a particular method of calculation, the effects of those determinants of the price movements which lie on the side of the commodities would largely cancel one another out, and, Consequently, that such calculations would make it possible to discover the direction and extent of the effects of those determinants of price movements that lie on the monetary side. This assumption would prove correct, and the inquiries instituted with its help could lead to the desired results if the exchange ratios between the other economic goods were constant among themselves. Since this assumption does not hold good, refuge must be taken in all sorts of artificial hypotheses in order to obtain at least some sort of an idea of the significance of the results gained. But to do this is to abandon the safe ground of statistics and enter into a territory in which, in the absence of any reliable guidance, such as could be provided only by a complete understanding of all the laws governing the value of money, we must necessarily go astray. So long as the determinants of the objective exchange value of money are not satisfactorily elucidated in some other way, the sole possible reliable guide through the tangle of statistical material is lacking. But even if investigation into the determinants of prices and their fluctuations and the separation of these determinants into single factors could be achieved with complete precision, statistical investigation of prices would still be thrown on its own resources at the very point where it most needs support. That is to say, in monetary theory, as in every other branch of economic investigation, it will never be possible to determine the quantitative importance of separate factors. 
examination of the influence exerted by the separate determinants of prices will never reach the stage of being able to undertake numerical imputation among the different factors. All determinants of prices have their effect only through the medium of the subjective estimates of individuals, and the extent to which any given factor influences these subjective estimates can never be predicted. Consequently, the evaluation of the result of statistical investigation into prices, even if they could be supported by established theoretical conclusions, would still remain largely dependent on the rough estimates of the investigator, a circumstance that is apt to reduce their value considerably. Under certain conditions, index numbers may do very useful service as an aid to investigation into the history and statistics of prices. For the extension of the theory of the nature and value of money, they are, unfortunately, not very important. Section 4. Wieser's Refinement of the Methods of Calculating Index Numbers very recently, Wieser has made a new suggestion which constitutes an improvement of the budgetary method of calculating index numbers, notably employed by Faulkner. This is based on the view that when nominal wages change but continue to represent the same real wages, then the value of money has changed because it expresses the same real quantity of value differently from before or because the ratio of the monetary unit to the unit of real value has changed. On the other hand, the value of money is regarded as unchanged when nominal wages go up or down, but real wages move exactly parallel with them. If the contrast between money income and real income is substituted for that between nominal and real wages and the whole sum of the individuals in the community substituted for the single individual, then it is said to follow that such variations of the total money income, as are accompanied by corresponding variations of the total real income, do not indicate variations in the value of money at all, even if at the same time the prices of goods have changed in accordance with the altered conditions of supply. Only when the same real income is expressed by a different money income has the specific value of money changed. Thus, to measure the value of money, a number of typical kinds of income should be chosen and the real expenditure corresponding to each determined, i.e., the quantity of each kind of thing on which the incomes are spent. The money expenditure corresponding to this real expenditure is also to be shown, all for a particular base year, and then, for each year, the sums of money are to be evaluated in which the same quantities of real value were represented, giving the prices ruling at the time. The result, it is claimed, would be the possibility of working out an average, which would give for the whole country the monetary expression, as determined year by year in the market, of the real income taken as base. Thus, it would be discovered whether a constant real value had a constant, a higher or a lower money expression year by year, and so a measure would be obtained of variations in the value of money. The technical difficulties in the way of employing this method, which is the most nearly perfect and the most deeply thought out of all methods of calculating index numbers, are apparently insurmountable. But even if it were possible to master them, this method could never fulfill the purpose that it is intended to serve. It could attain its end only under the same supposition that would justify all other methods, viz. the supposition that the exchange ratios between the individual economic goods excluding money are constant, and that only the exchange ratio between money and each of the other economic goods is liable to fluctuation. This would naturally involve an inertia of all social institutions, of population, of the distribution of wealth and income, and of the subjective valuations of individuals. Where everything is in a state of flux, the supposition breaks down completely. It was impossible for this to escape Wieser, who insists on allowance for the fact that the types of income and the classes into which the community is divided gradually alter, and that in the course of time, certain kinds of consumption are discontinued and new kinds begun. 
For short periods, Wieser is of the opinion that this involves no particular difficulty, that it would be easy to retain the comparability of the totals by eliminating expenditures that did not enter both sets of budgets. For long periods, he recommends Marshall's chain method of always including a sufficient number of transitional types and restricting comparisons to any given type and that immediately preceding or following it. This hardly does away with the difficulty. The farther we went back in history, the more we should have to eliminate. Ultimately, it seems that only those portions of real income would remain that serve to satisfy the most fundamental needs of existence. Even within this limited scope, comparisons would be impossible, as, say, between the clothing of the 20th century and that of the 10th century. It is still less possible to trace back historically the typical incomes, which would necessarily involve consideration of the existing division of society into classes. The progress of social differentiation constantly increases the number of types of income and this is by no means simply due to the splitting up of single types. The process is much more complicated. Members of one group break off and intermingle with other groups or portions of other groups in a most complicated manner. With what type of income of the past can we compare that, say, of the modern factory worker? But, even if we were to ignore all these considerations, other difficulties would arise. It is quite possible, even most probable, that subjective valuations of equal portions of real income have altered in the course of time. Changes in ways of living, in tastes, in opinions concerning the objective use value of individual economic goods evoke quite extraordinarily large fluctuations here, even in short periods. If we do not take account of this in estimating the variations of money value of these portions of income, then new sources of error arise that may fundamentally affect our results. On the other hand, there is no basis at all for taking account of them. All index number systems, so far as they are intended to have a greater significance for monetary theory than that of mere playing with figures, are based upon the idea of measuring the utility of a certain quantity of money. The object is to determine whether a gram of gold is more or less useful today than it was at a certain time in the past. As far as objective use value is concerned, such an investigation may perhaps yield results. We may assume the fiction, if we like, that, say, a loaf of bread is always of the same utility in the objective sense, always comprises the same food value. It is not necessary for us to enter at all into the question of whether this is permissible or not. For certainly, this is not the purpose of index numbers. Their purpose is the determination of the subjective significance of the quantity of money in question. For this, recourse must be had to the quite nebulous and illegitimate fiction of an eternal human with invariable valuations. In Wieser's typical incomes that have to be traced back through the centuries may be seen an attempt to refine this fiction and to free it from its limitations. But even this attempt cannot make the impossible possible and was necessarily bound to fail. It represents the most perfect conceivable development of the index number system and the fact that this also leads to no practical result condemns the whole business. Of course, this could not escape Wieser. If he neglected to lay particular stress upon it, this is probably due solely to the circumstance that his concern was not so much to indicate a way of solving this insoluble problem as to extract from a usual method all that could be got from it. Section 5. The Practical Utility of Index Numbers the inadmissibility of the methods proposed for measuring variations in the value of money does not obtrude itself too much if we only want to use them for solving practical problems of economic policy. Even if index numbers cannot fulfill the demands that theory has to make, they can still, in spite of their fundamental shortcomings and the inexactness of the methods by which they are actually determined, perform useful workaday services for the politician. 
If we have no other aim in view than the comparison of points of time that lie close to one another, then the errors that are involved in every method of calculating numbers may be so far ignored as to allow us to draw certain rough conclusions from them. Thus, for example, it becomes possible to a certain extent to span the temporal gap that lies in a period of variation in the value of money between movements of stock exchange rates and movements of the purchasing power that is expressed in the prices of commodities. In the same way, we can follow statistically the progress of variations in purchasing power from month to month. The practical utility of all these calculations for certain purposes is beyond doubt. They have proved their worth in quite recent events. But we should be aware of demanding more from them than they are able to perform. Chapter 6 the Social Consequences of Variations in the Objective Exchange Value of Money Section 1. The Exchange of Present Goods for Future Goods Variations in the objective exchange value of money evoke displacements in the distribution of income and property, on the one hand because individuals are apt to overlook the variability of the value of money, and on the other hand, because variations in the value of money do not affect all economic goods and services uniformly and simultaneously. For hundreds, even thousands of years, people completely failed to see that variations in the objective exchange value of money could be induced by monetary factors. They tried to explain all variations of prices exclusively from the commodity side. It was Baudin's great achievement to make the first attack upon this assumption, which then quickly disappeared from scientific literature. It long continued to dominate lay opinion, but nowadays it appears to be badly shaken even here. Nevertheless, when individuals are exchanging present goods against future goods, they do not take account in their valuations of variations in the objective exchange value of money. Lenders and borrowers are not in the habit of allowing for possible future fluctuations in the objective exchange value of money. Transactions in which present goods are exchanged for future goods also occur when a future obligation has to be fulfilled, not in money, but in other goods. Still more frequent are transactions in which the contracts do not have to be fulfilled by either party until a later point of time. All such transactions involve a risk, and this fact is well known to all contractors. When anybody buys or sells corn, cotton, or sugar futures, or when anybody enters into a long-term contract for the supply of coal, iron, or timber, he is well aware of the risks that are involved in the transaction. He will carefully weigh the chances of future variations in prices and often take steps by means of insurance or hedging transactions such as the technique of the modern exchange has developed to reduce the aleatory factor in his dealings. In making long-term contracts involving money, the contracting parties are generally unconscious that they are taking part in a speculative transaction. Individuals are guided in their dealings by the belief that money is stable in value, that its objective exchange value is not liable to fluctuations, at least so far as its monetary determinants are concerned. This is shown most clearly in the attitude assumed by legal systems with regard to the problem of the objective exchange value of money. In law, the objective exchange value of money is stable. It is sometimes asserted that legal systems adopt the fiction of the stability of the exchange value of money, but this is not true. In setting up a fiction, the law requires us to take an actual situation and imagine it to be different from what it really is, either by thinking of non-existing elements as added to it or by thinking of existing elements as removed from it, so as to permit the application of legal maxims which refer only to the situation as thus transformed. Its purpose in doing this is to make it possible to decide cases according to analogy when a direct ruling does not apply. The whole nature of legal fictions is determined by this purpose, and they are sustained only so far as it requires. The legislature and the judge always remain aware that the fictitious situation does not correspond to reality. 
So it is also with the so-called dogmatic fiction that is employed in jurisprudence to permit legal facts to be systematically classified and related to each other. Here again, the situation is thought of as existing, but it is not assumed to exist. The attitude of the law to money is quite a different matter. The jurist is totally unacquainted with the problem of the value of money. He knows nothing of the fluctuations in its exchange value. The naive popular belief in the stability of the value of money has been admitted with all its obscurity into the law, and no great historical cause of large and sudden variations in the sudden value of money has ever provided a motive for critical examination of the legal attitude towards the subject. The system of civil law had already been completed when Baudin set the example of attempting to trace back variations in the purchasing power of money to causes exerting their influence from the monetary side. In this matter, the discoveries of more modern economists have left no trace on the law. For the law, the invariability of the value of money is not a fiction, but a fact. All the same, the law does devote its attention to certain incidental questions of the value of money. It deals thoroughly with the question of how existing legal obligations and indebtednesses should be reckoned as affected by a transition from one currency to another. In earlier times, jurisprudence devoted the same attention to the royal debasement of the coinage as it was later to devote to the problems raised by the changing policies of the states in choosing first between credit money and metallic money, and then between gold and silver. Nevertheless, the treatment that these questions have received at the hands of the jurist has not resulted in recognition of the fact that the value of money is subject to continual fluctuation. In fact, the nature of the problem and the way in which it was dealt with made this impossible from the very beginning. It was treated not as a question of the attitude of the law towards variations in the value of money, but as a question of the power of the prince, or state, arbitrarily to modify existing obligations and thus to destroy existing rights. At one time this gave rise to the question of whether the legal validity of the money was determined by the stamp of the ruler of the country or by the metal content of the coin. Later, to the question of whether the command of the law or the free usage of business was to settle if the money was legal tender or not. The answer of public opinion, grounded on the principles of private property and the protection of acquired rights, ran the same in both cases. Prat quid contractum est, ita est solvi debit, ut cum re contraximus, re solvi debit, valuti cum mutum dedimus, ut retro pecunia, tantendum solvi debet. The proviso in this connection that nothing was to be regarded as money except what passed for such at the time when the transaction was entered into, and that the debt must be repaid not merely in the metal, but in the currency that was specified in the contract, followed from the popular view, regarded as the only correct one by all classes of the community, but especially by the tradesmen, that what was essential about a coin was its metallic content and that the stamp had no other significance than as an authoritative certificate of weight and fineness. It occurred to nobody to treat coins in business transactions any differently from other pieces of metal of the same weight and fineness. In fact, it is now removed beyond doubt that the standard was a metallic one. The view that in the fulfillment of obligations contracted in terms of money, the metallic content alone of the money was to be taken into account prevailed against the nominalistic doctrine expounded by the minting authorities. It is manifested in the legal measures taken for stabilizing the metal content of the coinage, and since the end of the 17th century, when currencies developed into systematic monetary standards, it has manifested in the legal measures taken for stabilizing the metal content of the coinage, and since the end of the 17th century, when currencies developed into systematic monetary standards, it has provided the criterion for determining the ratios between different coins of the same metal, when current simultaneously or successively, and for the attempts admittedly unsuccessful to combine the two precious metals in a uniform monetary system. Even the coming of credit money, 
and the problems that it raised could not direct the attention of jurisprudence to the question of the value of money. A system of paper money was thought of as according with the spirit of the law only if the paper money remained consistently equivalent to the metallic money to which it was originally equivalent, and which it had replaced, or if the metal content or metal value of the claims remained decisive in contracts of indebtedness. But the fact that the exchange value of even metallic money is liable to variation has continued to escape explicit legal recognition in public opinion. At least as far as gold is concerned, and no other metal need nowadays to be taken into consideration, there is not a single legal maxim that takes account of it, although it has been well known to economists for more than three centuries. In its naive belief in the stability of the value of money, the law is in complete harmony with public opinion. When any sort of differences arise between law and opinion, a reaction must necessarily follow. A movement sets in against that part of the law that is felt to be unjust. Such conflicts always tend to end in a victory of opinion over the law. Ultimately, the views of the ruling class become embodied in the law. The fact that it is nowhere possible to discover a trace of opposition to the attitude of the law on this question of the value of money shows clearly that its provisions relating to this matter cannot possibly be opposed to general opinion. That is to say, not only the law but public opinion also has never been troubled with the slightest doubt whatever concerning the stability of the value of money. In fact, so free has it been from doubts on this score that for an extremely long period money was regarded as the measure of value. And so, when anybody enters into a credit transaction that is to be fulfilled in money, it never occurs to him to take account of the future fluctuations in the purchasing power of money. Every variation in the exchange ratio between money and other economic goods shifts the position initially assumed by the parties to credit transactions in terms of money. An increase in the purchasing power of money is disadvantageous to the debtor and advantageous to the creditor. A decrease in the purchasing power has the contrary significance. If the parties to the contract took account of expected variations in the value of money when they exchanged present goods against future goods, these consequences would not occur. But it is true that neither the extent nor the direction of these variations can be foreseen. The variability of the purchasing power of money is only taken into account when attention is drawn to the problem by the coexistence of two or more sorts of money whose exchange ratio is liable to big fluctuations. It is generally known that possible future variations in foreign exchange rates are fully allowed for in the terms of credit transactions of all kinds. The part played by considerations of this sort, both in trade within countries, where more than one sort of money is in use, and in trade between countries with different currencies, is well known. But the allowance for the variability of the value of money in such cases is made in a fashion that is still not incompatible with the supposition that the value of money is stable. The fluctuations in value of one kind of money are measured by the equivalent of one of its units in terms of units of another kind of money. But the value of this other kind of money is, for its part, assumed to be stable. The fluctuations of the currency whose stability is in question are measured in terms of gold. But the fact that gold currencies are also liable to fluctuation is not taken into account. In their dealings, individuals allow for the variability of the objective exchange value of money, so far as they are conscious of it. But they are conscious of it only with regard to certain kinds of money, not with regards to all. Gold, the principal common medium of exchange nowadays, is thought of as stable in value. So far as variations of the objective exchange value of money are foreseen, they influence the terms of credit transactions. If a future fall in the purchasing power of the monetary unit has to be reckoned with, lenders must be prepared for the fact that the sum of money which a debtor repays at the conclusion of the transaction will have a smaller purchasing power than the sum originally lent. Lenders, in fact, would do better not to lend at all, but to buy other goods with their money. The contrary is true for debtors. 
If they buy commodities with the money they have to borrow and then sell them again after a time, they will retain a surplus over and above the sum that they have to pay back. The credit transaction results in a gain for them. Consequently, it is not difficult to understand that, so long as continued depreciation is to be reckoned with, those who lend money demand higher rates of interest, and those who borrow money are willing to pay the higher rates. If, on the other hand, it is expected that the value of money will increase, then the rate of interest will be lower than it would otherwise have been. Thus, if the direction and extent of variations in the exchange value of money could be foreseen, they would not be able to affect the relations between debtor and creditor. The coming alterations in purchasing power could be sufficiently allowed for in the original terms of the credit transaction. But since this assumption, even so far as fluctuations in credit money or fiat money relatively to gold money are concerned, never holds good, except in a most imperfect manner. The allowance made in debt contracts for future variations in the value of money is necessarily inadequate. While even nowadays, after the big and rapid fluctuations in the value of gold that have occurred since the outbreak of the World War, the great majority of those concerned in economic life, one might in fact say all of them, apart from the few who are acquainted with theoretical economics, are completely ignorant of the fact that the value of gold is variable. The value of gold currencies is still regarded as stable. Those economists who have recognized that the value of even the best money is variable have recommended that in settling the terms of a credit transaction, that is to say, the terms on which present goods are exchanged for future goods, the medium of exchange should not be one good alone, as is usual nowadays, but a bundle of goods. It is possible, in theory, if not in practice, to include all economic goods in such a bundle. If this proposal were adopted, money would still be used as a medium for the exchange of present goods, but in credit transactions, the outstanding obligation would be discharged not by payment of the nominal sum of money specified in the contract, but by payment of a sum of money with the purchasing power that the original sum had at the time when the contract was made. Thus, if the objective exchange value of money rises during the period of the contract, a correspondingly smaller sum of money will be payable, if it falls, a correspondingly larger sum. The arguments devoted above to the problem of measuring variations in the value of money show the fundamental inadequacy of these recommendations. If the prices of the various economic goods are given equal weight in the determination of the parity coefficients without consideration of their relative quantities, then the evils for which a remedy is sought may merely be aggravated. If variations in the prices of such commodities as wheat, rye, cotton, coal, and iron are given the same significance as variations in the prices of such commodities as pepper, opium, diamonds, or nickel, then the establishment of the tabular standard would have the effect of making the content of the long-term contract even more uncertain than at present. If what is called a weighted average is used, in which individual commodities have an effect proportioned to their significance, then the same consequences will still follow as soon as the conditions of production and consumption alter. For the subjective values attached by human beings to different economic goods are just as liable to constant fluctuation as are the conditions of production. But it is impossible to take account of this fact in determining the parity coefficients, because these must be invariable in order to permit connection with the past. It is probable that the immediate associations of any mention nowadays of the effects of variations in the value of money on existing debt relations will be in terms of the results of the monstrous experiments in inflation that have characterized the recent history of Europe. In all countries, during the latter part of this period, the jurists have thoroughly discussed the question of whether it would have been possible, or even whether it was still possible, by means of the existing law, or by creating new laws, to offset the injury done to creditors. In these discussions, it was usually overlooked that the variations in the content of debt contracts that were consequent upon the depreciation of money were due to the attitude towards the problem taken by the law itself. 
It is not as if the legal system were being invoked to remedy an inconvenience for which it was not responsible. It was just its own attitude that was felt to be an inconvenience, the circumstance that the government had brought about depreciation. For the legal maxim by which an inconvertible banknote is legal tender equally with the gold money that was in circulation before the outbreak of the war, with which it had nothing in common but the name Mark, is a part of the whole system of legal rules which allow the state to exploit its power to create new money as a source of income. It can no more be disassociated from this system than can the laws canceling the obligation of the banks to convert their notes and obliging them to make loans to the government by the issue of new notes. When jurists and businessmen assert that the depreciation of money has a very great influence on all kinds of debt relations, that it makes all kinds of business more difficult or even impossible, that it invariably leads to consequences that nobody desires and that everybody feels to be unjust, we naturally agree with them. In a social order that is entirely founded on the use of money and in which all accounting is done in terms of money, the destruction of the monetary system means nothing less than the destruction of the basis of all exchange. Nevertheless, this evil cannot be counteracted by ad hoc laws designed to remove the burden of the depreciation from single persons or groups of persons or classes of the community, and consequently to impose it all the more heavily on others. If we do not desire the pernicious consequences of depreciation, then we must make up our minds to oppose the inflationary policy by which the depreciation is created. It has been proposed that monetary liabilities should be settled in terms of gold and not according to their nominal amount. If this proposal were adopted, for each mark that had been borrowed, that sum would have to be repaid that could at the time of repayment buy the same weight of gold as one mark could at the time when the debt contract was entered into. The fact that such proposals are now put forward and meet with approval shows that etatism has already lost its hold on the monetary system and that inflationary policies are inevitably approaching their end. Even only a few years ago, such a proposal would either have been ridiculed or else branded as high treason. It is, by the way, characteristic that the first step towards enforcing the idea that the legal tender of paper money should be restricted to its market value was taken without exception in directions that were favorable to the national exchequer. To do away with the consequences of unlimited inflationary policy, one thing only is necessary. The renunciation of all inflationary measures. The problem which the proponents of the tabular standard seek to solve by means of a commodity currency supplementing the metallic currency, and which Irving Fisher seeks to solve by his proposals for stabilizing the purchasing power of money, is a different one that of dealing with variations in the value of gold. Section 2. Economic Calculation and Accountancy The naive conception of money as stable in value, or as a measure of value, is also responsible for economic calculation being carried out in terms of money. Even in other respects, accountancy is not perfect. The precision of its statements is only illusory. The valuations of goods and rights with which it deals are always based on estimates depending on more or less uncertain and unknown factors. So far as this uncertainty arises from the commodity side of the valuations, commercial practice, sanctioned by the law, attempts to get over the difficulty by the exercise of the greatest possible caution. With this purpose, it demands conservative estimates of assets and liberal estimates of liabilities, so that the merchant may be preserved from self-deceit about the success of his enterprise and his creditors protected. But there are also shortcomings in accountancy that are due to the uncertainty in its valuations that result from the liability to variation of the value of money itself. Of this, the merchant, the accountant, and the commercial court are alike unsuspicious. They hold money to be a measure of price and value, and they reckon as freely in monetary units as in units of length, area, capacity, and weight. 
and if an economist happens to draw their attention to the dubious nature of this procedure, they do not even understand the point of his remarks. This disregard of variations in the value of money in economic calculation falsifies accounts of profit and loss. If the value of money falls, ordinary bookkeeping, which does not take account of monetary depreciation, shows apparent profits because it balances against the sums of money received for sales a cost of production calculated in money of a higher value and because it writes off from book values originally estimated in money of a higher value items of money of a smaller value. What is thus improperly regarded as profit, instead of as part of capital, is consumed by the entrepreneur, or passed on either to the consumer in the form of price reductions that would not otherwise have been made, or to the laborer in the form of higher wages, and the government proceeds to tax it as income or profits. In any case, consumption of capital results from the fact that monetary depreciation falsifies capital accounting. Under certain conditions, the consequent destruction of capital and increase of consumption may be partly counteracted by the fact that the depreciation also gives rise to genuine profits, those of debtors, for example, which are not consumed but put into reserves. But this can never more than partly balance the destruction of capital induced by the depreciation. The consumers of the commodities that are sold too cheaply as a result of the false reckoning induced by the depreciation need not necessarily be inhabitants of the territory in which the depreciating money is used as a national currency. The price reductions brought about by currency depreciation encourage export to countries the value of whose money is either not falling at all or is at least falling less rapidly. The entrepreneur who is reckoning in terms of a currency with a stable value is unable to compete with the entrepreneur who is prepared to make a quasi-gift of part of his capital to his customers. In 1920 and 1921, Dutch traders who had sold commodities to Austria could buy them back again after a while, much cheaper than they had originally sold them because the Austrian traders completely failed to see that they were selling them for less than they had cost. So long as the true state of the case is not recognized, it is customary to rejoice in a naive, mercantilistic fashion over the increase of exports and see in the depreciation of money a welcome export premium. But once it is discovered that the source from whence this premium flows is the capital of the community, then the selling off procedure is usually regarded less favorably. Again, in importing countries, the public attitude wavers between indignation against dumping and satisfaction with the favorable conditions of purchase. Where the currency depreciation is a result of government inflation carried out by the issue of notes, it is possible to avert its disastrous effect on economic calculation by conducting all bookkeeping in a stable money instead. But so far as the depreciation is a depreciation of gold, the world money, there is no such easy way out. Section 3. Social Consequences of Variations in the Value of Money When Only One Kind of Money is Employed If we disregard the exchange of present goods for future goods, and restrict our considerations, for the time being, to those cases in which the only exchanges are those between present goods and present money, we shall at once observe a fundamental difference between the effects of an isolated variation in a single commodity price emanating solely from the commodity side and the effects of a variation in the exchange ratio between money and other economic goods in general emanating from the monetary side. Variations in the price of a single commodity influence the distribution of goods among individuals primarily because the commodity in question if it plays a part in the exchange transaction at all, is ex definitio, not distributed among individuals in proportion to their demands for it. There are economic agents who produce it, in the broadest sense of the word, so as to include dealers, and sell it, and there are economic agents who merely buy it and consume it. And it is obvious what effect would result from the displacement 
of the exchange ratio between this particular good and the other economic goods, including money. It is clear who would be likely to benefit by them and who would be injured. The effects of the case of money are different. As far as money is concerned, all economic agents are, to a certain extent, dealers. Every separate economic agent maintains a stock of money that corresponds to the extent and intensity with which he is able to express his demand for it in the market. If the objective exchange value of all stocks of money in the world could be instantaneously and in equal proportion increased or decreased, if all at once the money prices of all goods and services could rise or fall uniformly, the relative wealth of individual economic agents would not be affected. Subsequent monetary calculation would be in larger and smaller figures. That is all. The variation in the value of money would have no other significance than that of a variation in the calendar or of weights and measures. The social displacements that occur as consequences of variations in the value of money results solely from the circumstance that this assumption never holds good. In the cheaper dealing with the determinants of the objective exchange value of money, it was shown that variations in the value of money always start from a given point and gradually spread out from this point through the whole community. And this alone is why such variations have an effect on the social distribution of income. It is true that the variations in market exchange ratios that emanate from the commodity side are also not as a rule completed all at once. They also start at some particular point and then spread with greater or less rapidity. And because of this, price variations of this sort too are followed by consequences that are due to the fact that the variations in prices do not occur all at once but only gradually. But these are consequences that are encountered in a marked degree by a limited number of economic agents only, viz. those who, as dealers or producers, are sellers of the commodity in question. And further, this is not the sum of the consequences of variations in the objective exchange value of a commodity. When the price of coal falls because production has increased while demand has remained unaltered, then, for example, those retailers are involved who have taken supplies from the wholesale dealers at the old higher price, but are now able to dispose of them only at the new and lower price. But this alone will not account for all the social changes brought about by the increase of production of coal. The increase in the supply of coal will have improved the economic position of the community. The fall in the price of coal does not merely amount to a rearrangement of income and property between producer and consumer. It also expresses an increase in the national dividend and national wealth. Many have gained what none have lost. The case of money is different. The most important of the causes of a diminution in the value of money of which we have to take account is an increase in the stock of money while the demand for it remains the same or falls off, or, if it increases, at least increases less than the stock. The increase in the stock of money, as we have seen, starts with the original owners of the additional quantity of money and then transfers itself to those that deal with these persons, and so forth. A lower subjective valuation of money is then passed on from person to person because those who come into possession of an additional quantity of money are inclined to consent to pay higher prices than before. High prices lead to increased production and rising wages, and because all of this is generally regarded as a sign of economic prosperity, a fall in the value of money is, and always has been, considered an extraordinarily effective means of increasing economic welfare. This is a mistaken view for an increase in the quantity of money results in no increase of the stock of consumption goods at people's disposal. Its effect may well consist in an alteration of the distribution of economic goods among human beings, but in no case, apart from the incidental circumstance referred to on page 138 above, can it directly increase the total amount of goods possessed by human beings, or their welfare. It is true that this result may be brought about indirectly 
in the way in which any change in distribution may affect production as well, that is, by those classes in whose favor the redistribution occurs, using their additional command of money to accumulate more capital than would have been accumulated by those people from whom the money was withdrawn. But this does not concern us here. What we are concerned with is whether the variation in the value of money has any other economic significance than its effect on distribution. If it has no other economic significance, then the increase of prosperity can only be apparent, for it can only benefit a part of the community at the cost of a corresponding loss by the other part. And thus, in fact, the matter is. The cost must be borne by those classes or countries that are the last to be reached by the fall in the value of money. Let us, for instance, suppose that a new gold mine is opened in an isolated state. The supplementary quantity of gold that streams from it into commerce goes at first to the owners of the mine, and then by turns to those who have dealings with them. If we schematically divide the whole community into four groups, the mine owners, the producers of luxury goods, the remaining producers, and the agriculturalists, the first two groups will be able to enjoy the benefits resulting from the reduction in the value of money, the former of them to a greater extent than the latter. But even as soon as we reach the third group, the situation is altered. The profit obtained by this group as a result of the increased demands of the first two will already be offset, to some extent, by the rise in the prices of luxury goods which will have experienced the full effect of the depreciation by the time it begins to affect other goods. Finally, for the fourth group, the whole process will result in nothing but loss. The farmers will have to pay dearer for all industrial products before they are compensated by in the increased prices of agricultural products. It is true that when at last the prices of agricultural products do rise, the period of economic hardship for the farmers is over. But it will no longer be possible for them to secure profits that will compensate them for the losses they have suffered. That is to say, they will not be able to use their increased receipts to purchase commodities at prices corresponding to the old level of the value of money. For the increase of prices will already have gone through the whole community. Thus, the losses suffered by the farmers at the time when they still sold their products at the old low prices, but had to pay for the products of others at the new higher prices, remain uncompensated. It is these losses of the groups that are the last to be reached by the variation in the value of money which ultimately constitute the source of the profits made by the mine owners and the groups most closely connected with them. There is no difference between the effects on the distribution of income and wealth that are evoked by the fact that variations in the objective exchange value of money do not affect different goods and services at the same time and in the same degree whether the case is that of metallic money or that of fiat or credit money. When the increase of money proceeds by way of issue of currency notes or inconvertible bank notes, at first only certain economic agents benefit and the additional quantity of money only spreads gradually through the whole community. If, for example, there is an issue of paper money in time of war, the new notes will go first into the pockets of the war contractors. As a result, these persons' demands for certain articles will increase, and so also the price and the sale of these articles, but especially in so far as they are luxury articles. Thus, the position of the producers of these articles will be improved. Their demand for other commodities will also increase, and thus the increase of prices and sales will go on, distributing itself over a constantly augmented number of articles, until at last it has reached them all. In this case, as before, there are those who gain by inflation and those who lose by it. The sooner anybody is in a position to adjust his money income to its new value, the more favorable will be the process for him. Which persons, groups, and classes fare better in this, and which worse, depends upon the actual data of each individual case, without knowledge of which we are not in a position to form a judgment. Let us now leave the example of the isolated state and turn our attention to the international movements that arise from a fall in the value of money due to an increase in its amount. 
Here again, the process is the same. There is no increase in the available stock of goods, only its distribution is altered. The country in which the new mines are situated and the countries that deal directly with it have their position bettered by the fact that they are still able to buy commodities from other countries at the old lower prices at a time when depreciation at home has already occurred. Those countries that are the last to be reached by the new stream of money are those which must ultimately bear the cost of the increased welfare of the other countries. Thus, Europe made a bad bargain when the newly discovered gold fields of America, Australia, and South Africa evoked a tremendous boom in these countries. Palaces rose overnight where there was nothing a few years before but virgin forest and wilderness. The prairies were intersected with railways, and anything and everything in the way of luxury goods that could be produced by the old world found markets in territories which a little earlier had been populated by naked nomads and among people who in many cases had previously been without even the barest necessities of existence. All of this wealth was imported from the old industrial countries by the new colonists, the fortunate diggers, and paid for in gold that was spent as freely as it had been received. It is true that the prices paid for these commodities were higher than would have corresponded to the earlier purchasing power of money. Nevertheless, they were not so high as to make full allowance for the changed circumstances. Europe had exported ships and rails, metal goods and textiles, furniture and machines for gold, which it little needed or did not need at all, for what it had already was enough for all its monetary transactions. A diminution of the value of money brought about by any other kind of cause has an entirely similar effect. For the economic consequences of variations in the value of money are determined not by their causes, but by the nature of their slow progress, from person to person, from class to class, and from country to country. If we consider in particular those variations in the value of money which arise from the action of sellers in increasing prices, as described in the second chapter of this part, we shall find that the resultant gradual diminution of the value of money constitutes one of the motives of the groups which apparently dictate the rise of prices. The groups which begin the rise will have it turned to their own disadvantage when the other groups eventually raise their prices too but the former groups receive their higher prices at a time when the prices of things they buy are still at the lower level. This constitutes a permanent gain for them. It is balanced by the losses of those groups who are the last to raise the prices of their goods or services, for these already have to pay the higher prices at a time when they are still receiving only the lower prices for what they sell. And when they eventually raise their prices also, being the last to do this, they can no longer offset their earlier losses at the expense of other classes of the community. Wage laborers used to be in this situation because, as a rule, the price of labor did not share in the earlier stages of upward price movements. Here the entrepreneurs gained what the laborers lost. For a long time, civil servants were in the same situation, their multitudinous complaints were partly based on the fact that, since their money incomes could not easily be increased, they had largely to bear the cost of the continual rise in prices. But recently, this state of affairs has been changed through the organization of the civil servants on trades union lines, which has enabled them to secure a quicker response to demands for increases of salaries. The converse of what is true of a depreciation in the value of money holds for an increase in its value. Monetary appreciation, like monetary depreciation, does not occur suddenly and uniformly throughout a whole community, but as a rule starts from single classes and spreads gradually. If this were not the case, and if the increase in the value of money took place almost simultaneously in the whole community, if this were not the case, and if the increase in the value of money took place almost simultaneously in the whole community, then it would not be accompanied by the special kind of economic consequences that interest us here. Let us assume, for instance, that bankruptcy of the credit-issuing institutions of a country leads to a panic, and that everybody is ready to sell commodities at any price whatever, 
in order to put himself in possession of cash, while on the other hand, buyers cannot be found except at greatly reduced prices. It is conceivable that the increase in the value of money that would arise in the consequence of such a panic would reach all persons and commodities uniformly and simultaneously. As a rule, however, an increase in the value of money spreads only gradually. The first of those who have to content themselves with lower prices than before for the commodities they sell, while they still have to pay the old higher prices for the commodities they buy, are those who are injured by the increase in the value of money. Those, however, who are the last to have to reduce the prices of their commodities they sell, and have meanwhile been able to take advantage of the fall in the prices of other things, are those who profit by the change. Section 4. The Consequences of Variations in the Exchange Ratio Between Two Kinds of Money among other consequences of variations in the value of money, it is those of variations in the exchange ratio between two different kinds of money in which economic science has been chiefly interested. This interest has been aroused by the events of monetary history. In the course of the 19th century, international trade developed in a hitherto undreamed-of manner, and the economic connections between countries became extraordinarily close. Now, just at this time when the commercial relations were beginning to grow more active, the monetary standards of the individual states were becoming more diverse. A number of countries went over for a shorter or longer period to credit money, and the others, which were partly on gold and partly on silver, were soon in difficulties because the ratio between the values of these two precious metals, which had changed but slowly during the centuries, suddenly began to exhibit sharp variations. And in recent years, this problem has been given a much greater practical significance still by monetary happenings in the war and post-war periods. Let us suppose that one kilogram of silver had been exchangeable for 10 quintals of wheat, and that upon the objective exchange value of silver being halved, owing, say, to the discovery of new and prolific mines, one kilogram of it was no longer able to purchase more than five bushels of wheat. From what has been said on the natural exchange ratio of different kinds of money, it follows that the objective exchange value of silver in terms of other kinds of money would now also be halved. If it had previously been possible to purchase one kilogram of gold with 15 kilograms of silver, 30 kilograms would now be needed to make the same purchase, for the objective exchange value of gold in relation to commodities would have remained unchanged while that of silver had been halved. Now, this change in the purchasing power of silver over commodities will not occur all at once, but gradually. A full account has been given of the way in which it will start from a certain point and gradually spread outwards and of the consequences of this process. Until now, we have investigated these consequences only so far as they occur within an area with a uniform monetary standard. But now we must trace up the further consequences involved in commercial relations with areas in which other sorts of money are employed. One thing that was found to be true of the former case can be predicated of this also. If the variations in the objective exchange value of the money occurred uniformly as simultaneously throughout the whole community, then such social consequences could not appear at all. The fact that these variations always occur one after another is the sole reason for their remarkable economic effects. Variations in the objective exchange value of a given kind of money do not affect the determination of the exchange ratio between this and other kinds of money until they begin to affect commodities that either are already objects of commercial relations between the two areas, or at least are able to become such upon a moderate change in prices. The point of time at which this situation arises determines the effects upon the commercial relations of the two areas that will result from variations in the objective exchange value of money. These vary according as the prices of the commodities concerned in the international trade are adjusted to the new value of money before or after those of any other commodities. Under the modern organization of the monetary system, 
This adjustment is usually first made on the stock exchanges. Speculation on the foreign exchange and security markets anticipates coming variations in the exchange ratios between the different kinds of money at a time when the variations in the value of money have by no means completed their course through the community, perhaps when they have only just begun it, but in any case before they have reached the commodities that play a decisive part in foreign trade. He would be a poor speculator who did not grasp the course of events in time and act accordingly. But as soon as the variation in the foreign exchange rate has been brought about, it reacts upon foreign trade in a peculiar manner until the prices of all goods and services have been adjusted to the new objective exchange value of money. During this interval, the margins between the different prices and wages constitute a fund that somebody must receive and somebody surrender. In a word, we are here again confronted with a redistribution which is noteworthy in that its influence extends beyond the area where the good whose objective exchange value is changing is employed as domestic money. It is clear that this is the only sort of consequence that can follow from variations in the value of money. The social stock of goods has in no way been increased. The total quantity that can be distributed has remained the same. As soon as an uncompleted change in the objective exchange value of any particular kind of money becomes expressed in the foreign exchange rates, a new opportunity of making a profit is opened up, either for exporters or for importers, according as the purchasing power of money is decreasing or increasing. Let us take the former case, that of a diminution in the value of money. Since, according to our assumptions, the changes in domestic prices are not yet finished, Exporters derive an advantage from the circumstance that the commodities that they market already fetch a new higher price, whereas the commodities and services that they want themselves, and what is of particular importance, the material and personal factors of the production they employ, are still obtainable at the old lower prices. Who the exporter is, who pockets this gain, whether it is the producer or the dealer, is impertinent to our present inquiry. All that we need to know is that in the given circumstances, transactions will result in profit for some and loss for others. In any case, the exporter shares his profit with the foreign importer and foreign consumer. And it is even possible, this depends upon the organization of the export trade, that the profits which the exporter retains are only apparent, not real. Thus, the result is always that the gains of foreign buyers, which in certain cases are shared with home exporters, are counterbalanced by losses that are borne entirely at home. It is clear that what was said of the promotion of exportation by the falsification of monetary accounting applies also to the export premium arising from a diminution of the value of money. Chapter 7 Monetary Policy Section 1. Monetary Policy Defined The economic consequences of fluctuations in the objective exchange value of money have such important bearings on the life of the community and of the individual that as soon as the state had abandoned the attempt to exploit for fiscal ends its authority in monetary matters, and as soon as the large-scale development of the modern economic community had enabled the state to exert a decisive influence on the kind of money chosen by the market, it was an obvious step to think of attaining certain socio-political aims by influencing these consequences in a systematic manner. Modern currency policy is something essentially new. It differs fundamentally from earlier state activity in the monetary sphere, Previously, good government in monetary matters, from the point of view of the citizen, consisted in conducting the business of minting so as to furnish commerce with coins which could be accepted by everybody at their face value, and bad government in monetary matters, again from the point of view of the citizen, amounted to the betrayal by the state of the general confidence in it. But when states did debase the coinage, it was always from purely fiscal motives. The government needed financial help. That was all. It was not concerned with questions of currency policy. 
Questions of currency policy are questions of the objective exchange value of money. The nature of the monetary system affects a currency policy only insofar as it involves these particular problems of the value of money. It is only insofar as they bear upon these questions that the legal and technical characteristics of money are pertinent. Measures of currency policy are intelligible only in the light of their intended influence on the objective exchange value of money. They consequently comprise the antithesis of those acts of economic policy which aim at altering the money prices of single commodities or groups of commodities. Not every value problem connected with the objective exchange value of money is a problem of currency policy. In conflicts of currency policy, there are also interests involved which are not primarily concerned with the alteration of the value of money for its own sake, in the great struggle that was involved in the demonetization of silver and the consequent movement of the relative exchange ratio of the two precious metals, gold and silver, the owners of the silver mines and the other protagonists of the double standard or of the silver standard were not actuated by the same motives. While the latter wanted a change in the value of money in order that there might be a general rise in the prices of commodities, the former merely wished to raise the price of silver as a commodity by securing, or more correctly, regaining, an extensive market for it. Their interests were in no way different from those of producers of iron or oil in trying to extend the markets for iron or oil so as to increase the profitability of their businesses. It is true that this is a value problem, but it is a commodity value problem that of increasing the exchange value of the metal, silver, and not a problem of the value of money. But although this motive has played a part in currency controversy, it has been a very subordinate part. Even in the United States, the most important silver-producing area, it has been of significance only in as much as the generous practical encouragement of the silver magnates has been one of the strongest supports of the bimetallistic agitation. But most of the recruits to the silver camp were attracted not by the prospect of an increase in the value of the mines, which was a matter of indifference to them, but by the hope of a fall in the purchasing power of money from which they promised themselves miraculous results. If the increase in the price of silver could have been brought about in any other way than through the extension of its use as money, say by the creation of a new industrial demand, then the owners of the mines would have been just as satisfied. But the farmers and industrialists who advocated a silver currency would not have benefited from it in any way. And then they would undoubtedly have transferred their allegiance to other currency policies. Thus, in many states, paper inflationism was advocated partly as a forerunner of bimetallism and partly in combination with it. But even though questions of currency policy are never more than questions of the value of money, they are sometimes disguised so that their true nature is hidden from the uninitiated. Public opinion is dominated by erroneous views on the nature of money and its value, and misunderstood slogans have to take the place of clear and precise ideas. The fine and complicated mechanism of the money and credit system is wrapped in obscurity, the proceedings on the stock exchange are a mystery. The function and significance of banks elude interpretation. So, it is not surprising that the arguments brought forward in the conflict of the different interests often miss the point altogether. Counsel was darkened with cryptic phrases whose meaning was probably hidden even from those who uttered them. Americans spoke of the dollar of our fathers and Austrians of our dear gold gulden note. Silver, the money of the common man, was set up against gold, the money of the aristocracy. Many a tribune of the people, in many a passionate discourse, sounded the loud praises of silver, which, hidden in deep mines, lay awaiting the time when it should come forth into the light of day to ransom miserable humanity languishing in its wretchedness. And while some thus regarded gold as nothing less than the embodiment of the very principle of evil, all the more enthusiastically did others exalt the glistening yellow metal, which alone was worthy to be in the money of rich and mighty nations. 
It did not seem as if men were disputing about the distribution of economic goods. Rather, it was as if the precious metals were contending among themselves and against paper for the lordship of the market. All the same, it would be difficult to claim that these Olympic struggles were engendered by anything but the question of altering the purchasing power of money. Section 2. The Instruments of Monetary Policy The principal instrument of monetary policy at the disposal of the state is the exploitation of its influence on the choice of the kind of money, it has been shown above that the position of the state as controller of the mint and as issuer of money substitutes has allowed it in modern times to exert a decisive influence over individuals in their choice of the common medium of exchange. If the state uses this power systematically in order to force the community to accept a particular sort of money whose employment it desires for reasons of monetary policy, then it is actually carrying through a measure of monetary policy. The states which completed the transition to a gold standard a generation ago did so from motives of monetary policy. They gave up the silver standard or the credit money standard because they recognized that the behavior of the value of silver or of credit money was unsuited to the economic policy they were following. They adopted the gold standard because they regarded the behavior of the value of gold as relatively the most suitable for carrying out their monetary policies. If a country has a metallic standard, then the only measure of currency policy that it can carry out by itself is to go over to another kind of money. It is otherwise with credit money and fiat money. Here the state is able to influence the movement of the objective exchange value of money by increasing or decreasing its quantity. It is true that the means is extremely crude and that the extent of its consequences can never be foreseen, but it is easy to apply and popular on account of its drastic effects. Section 3. Inflationism Inflationism is that monetary policy that seeks to increase the quantity of money. Naive inflationism demands an increase in the quantity of money without suspecting that this will diminish the purchasing power of the money. It wants more money because, in its eyes, the mere abundance of money is wealth, fiat money. Let the state create money and make the poor rich and free them from the bonds of the capitalists. How foolish to forego the opportunity of making everybody rich and consequently happy that the state's right to create money gives it. How wrong to forego it simply because this would run counter to the interests of the rich. How wicked of the economists to assert that it is not within the power of the state to create wealth by means of the printing press. You statesmen want to build railways and complain of the low state of the exchequer, well then, do not beg loans from the capitalist and anxiously calculate whether your railways will bring in enough to enable you to pay interest and amortization on your debt. Create money and help yourselves. Other inflationists realize very well that an increase in the quantity of money reduces the purchasing power of the monetary unit. But they endeavor to secure inflation nonetheless because of its effect on the value of money they want depreciation, because they want to favor debtors at the expense of creditors, and because they want to encourage exportation and make importation difficult. Others, again, recommend depreciation for the sake of its supposed property of stimulating production and encouraging the spirit of enterprise. Depreciation of money can benefit debtors only when it is unforeseen. If inflationary measures and a reduction of the value of money are expected, then those who lend money will demand higher interest in order to compensate their probable loss of capital, and those who seek loans will be prepared to pay the higher interest rate because they have a prospect of gaining on capital account. Since, as we have shown, it is never possible to foresee the extent of monetary depreciation, Creditors in individual cases may suffer losses, and debtors make profits, in spite of the higher interest exacted. 
Nevertheless, in general, it will not be possible for any inflationary policy, unless it takes effect suddenly and unexpectedly, to alter the relations between creditor and debtor in favor of the latter by increasing the quantity of money. Those who lend money will feel obliged, in order to avoid losses, either to make their loans in a currency that is more stable in value than the currency of their own country, or else to include in the rate of interest, they ask, over and above the compensation that they reckon for the probable depreciation of money and the loss to be expected on that account, an additional premium for the risk of a less probable further depreciation. And if those who were seeking credit were inclined to refuse to pay this additional compensation, the diminution of supply in the loan market would force them to it. During the inflation after the war, it was seen how savings deposits decreased because savings banks were not inclined to adjust interest rates to the altered conditions of the variations in the purchasing power of money. It has already been shown in the preceding chapter that it is a mistake to think that the depreciation of money stimulates production. If the particular conditions of a given case of depreciation are such that wealth is transferred to the rich from the poor, then admittedly saving, and consequently capital accumulation, will be encouraged. Production will consequently be stimulated, and so the welfare of posterity increased. In earlier epochs of economic history, a moderate inflation may sometimes have had this effect. But the more the development of capitalism has made money loans, bank and savings bank deposits and bonds, especially bearer bonds and mortgage bonds, the most important instruments of savings, the more has depreciation necessarily imperiled the accumulation of capital by decreasing the motive for saving. How the depreciation of money leads to capital consumption through falsification of economic calculation and how the depreciation of the money really reacts on foreign trade has similarly been explained already in the preceding chapter. A third group of inflationists do not deny that inflation involves serious disadvantages. Nevertheless, they think that there are higher and more important aims of economic policy than a sound monetary system. They hold that although inflation may be a great evil, yet it is not the greatest evil, and that the state might under certain circumstances find itself in a position where it would do well to oppose greater evils with the lesser evil of inflation. When the defense of the fatherland against enemies, or the rescue of the hungry from starvation is at stake, then it is said, let the currency go to ruin whatever the cost. Sometimes this sort of conditional inflation is supported by the argument that inflation is a kind of taxation that is advisable in certain circumstances. Under some conditions, according to this argument, it is better to meet public expenditure by a fresh issue of notes than by increasing the burden of taxation or by borrowing. This was the argument put forward during the war, when the expenditure on the army and navy had to be met and this was the argument put forward in Germany and Austria after the war when a part of the population had to be provided with cheap food. The losses on the operation of the railways and other public undertakings met and reparation payments made. The assistance of inflation is invoked whenever a government is unwilling to increase taxation or unable to raise a loan. That is the truth of the matter. The next step is to inquire why the two usual methods of raising money for public purposes cannot or will not be employed. It is only possible to levy high taxes when those who bear the burden of the taxes assent to the purpose for which the resources, so raised, are to be expended. It must be observed here that the greater the total burden of taxation becomes, the harder it is to deceive public opinion as to the impossibility of placing the whole burden of taxation upon the small, richer class of the community. The taxation of the rich, or of property, affects the whole community, and its ultimate consequences for the poorer classes are often more severe than those of taxation levied throughout the community. These implications may perhaps be harder to grasp when taxation is low but when it is high they can hardly fail to be recognized. 
There can, moreover, be no doubt that it is scarcely possible to carry the system of relying chiefly upon taxation of ownership any farther than it has been carried by the inflating countries, and that the incidence of further taxation could not have been concealed in the way necessary to guarantee continued popular support. Who has any doubt that the belligerent peoples of Europe would have tired of war much more quickly if their governments had clearly and candidly laid before them at the time the account of their war expenditure? In no European country did the war party dare to impose taxation on the masses, to any considerable extent, for meeting the cost of the war. Even in England, the classical country of sound money, the printing presses were set in motion. Inflation had the great advantage of evoking an appearance of economic prosperity and of increase of wealth, of falsifying calculations made in terms of money, and so of concealing the consumption of capital. Inflation gave rise to the pseudo-profits of the entrepreneur and capitalist, which could be treated as income and have specially heavy taxes imposed upon them without the public at large, or often even the actual taxpayers themselves, seeing that portions of capital were thus being taxed away. Inflation made it possible to divert the fury of the people to speculators and profiteers. Thus it proved itself an excellent psychological resource of the destructive and annihilist war policy. What war began, revolution continued. The socialistic or semi-socialistic state needs money in order to carry on undertakings which do not pay, to support the unemployed, and to provide the people with cheap food. It also is unable to secure the necessary resources by means of taxation. It dare not tell the people the truth. The state socialist principle of running the railways as a state institution would soon lose its popularity if it was proposed, say, to levy a special tax for covering their running losses. And the German and Austrian people would have been quicker in realizing where the resources came from that made bread cheaper if they themselves had had to supply them in the form of a bread tax. In the same way, the German government that decided for the policy of fulfillment in opposition to the majority of the German people was unable to provide itself with the necessary means except by printing notes. And when passive resistance in the Ruhr district gave rise to a need for enormous sums of money, these again, for political reasons, were only to be procured with the help of the printing press. A government always finds itself obliged to resort to inflationary measures when it cannot negotiate loans and dare not levy taxes because it has reason to fear that it will forfeit approval of the policy it is following if it reveals too soon the financial and general economic consequences of that policy. Thus, inflation becomes the most important psychological resource of any economic policy whose consequences have to be concealed. And so, in this sense, it can be called an instrument of unpopular, i.e. of anti-democratic policy, since by misleading public opinion it makes possible the continued existence of a system of government that would have no hope of the consent of the people if the circumstances were clearly laid before them. That is the political function of inflation. It explains why inflation has always been an important resource of policies of war and revolution, and why we also find it in the service of socialism. When governments do not think it necessary to accommodate their expenditures to their revenue and arrogate to themselves the right of making up the deficit by issuing notes, their ideology is merely a disguised absolutism. The various aims pursued by inflationists demand that inflationary measures shall be carried through in various special ways, if depreciation is wanted in order to favor the debtor at the expense of the creditor, then the problem is to strike unexpectedly at creditor interests. As we have shown, to the extent to which it could be foreseen, an expected depreciation would be incapable of altering the relations between creditors and debtors. A policy aiming at a progressive diminution of the value of money does not benefit debtors. If, on the other hand, the depreciation is desired in order to stimulate production and to make exportation easier 
and importation more difficult in relation to other countries, then it must be borne in mind that the absolute level of the value of money, its purchasing power in terms of commodities and services, and its exchange ratio against other kinds of money, is without significance for external as for internal trade. The variations in the objective exchange value of money have an influence on business only so long as they are in progress. The beneficial effects on trade of the depreciation of money only last so long as the depreciation has not affected all commodities and services. Once the adjustment is completed, then these beneficial effects disappear. If it is desired to retain them permanently, continual resort must be had to fresh diminutions of the purchasing power of money. It is not enough to reduce the purchasing power of money by one set of measures only, as is erroneously supposed by numerous inflationist writers. Only the progressive diminution of the value of money could permanently achieve the aims which they have in view. But a monetary system that corresponds to these requirements can never be actually realized. Of course, the real difficulty does not lie in the fact that a progressive diminution of the value of money must soon reach amounts so small that they would no longer meet the requirements of commerce. Since the decimal system of calculation is customary in the majority of present-day monetary systems, even the more stupid sections of the public would find no difficulty in the new reckoning when a system of higher units was adopted. We could, quite easily, imagine a monetary system in which the value of money was constantly falling at the same proportionate rate. Let us assume that the purchasing power of this money, through variations in the determinants that lie on the side of money, sinks in the course of a year by one-hundredth of its amount at the beginning of the year. The levels of the value of the money at each new year then constitute a diminishing geometrical series. If we put the value of the money at the beginning of the first year as equivalent to 100, then the ratio of diminution is equivalent to 0.99, and the value of money at the end of the nth year is equivalent to 100, times 0.99 n minus 1. Such a convergent geometrical progression gives an infinite series, any member of which is always to the next following member in the ratio of 100 to 99. We could quite easily imagine a monetary system based on such a principle, perhaps even more easily still if we increased the ratio, say to 0.995, or even 0.9975. But however clearly we may be able to imagine such a monetary system, it certainly does not lie in our power actually to create one like it. We know the determinants of the value of money, or think we know them, but we are not in a position to bend them to our will. For we lack the most important prerequisite for this. We do not so much as know the quantitative significance of variations in the quantity of money. We cannot calculate the intensity with which definite quantitative variations in the ratio of the supply of money and the demand for it operate upon the subjective valuations of individuals and through these indirectly upon the market. This remains a matter of very great uncertainty. In employing any means to influence the value of money, we run the risk of giving the wrong dose. This is all the more important since, in fact, it is not possible even to measure variations in the purchasing power of money. Thus, even though we can roughly tell the direction in which we should work in order to obtain the desired variation, we still have nothing to tell us how far we should go and we can never find out where we are already. What effects our intervention has had, or how these proportioned to the effects we desire? Now the danger involved in overdoing an arbitrary influence, a political influence, i.e. one arising from the conscious intervention of human organizations upon the value of money, must by no means be underestimated particularly in the case of the diminution of the value of money. Big variations in the value of money give rise to the danger that commerce will emancipate itself from the money which is subject to state influence 
and choose a special money of its own. But without matters going so far as this, it is still possible for all the consequences of variations in the value of money to be eliminated, if the individuals engaged in economic activity clearly recognize that the purchasing power of money is constantly sinking and act accordingly. If in all business transactions they allow for what the objective exchange value of money will probably be in the future, then all the effects on credit and commerce are finished with. In proportion as the Germans began to reckon in terms of gold, so was further depreciation rendered incapable of altering the relationship between creditor and debtor, or even of influencing trade. By going over to reckoning in terms of gold, the community freed itself from the inflationary policy of the government. Thus, it checkmated this inflationary policy, and eventually, even the government was obliged to acknowledge gold as a basis of reckoning. A danger necessarily involved in all attempts to carry out an inflationary policy is that of excess. Once the principle is admitted that it is possible, permissible, and desirable to take measures for cheapening money, then immediately the most violent and bitter controversy will break out as to how far this principle is to be carried. The interested parties will differ not merely about the steps still to be taken, but also about the results of the steps that have been taken already. It would be practically impossible so much as to consider counsels of moderation. And these difficulties arise even in the case of an attempt to secure what the inflationists call the beneficial effects of a single and isolated depreciation. Even in the case, say, of assisting production or debtors after a serious crisis by a single depreciation of the value of money, the same problems remain to be solved. They are difficulties that have to be reckoned with by every policy aiming at a reduction of the value of money. Consistently and uninterruptedly, continued inflation must eventually lead to collapse. The purchasing power of money will fall lower and lower until it eventually disappears altogether. It is true that an endless process of depreciation can be imagined. We can imagine the purchasing power of money getting continually lower without ever disappearing altogether, and prices getting continually higher without it ever becoming impossible to obtain commodities in exchange for notes. Eventually, this would lead to a situation in which even retail transactions were in terms of millions and billions and even higher figures but the monetary system itself would remain. But such an imaginary state of affairs is hardly within the bounds of possibility. In the long run, a money which continually fell in value would have no commercial utility. It could not be used as a standard of deferred payments. For all transactions in which commodities or services were not exchanged for cash, another medium would have to be sought. In fact, a money that is continually depreciating becomes useless even for cash transactions. Everybody attempts to minimize his cash reserves, which are a source of continual loss. Incoming money is spent as quickly as possible, and in the purchases that are made in order to obtain goods with a stable value in place of the depreciating money, even higher prices will be agreed to than would otherwise be in accordance with market conditions at the time. When the commodities that are not needed at all, or at least not at the moment, are purchased in order to avoid the holding of notes, then the process of extrusion of the notes from use as a general medium of exchange has already begun. It is the beginning of the demonetization of the notes. The process is hastened by its panic-like character. It may be possible once, twice, perhaps even three or four times, to allay the fears of the public, but eventually the affair must run its course and then there is no longer any going back. Once the depreciation is proceeding so rapidly that sellers have to reckon with considerable losses even if they buy again as quickly as is possible, then the position of the currency is hopeless. In all countries where inflation has been rapid, it has been observed that the decrease in the value of the money has occurred faster than the increase in its quantity. 
If M represents the nominal amount of money present in the country before the beginning of the inflation, P the value of the money unit, then in terms of gold, capital M the nominal amount of money at a given point in time during the inflation, and P the value in gold of the monetary unit at this point of time, then, as has often been shown by simple statistical investigation, small m capital P is greater than capital M small p. It has been attempted to prove from this that the money has depreciated too rapidly and that the level of the rate of exchange is not justified. Many have drawn from it the conclusion that the quantity theory is obviously not true and that depreciation of money cannot be a result of an increase in its quantity. Others have conceded the truth of the quantity theory in its primitive form and argued the permissibility or even the necessity of continuing to increase the quantity of money in the country until its total gold value is restored to the level at which it stood before the beginning of the inflation, i.e., until capital M, small p, equals small m, capital P. The error that is concealed in all of this is not difficult to discover. We may completely ignore the fact, already referred to, that the exchange rates, including the bullion rate, move in advance of the purchasing power of the money unit as expressed in the prices of commodities, so that the gold value must not be taken as a basis of operations, but purchasing power in terms of commodities which, as a rule, will not have decreased to the same extent as the gold value. For this form of calculation, too, in which capital P and small p do not represent value in terms of gold, but purchasing power in terms of commodities, would still, as a rule, give the result small p capital P is greater than capital M small p. But it must be observed that, as the depreciation of money proceeds, the demand for money— i.e., for the kind of money in question, gradually begins to fall. When loss of wealth is suffered in proportion to the length of time money is kept on hand, endeavors are made to reduce cash holdings as much as possible. Now, if every individual, even if his circumstances are otherwise unchanged, no longer wishes to maintain his cash holding at the same level as before the beginning of the inflation, the demand for money in the whole community which can only be the sum of the individual's demands, decreases too. There is also the additional fact that as commerce gradually begins to use foreign money and actual gold in place of notes, individuals begin to hold part of their reserves in foreign money and in gold and no longer in notes. An expected fall in the value of money is anticipated by speculation so that the money has a lower value in the present than would correspond to the relationship between the immediate supply of it and demand for it. Prices are asked and given that are not related to the present amount of money in circulation, nor to the present demands for money, but to future circumstances. The panic prices paid when the shops are crowded with buyers anxious to pick up something or other while they can and the panic rates reached on the exchange when foreign currencies and securities that do not represent a claim to fixed sums of money rise precipitately, anticipate the march of events. But there is not enough money available to pay the prices that correspond to the presumable future supply of money and demand for it. And so it comes about that commerce suffers from a shortage of notes, that there are not enough notes on hand for fulfilling commitments that have been entered into. The mechanism of the market that adjusts to the total demand and the total supply to each other by altering the exchange ratio no longer functions as far as the exchange ratio between money and other economic goods is concerned. This bad state of affairs, once matters have gone as far as this, can in no way be helped. Still further to increase the note issue, as many recommend, would only make matters worse. For, since this would accelerate the growth of the panic, it would also accentuate the maladjustment between depreciation and circulation. Shortage of notes for transacting business is a symptom of an advanced stage of inflation. It is the reserve aspect of panic purchases and panic prices 
the reflection of the bullishness of the public that will finally lead to catastrophe. The emancipation of commerce from a money which is proving more and more useless in this way begins with the expulsion of the money from hoards. People begin at first to hoard other money instead so as to have marketable goods at their disposal for an unforeseen future need, perhaps precious metal money and foreign notes and sometimes also domestic notes of other kinds which have a higher value because they cannot be increased by the state e.g. the Romanov ruble in Russia or the blue money of communist Hungary. Then ingots, precious stones and pearls, even pictures, other objects of art and postage stamps. A further step is the adoption of foreign currency or metallic money, i.e. for all practical purposes gold, in credit transactions. Finally, when the domestic currency ceases to be used in retail trade, Wages, as well, have to be paid in some other way than in pieces of paper, which are then no longer good for anything. The collapse of an inflation policy carried to its extreme, as in the United States in 1781 and France in 1796, does not destroy the monetary system, but only the credit money or fiat money of the state that has overestimated the effectiveness of its own policy, the collapse emancipates commerce from etatism and establishes metallic money again. It is not the business of science to criticize the political aims of inflationism. Whether the favoring of the debtor at the expense of the creditor, whether the facilitation of exports and the hindrance of imports, whether the stimulation of production by transferring wealth and income to the entrepreneur are to be recommended or not, are questions which economics cannot answer. With the instruments of monetary theory alone, these questions cannot even be elucidated as far as is possible with other parts of the apparatus of economics. But there are, nevertheless, three conclusions that seem to follow from our critical examination of the possibilities of inflationary policy. In the first place, all the aims of inflationism can be secured by other sorts of intervention in economic affairs and secured better and without undesirable incidental effects. If it is desired to relieve debtors, moratoria may be declared or the obligation to repay loans may be removed altogether. If it is desired to encourage exportation, export premiums may be granted. If it is desired to render importation more difficult, simple prohibition may be resorted to, or import duties levied. All these measures permit discrimination between classes of people, branches of production, and districts, and this is impossible for an inflationary policy. Inflation benefits all debtors, including the rich, and injures all creditors, including the poor. Adjustment of the burden of debts by special legislation allows of differentiation. Inflation encourages the exportation of all commodities and hinders all importation. Premiums, duties, and prohibitions can be employed discriminatorily. Secondly, there is no kind of inflationary policy the extent of whose effects cannot be foreseen. And finally, continued inflation must lead to a collapse. Thus we see that, considered purely as a political instrument, inflationism is inadequate. It is, technically regarded, bad policy because it is incapable of fully attaining its goal and because it leads to consequences that are not, or at least are not always, part of its aim. The favor it enjoys is due solely to the circumstance that it is a policy concerning whose aims and intentions public opinion can be longest deceived. Its popularity, in fact, is rooted in the difficulty of fully understanding its consequences. Section 4. Restrictionism or Deflationism That policy which aims at raising the objective exchange value of money is called, after the most important means at its disposal, restrictionism or deflationism. This nomenclature does not really embrace all the policies that aim at an increase in the value of money. The aim of restrictionism may also be attained by not increasing the quantity of money when the demand for it increases, 
or by not increasing it enough. This method has quite often been adopted as a way of increasing the value of money in face of the problems of a depreciated credit money standard. Further increase of the quantity of money has been stopped, and the policy has been to wait for the effects on the value of money of an increasing demand for it. In the following discussion, following a widespread custom, we shall use the terms restrictionism and deflationism to refer to all policies directed to raising the value of money. The existence and popularity of inflationism is due to the circumstance that it taps new sources of public revenue. Governments had inflated from fiscal motives long before it occurred to anybody to justify their procedure from the point of view of monetary policy. Inflationistic arguments have always been well supported by the fact that inflationary measures not only do not impose any burden on the national exchequer, but actually bring resources to it. Looked at from the fiscal point of view, inflationism is not merely the cheapest economic policy. It is also, at the same time, a particularly good remedy for a low state of public finances. Restrictionism, however, demands positive sacrifices from the national exchequer when it is carried out by the withdrawal of notes from circulation, say, through the issue of interest-bearing bonds or through taxation, and their cancellation, and at least it demands from it a renunciation of potential income by forbidding the issue of notes at a time when the demand for money is increasing. This alone would suffice to explain why restrictionism has never been able to compete with inflationism. Nevertheless, the unpopularity of restrictionism has other causes as well. Attempts to raise the objective exchange value of money in the circumstances that have existed have necessarily been limited either to single states or to a few states and at the best have had only a very small prospect of simultaneous realization throughout the whole world. Now, as soon as a single country or a few countries go over to a money with a rising purchasing power, while the other countries retain a money with a falling or stationary exchange value, or one which, although it may be rising in value, is not rising to the same extent, then, as has been demonstrated above, the conditions of international trade are modified. In the country whose money is rising in value, exportation becomes more difficult and importation easier. But the increased difficulty of exportation and the increased tacility of importation, in brief, the deterioration of the balance of trade, has usually been regarded as an unfavorable situation and consequently has been avoided. This alone would provide an adequate explanation of the unpopularity of measures intended to raise the purchasing power of money. But furthermore, quite apart from any consideration of foreign trade, an increase in the value of money has not been to the advantage of the ruling classes. Those who get an immediate benefit from such an increase are all those who are entitled to receive fixed sums of money. Creditors gain at the expense of debtors. Taxation, it is true, becomes more burdensome as the value of money rises, but the greater part of the advantage of this is secured not by the state, but by its creditors. Now policies favoring creditors at the expense of debtors have never been popular. Lenders of money have been held in odium at all times and among all peoples. Generally speaking, the class of persons who draw their income exclusively or largely from the interest on capital lent to others has not been particularly numerous or influential at any time in any country. A not insignificant part of the total income from the lending of capital is received by persons whose incomes chiefly arise from other sources and in whose budgets it plays only a subordinate part. This is the case, for instance, not only of the laborers, peasants, small industrialists, and civil servants who possess savings that are invested in savings deposits or in bonds, but also of the numerous big industrialists, wholesalers, or shareholders who also own large amounts of bonds. 
The interests of all of these as lenders of money are subordinate to their interests as landowners, merchants, manufacturers, or employees. No wonder, then, that they are not very enthusiastic about attempts to raise the level of interest. Restrictionistic ideas have never met with any measure of popular sympathy except after a time of monetary depreciation when it has been necessary to decide what should take the place of the abandoned inflationary policy. They have hardly ever been seriously entertained except as part of the alternative, stabilization of money at the present value or revaluation at the level that it had before the inflation, when the question arises in this form, the reasons that are given for the restoration of the old metal parity start from the assumption that notes are essentially promises to pay so much metallic money. Credit money has always originated in a suspension of the convertibility into cash of treasury notes or bank notes. Sometimes the suspension was even extended to token coins or to bank deposits that were previously convertible at any time on the demand of the bearer and were already in circulation. Now, whether the original obligation of immediate conversion was expressly laid down by the law or merely founded on custom, the suspension of conversion has always taken on the appearance of a breach of the law that could perhaps be excused, but not justified. For the coins or notes that became credit money through the suspension of cash payment could never have been put into circulation otherwise than as money substitutes, as secure claims to a sum of commodity money payable on demand. Consequently, the suspension of immediate convertibility has always been decreed as a merely temporary measure and prospect held out of its future rescission. But if credit money is thought of as only a promise to pay, devaluation cannot be regarded as anything but a breach of the law or as meaning anything less than national bankruptcy. Yet credit money is not merely an acknowledgment of indebtedness and a promise to pay. As money, it has a different standing in the transactions of the market. It is true that it could not have become a money substitute unless it had constituted a claim. Nevertheless, at the moment when it became actual money, credit money, even if through a breach of the law, it ceased to be valued with regard to the more or less uncertain prospect of its future full conversion and began to be valued for the sake of the monetary function that it performed. Its far lower value as an uncertain claim to a future cash payment has no significance so long as its higher value as a common medium of exchange is taken into account. It is therefore quite beside the point to interpret devaluation as national bankruptcy. The stabilization of the value of money at its present lower level is, even when regarded merely with a view to its effects on existing debt relations, something other than this. It is both more and less than national bankruptcy. It is more, for it affects not merely public debts, but also private debts. It is less, for one thing, because it also affects those claims of the state that are in terms of credit money, while not affecting such of its obligations as are in terms of cash, metallic money, or foreign currency, and for another thing, because it involves no modification of the relations of the parties to any contract of indebtedness in terms of credit money, made at a time when the currency stood at a low level, without the parties having reckoned on an increase of the value of money. When the value of money is increased, then those are enriched who at the time possess credit money or claims to credit money. Their enrichment must be paid for by debtors, among them the state, i.e. the taxpayers. Yet those who are enriched by the increase in the value of money are not the same as those who were injured by the depreciation of money in the course of the inflation. And those who must bear the cost of the policy of raising the value of money are not the same as those who benefited by its depreciation. To carry out a deflationary policy is not to do away with the consequences of inflation. You cannot make good an old breach of the law by committing a new one. And as far as debtors are concerned, restriction is a breach of the new law. 
If it is desired to make good the injury which has been suffered by creditors during the inflation, this can certainly not be done by restriction. In the simpler circumstances of an undeveloped credit system, the attempt has been made to find a way out of the difficulty by conversion of the debts contracted before and during the period of inflation, every debt being recalculated in terms of devaluated money according to the value of the credit money in terms of metallic money on the day of origin. Supposing, for instance, that the metallic money had been depreciated to one-fifth of its former value, a borrower of 100 gulden before the inflation would have to pay back after the stabilization not 100 gulden, but 500, together with interest on the 500, and a borrower of 100 gulden at a time when the credit money had already sunk to half of its nominal value would have to pay interest on and pay back 250 gulden. This, however, only covers debt obligations which are still current. The debts which have already been settled in the depreciated money are not affected. No notice is taken of sales and purchases of bonds and other claims to fixed sums of money. And in an age of bearer bonds, this is a quite particularly serious shortcoming. Finally, this sort of regulation is inapplicable to current account transactions. It is not our business here to discuss whether something better than this could have been thought of. In fact, if it is possible to make any sort of reparation of the damage suffered by creditors at all, it must clearly be sought by way of some such methods of recalculation. But in any case, increasing the purchasing power of money is not a suitable means to this end. Considerations of credit policy also are adduced in favor of increasing the value of money to the metal parity that prevailed before the beginning of the period of inflation. A country that has injured its creditors through depreciation brought about by inflation, it is said, cannot restore the shattered confidence in its credit otherwise than by a return to the old level of prices. In this way alone can those from whom it wishes to obtain new loans be satisfied as to the future security of their claims, the bondholders will be able to assume that any possible fresh inflation would not ultimately reduce their claims because after the inflation was over, the original metal parity would presumably be returned to. This argument has a peculiar significance for England. Among those most important sources of income is the position in the City of London as the world's banker. All those who availed themselves of the English banking system, it is said, ought to be satisfied as to the future security of their English deposits in order that the English banking business should not be diminished by mistrust in the future of the English currency. As always, in the case of considerations of credit policy like this, a good deal of rather dubious psychology is assumed in this argument. It may be that there are more effectual ways of restoring confidence in the future than by measures that do not benefit some of the injured creditors at all, those who have already disposed of their claims, and do benefit many creditors who have not suffered any injury, those who acquired their claims after the depreciation began. In general, therefore, it is impossible to regard as decisive the reasons that are given in favor of restoring the value of money at the level that it had before the commencement of the inflationary policy, especially as consideration of the way in which trade is affected by a rise in the value of money suggests a need for caution. Only where and so far as prices are not yet completely adjusted to the relationship between the stock of money and the demand for it, which has resulted from the increase in the quantity of money, is it possible to proceed to a restoration of the old parity without encountering a too violent opposition? Section 5. Invariability of the Objective Exchange Value of Money as the Aim of Monetary Policy Thus endeavors to increase or decrease the objective exchange value of money prove impracticable. A rise in the value of money leads to consequences which, as a rule, seem to be desired by only a small section of the community. 
A policy with this aim is contrary to interests which are too great for it to be able to hold its own against them in the long run. The kinds of intervention which aim at decreasing the value of money seem more popular, but their goal can be more easily and more satisfactorily reached in other ways, while their execution meets with quite insuperable difficulties. Thus, nothing remains but to reject both the augmentation and diminution of the objective exchange value of money. This suggests the ideal of a money with an invariable exchange rate so far as the monetary influences on its value are concerned. But this is the ideal money of enlightened statesmen and economists, not that of the multitude. The latter thinks in far too confused a manner to be able to grasp the problems here involved. It must be confessed that they are the most difficult in economics. For most people, so far as they do not incline to inflationistic ideas, that money seems to be the best whose subjective exchange value is not subject to any variation at all, whether originating on the monetary side or on the commodity side. The ideal of a money with an exchange value that is not subject to variations due to changes in the ratio between the supply of money and the need for it, i.e. a money with an invariable inier objective Tauschwert, demands the intervention of a regulating authority in the determination of the value of money and its continued intervention. But here immediately most serious doubts arise from the circumstance already referred to that we have no useful knowledge of the quantitative significance of any given measures intended to influence the value of money. More serious still is the circumstance that we are by no means in a position to determine with precision whether variations have occurred in the exchange value of money from any cause whatever, and, if so, to what extent quite apart from the question of whether such changes have been effected by influences working from the monetary side. Attempts to stabilize the exchange value of money in this sense must therefore be frustrated at the outset by the fact that both their goal and the road to it are obscured by a darkness that human knowledge will never be able to penetrate. But the uncertainty that would exist as to whether there was any need for intervention to maintain the stability of the exchange value of money, and as to the necessary extent of such intervention, would inevitably give full license, again, to the conflicting interests of the inflationist and restrictionists. Once the principle is so much as admitted that the state may and should influence the value of money, even if it were only to guarantee the stability of its value, the danger of mistakes and excesses immediately arises again. These possibilities, and the remembrance of very recent experiments in public finance and inflation, have subordinated the unrealizable ideal of a money with an invariable exchange value to the demand that the state should at least refrain from exerting any sort of influence on the value of money. A metallic money the augmentation or diminution of the quantity of metal available for which is independent of deliberate human intervention is becoming the modern monetary ideal. The significance of adherence to a metallic money system lies in the freedom of the value of money from state influence that such a system guarantees. Beyond doubt, Considerable disadvantages are involved in the fact that not only fluctuations in the ratio of the supply of money and the demand for it, but also fluctuations in the conditions of production of the metal and variations in the industrial demand for it, exert an influence on the determination of the value of money. It is true that these effects, in the case of gold and even in the case of silver, are not immoderately great and these are the only two monetary metals that need to be considered in modern times. But even if the effects were greater, such a money would still deserve a preference over one subject to state intervention, since the latter sort of money would be subject to still greater fluctuations. Section 6. The Limits of Monetary Power the results of our investigation into the development and significance of monetary policy should not surprise us, 
that the state, after having for a period used the power which it nowadays has of influencing to some extent the determination of the objective exchange value of money in order to affect the distribution of income, should have to abandon its further exercise, will not appear strange to those who have a proper appreciation of the economic function of the state in that social order which rests upon private property in the means of production. The state does not govern the market. In the market in which products are exchanged, it may quite possibly be a powerful party, but nevertheless, it is only one party of many, nothing more than that. All its attempts to transform the exchange ratios between economic goods that are determined in the market can only be undertaken with the instruments of the market. It can never foresee exactly what the results of any particular intervention will be. It cannot bring about a desired result in the degree that it wishes, because the means that the influencing of demand and supply place at its disposal only affect the pricing process through the medium of the subjective valuations of individuals, but no judgment as to the intensity of the resulting transformation of these valuations can be made except when the intervention is a small one, limited to one or a few groups of commodities of lesser importance, and even in such a case, only approximately. All monetary policies encounter the difficulty that the effects of any measures taken in order to influence the fluctuations of the objective exchange value of money can neither be foreseen in advance, nor their nature and magnitude be determined even after they have already occurred. Now, the renunciation of intervention on grounds of monetary policy that is involved in the retention of a metallic commodity currency is not complete. In the regulation of the issue of fiduciary media, there is still another possibility of influencing the objective exchange value of money. The problems that this gives rise to must be investigated in the following part before we can discuss certain plans that have recently been announced for the establishment of a monetary system under which the value of money would be more stable than that of a gold currency. Section 7. Excursus. The Concepts, Inflation, and Deflation. Observant readers may perhaps be struck by the fact that in this book no precise definition is given of the terms inflation and deflation, or restriction or contraction, that they are, in fact, hardly employed at all, and then only in places where nothing in particular depends upon their precision. Only inflationism and deflationism, or restrictionism, are spoken of and an exact definition is given of the concepts implied by these expressions. Obviously, this procedure demands special justification. I am by no means in agreement with those unusually influential voices that have been raised against the employment of the expression inflation altogether, but I do think that it is an expression that it is possible to do without and that it would be highly dangerous on account of a serious difference between its meaning in the pure economic theory of money and banking and its meaning in everyday discussions of currency policy to make use of it where a sharp scientific precision of the words employed is desirable. In theoretical investigation, there is only one meaning that can rationally be attached to the expression inflation an increase in the quantity of money, in the broader sense of the term, so as to include fiduciary media as well, that is not offset by a corresponding increase in the need for money, again in the broader sense of the term, so that a fall in the objective exchange value of money must occur. Again, deflation or restriction or contraction signifies a diminution of the quantity of money, in the broader sense, which is not offset by a corresponding diminution in the demand for money, in the broader sense, so that an increase in the objective exchange value of money must occur. If we so define these concepts, it follows that either inflation or deflation is constantly going on, for a situation in which the objective exchange value of money did not alter 
could hardly ever exist for very long. The theoretical value of our definition is not in the least reduced by the fact that we are not able to measure the fluctuations in the objective exchange value of money, or even by the fact that we are not able to discern them at all except when they are large. If the variations in the objective exchange value of money that result from these causes are so great that they can no longer remain unobserved, it is usual in the discussions of economic policy to speak of inflation and deflation, or restriction or contraction. Now in these discussions, whose practical significance is extraordinarily great, it would be very little to the purpose to use those precise concepts which alone come up to a strictly scientific standard. It would be ridiculous pedantry to attempt to provide an economist's contribution to the controversy as to whether in this or the other country inflation has occurred since 1914 by saying, excuse me, there has probably been inflation throughout the whole world since 1896, although on a small scale. In politics, the question of degree is sometimes the whole point, not, as in theory, the question of principle. But, once the economist has acknowledged that it is not entirely nonsensical to use the expressions inflation and deflation to indicate such variations in the quantity of money as evoke big changes in the objective exchange value of money, he must renounce the employment of these expressions in pure theory. For the point at which a change in the exchange ratio begins to deserve to be called big is a question for political judgment not for scientific investigation. It is incontrovertible that ideas are bound up with popular usage of the terms inflation and deflation that must be combated as altogether inappropriate when they creep into economic investigation. In everyday usage, these expressions are based upon an entirely untenable idea of the stability of the value of money and often also on conceptions that ascribe to a monetary system in which the quantity of money increases and decreases pari passu with the increase and decrease of the quantity of commodities, the property of maintaining the value of money stable. Yet, however worthy of condemnation this mistake may be, it cannot be denied that the first concern of those who wish to combat popular errors with regard to the causes of the recent tremendous variations in prices, should not so much be the dissemination of correct views on the problems of the nature of money in general, as the contraction of those fundamental errors which, if they continue to be believed, must lead to a catastrophic consequence. Those who, in the years 1914 to 24, contested the balance of payments theory in Germany in order to oppose the continuation of the policy of inflation, may claim the indulgence of their contemporaries and successors if they were not always quite strictly scientific in their use of the word inflation. In fact, it is this very indulgence that we are bound to exercise towards the pamphlets and articles dealing with monetary problems that obliges us to refrain from using these misleading expressions in scientific discussion. Chapter 8. The Monetary Policy of Etatism Section 1. The Monetary Theory of Etatism Etatism as a theory is the doctrine of the omnipotence of the state and, as a policy, the attempt to regulate all mundane affairs by authoritative commandment and prohibition. The ideal society of etatism is a particular sort of socialistic community. It is usual in discussions involving this ideal society to speak of state socialism, or, in some connections, of Christian socialism. Superficially regarded, the etatistic ideal society does not differ very greatly from the outward form assumed by the capitalistic organization of society. Etatism by no means aims at the formal transformation of all ownership of the means of production into state ownership by a complete overthrow of the established legal system. Only the biggest industrial, mining, and transport enterprises are to be nationalized. In agriculture, and in medium and small-scale industry, 
private property is nominally to continue. Nevertheless, all enterprises are to become state undertakings, in fact. Owners are to be left the title and dignity of ownership, it is true, and to be given a right to the receipt of a reasonable income, in accordance with their position. But in fact, every business is to be changed into a government office, and every livelihood into an official profession. There is no room at all for independent enterprise under any variety of state socialism. Prices are to be regulated authoritatively. Authority is to fix what is to be produced, and how, and at what quantities. There is to be no speculation, no excessive profit, no loss. There is to be no innovation unless it be decreed by authority. The official is to direct and supervise everything. It is one of the peculiarities of etatism that it is unable to conceive of human beings living together in a society otherwise than in accordance with its own particular socialistic ideal. The similarity that exists between the socialist state, that is, its ideal and pattern, and the social order based upon private property in the means of production, causes it to overlook the fundamental differences that separate the two. Everything that contradicts the assumption that the two kinds of social order are similar is regarded by the etatist as a transient anomaly, and a culpable transgression of authoritative decrees, as evidence that the state has let slip the reins of government and only needs to take them more firmly in hand for everything to be beautifully in order again. That the social life of human beings is subject to definite limitations, that it is governed by a set of laws that are comparable with those of nature, these are notions that are unknown to the etatist. For the etatist, everything is a question of macht, power, force, might, and his conception of macht is crudely materialistic. Every word of etatistic thought is contradicted by the doctrines of sociology and economics. This is why etatists endeavor to prove that these sciences do not exist. In their opinion, social affairs are shaped by the state. To the law, all things are possible, and there is no sphere in which state intervention is not omnipotent. For a long time, the modern etatists shrank from an explicit application of their principles to the theory of money. It is true that some, Adolf Wagner and Lexis in particular, expressed views on the domestic and foreign value of money, and on the influence of the balance of payments on the condition of the exchanges that contained all the elements of an etatistic theory of money, but always with great caution and reserve. The first to attempt an explicit application of etatistic principles in the sphere of monetary doctrine was Knopp. The policy of etatism had its heyday during the period of the World War which itself was the inevitable consequence of the dominance of etatistic ideology. In the war economy, the postulates of etatism were realized. The war economy and the transition economy showed what etatism is worth and what the policy of etatism is able to achieve. An examination of etatistic monetary doctrine and monetary policy has a significance that is not limited to the history of ideas. For in spite of all its ill success, etatism is still the ruling doctrine, at least on the continent of Europe. It is, at any rate, the doctrine of the rulers. Its ideas prevail in monetary policy. However convinced we may be that it is scientifically valueless, it will not do for us nowadays to ignore it. Section 2. National Prestige and the Rate of Exchange For the etatist, money is a creature of the state, and the esteem in which money is held is the economic expression of the respect or prestige enjoyed by the state. The more powerful and the richer the state, the better its money. Thus, during the war, it was asserted that the monetary standard of the victors would ultimately be the best money. Yet victory and defeat on the battlefield can exercise only an indirect influence on the value of money. Generally speaking, a victorious state is more likely than a conquered one to be able to renounce the aid of the printing press, 
for it is likely to find it easier to limit its expenditure on the one hand and to obtain credit on the other hand. But the same considerations suggest that increasing prospects of peace will lead to a more favorable estimation of the currency even of the defeated country. In October 1918, the mark and the krona rose. It was believed that even in Germany and Austria, a cessation of inflation might be counted upon, an expectation which admittedly was not fulfilled. History, likewise, shows that sometimes the monetary standard of the victors can prove to be very bad. There have seldom been more brilliant victories than those eventually achieved by the American insurgents under Washington against the English troops. But the American continental dollar did not benefit from them. The more proudly the star-spangled banner rose on high, the lower did the exchange rate fall, until, at the very moment when the victory of the rebels was secured, the dollar became entirely valueless. The course of events was no different not long afterwards in France. In spite of the victories of the Revolutionary Army, the metal premium rose continually, until at last, in 1796, the value of money touched zero point. In both cases, the victorious state had carried inflation to its extreme. Neither has the wealth of a country any bearing on the valuation of its money. Nothing is more erroneous than the widespread habit of regarding the monetary standard as something in the nature of the shares of the state or the community. When the German mark was quoted at 100 centimes in Zurich, bankers said, now is the time to buy marks. The German community is indeed poorer nowadays than before the war, so that a low valuation of the mark is justified. Nevertheless, the wealth of Germany is certainly not reduced to a twelfth of what it was before the war, so the mark is bound to rise. And when the Polish mark had sunk to five centimes in Zurich, other bankers said, this low level is inexplicable. Poland is a rich country. It has a flourishing agriculture. It has wood, coal, and oil, so its rate of exchange ought to be incomparably higher. Such observers fail to recognize that the valuation of the monetary unit does not depend upon the wealth of the country, but upon the ratio between the quantity of money and the demand for it, so that even the richest country may have a bad currency and the poorest country a good one. Section 3. The Regulation of Prices by Authoritative Decree the oldest and most popular instrument of a statistic monetary policy is the official fixing of maximum prices. High prices, thinks the etatist, are not a consequence of an increase in the quantity of money, but a consequence of the reprehensible activity on the part of bulls and profiteers. It will suffice to suppress their machinations in order to ensure the cessation of the rise of prices. Thus, it is made a punishable offense to demand or even to pay excessive prices. Like most other governments, the Austrian government during the war began this kind of criminal law contest with price raising on the same day that it put the printing press in motion in the service of the national finances. Let us suppose that it had at first been successful in this. Let us completely disregard the fact that the war had also diminished the supply of commodities, and suppose that there had been no forces at work on the commodity side to alter the exchange ratio between commodities and money. We must further disregard the fact that the war, by increasing the period of time necessary for transporting money, and by limiting the operation of the clearing system, and also in other ways, had increased the demand for money of individual economic agents. Let us merely discuss the question, what consequences would necessarily follow if, ceteris paribus, with an increasing quantity of money, prices were restricted to the old level by official compulsion? An increase in the quantity of money leads to the appearance in the market of new desire to purchase, which had previously not existed. New purchasing power, it is usual to say, has been created. 
If the new would-be purchasers compete with those that are already in the market, then, so long as it is not permissible to raise prices, only part of the total purchasing power can be exercised. This means that there are would-be purchasers who leave the market without having effected their object, although they were ready to agree to the price demanded, would-be purchasers who return home with the money with which they set out in order to purchase. Whether or not a would-be purchaser who is prepared to pay the official price gets the commodity that he desires depends upon all sorts of circumstances, which are, from the point of view of the market, quite inessential. For example, upon whether he was on the spot in time, or has personal relations with the seller, or other similar accidents. The mechanism of the market no longer works to make a distinction between the would-be purchasers who are still able to buy and those who are not. It no longer brings about a coincidence between supply and demand through variations in price. Supply lags behind demand. The play of the market loses its meaning. Other forces have to take its place. But the government that puts the newly created notes in circulation does so because it wishes to draw commodities and services out of their previous avenues in order to direct them into some other desired employment. It wishes to buy these commodities and services, not, as is also a quite conceivable procedure, to commandeer them by force. It must, therefore, desire that everything should be obtainable for money and for money alone. It is not to the advantage of the government that a situation should arise in the market that makes some of the would-be purchasers withdraw without having effected their object. The government desires to purchase. It desires to use the market, not to disorganize it. But the officially fixed price does disorganize the market in which commodities and services are bought and sold for money. Commerce, so far as it is able, seeks relief in other ways. It redevelops a system of direct exchange in which commodities and services are exchanged without the instrumentality of money. Those who are forced to dispose of commodities and services at the fixed prices do not dispose of them to everybody, but merely to those to whom they wish to do a favor. Would-be purchasers wait in long queues in order to snap up what they can get before it's too late. They race breathlessly from shop to shop, hoping to find one that has not yet sold out. For once the commodities have been sold that were already on the market when their price was authoritatively fixed at a level below that demanded by the situation of the market, then the emptied storerooms are not filled again. Charging more than a certain price is prohibited, but producing and selling has not been made compulsory. There are no longer any sellers. The market ceases to function. But this means that economic organization based on division of labor becomes impossible. The level of money prices cannot be fixed without overthrowing the system of social division of labor. Thus, official fixing of prices, which is intended to establish them and wages generally below the level that they would attain in a free market, is completely impracticable. If the prices of individual kinds of commodities and services are subjected to such restrictions, then disturbances occur that are settled again by the capacity for adjustment possessed by the economic order based on private property sufficiently to make the continuance of the system possible. If such regulations are made general and really put into force, then their incompatibility with the existence of a social order based upon private property becomes obvious. The attempt to restrain prices within limits has to be given up. The government that sets out to abolish market prices is inevitably driven towards the abolition of private property. It has to recognize that there is no middle way between the system of private property and the means of production combined with free contract and the system of common ownership of the means of production, or socialism. It is gradually forced toward compulsory production, universal obligation to labor, rationing of consumption, and finally official regulation of the whole of production and consumption. This is the road that was taken by economic policy during the war. 
the etatist who had jubilantly proclaimed the state's ability to do everything it wanted to do, discovered that the economists had nevertheless been quite right and that it was not possible to manage with price regulation alone. Since they wished to eliminate the play of the market, they had to go farther than they had originally intended. The first step was the rationing of the most important necessaries, but soon compulsory labor had to be resorted to and eventually the subordination of the whole of production and consumption to the direction of the state. Private property existed in name only. In fact, it had been abolished. The collapse of militarism was the end of wartime socialism also. Yet no better understanding of the economic problem was shown under the revolution than under the old regime. All the same experiences had to be gone through again. The attempts that were made with the aid of the police and the criminal law to prevent a rise of prices did not come to grief because officials did not act severely enough or because people found ways of avoiding the regulations. They did not suffer shipwreck because the entrepreneurs were not public-spirited, as the socialist etatistic legend has it. They were bound to fail because the economic organization, based upon the division of labor and private property in the means of production, can function only so long as price determination in the market is free. If the regulation of prices had been successful, it would have paralyzed the whole economic organism. The only thing that made possible the continued functioning of the social apparatus of production was the incomplete enforcement of the regulations that was due to the paralysis of the efforts of those who ought to have executed them. During thousands of years in all parts of the inhabited earth, innumerable sacrifices have been made to the chimera of just and reasonable prices. Those who have offended against the laws regulating prices have been heavily punished. Their property has been confiscated, they themselves have been incarcerated, tortured, put to death. The agents of etatism have certainly not been lacking in zeal and energy. But for all this, economic affairs cannot be kept going by magistrates and policemen. Section 4. The Balance of Payments Theory as a Basis of Currency Policy According to the current view, the maintenance of sound monetary conditions is only possible with a credit balance of payments. A country with a debit balance of payments is supposed to be unable permanently to stabilize the value of its money. The depreciation of the currency is supposed to have an organic basis and to be irremediable except by the removal of the organic defects. The confutation of this and related objections is implicit in the quantity theory and in Gresham's law. The quantity theory shows that money can never permanently flow abroad from a country in which only metallic money is used, the purely metallic currency of the currency principle. The tightness in the domestic market called forth by the efflux of part of the stock of money reduces the prices of commodities and so restricts importation and encourages exportation, until there is once more enough money at home. The precious metals which perform the function of money are distributed among individuals, and consequently among separate countries, according to the extent and intensity of the demand of each for money. State intervention to assure to the community the necessary quantity of money by regulating its international movements is supererogatory. An undesired efflux of money can never be anything but a result of state intervention endowing money of different values with the same legal tender. All that the state need do, and can do, in order to preserve the monetary system undisturbed is to refrain from such intervention. That is the essence of the monetary theory of the classical economists and their immediate successors, the currency school. It is possible to refine and amplify this doctrine with the aid of modern subjective theory, but it is impossible to overthrow it, and impossible to put anything else in its place. Those who are able to forget it only show that they are unable to think as economists. 
When a country has substituted credit money or fiat money for metallic money, because the legal equating of the overissued paper and the metallic money sets in motion the mechanism described by Gresham's law, it is often asserted that the balance of payments determines the rate of exchange. But this also is a quite inadequate explanation. The rate of exchange is determined by the purchasing power possessed by a unit of each kind of money. It must be determined at such a level that it makes no difference whether commodities are purchased directly with the one kind of money or indirectly through money of the other kind. If the rate of exchange moves away from the position that is determined by the purchasing power parity, which we call the natural or equilibrium rate, then certain sorts of transactions would become profitable. It would become lucrative to purchase commodities with the money that was undervalued by the rate of exchange as compared with the ratio given by its purchasing power and to sell them for the money that was overvalued in the rate of exchange in comparison with its purchasing power. And because there were such opportunities of profit, there would be a demand on the foreign exchange market for the money that was undervalued by the exchanges, and this would raise the rate of exchange until it attained its equilibrium position. Rates of exchange vary because the quantity of money varies and the prices of commodities vary. It has already been remarked, it is solely owing to market technique that this basic relationship is not actually expressed in the temporal sequence of events. In fact, the determination of foreign exchange rates under the influence of speculation anticipates the expected variations in the prices of commodities. The balance of payments theory forgets that the volume of foreign trade is completely dependent upon prices, that neither exportation nor importation can occur if there are no differences in prices to make trade profitable. The theory clings to the superficial aspects of the phenomena it deals with. It cannot be doubted that if we simply look at the daily or hourly fluctuations on the exchanges, we shall only be able to discover that the state of the balance of payments at any moment does determine the supply and demand in the foreign exchange market. But this is a mere beginning of proper investigation into the determinants of the rate of exchange. The next question is, what determines the state of the balance of payments at any moment? And there is no other possible answer to this than that it is the price level and the purchases and sales induced by the price margins that determine the balance of payments. Foreign commodities can be imported at a time when the rate of exchange is rising, only if they are able to find purchasers despite their high prices. One variety of the balance of payments theory attempts to distinguish between the importation of necessaries and the importation of articles that can be dispensed with. Necessaries, it is said, have to be bought whatever their price is, simply because they cannot be done without. Consequently, there must be a continual depreciation in the currency of a country that is obliged to import necessaries from abroad and itself is able to export only relatively dispensable articles. To argue thus is to forget that the greater or less necessity or dispensability of individual goods is fully expressed in the intensity and extent of the demand for them in the market, and thus in the amount of money which is paid for them. However strong the desire of the Austrians for foreign bread, meat, coal, or sugar may be, they can only get these things if they are able to pay for them. If they wish to import more, they must export more. If they cannot export manufactured or semi-manufactured goods, then they must export shares, bonds, and securities of various kinds. If the note circulation were not increased, then the prices of the objects that were offered for sale would have to decrease if the demand for import goods and hence their prices was to rise or else the upward movement of the prices of necessaries would have to be opposed by a fall in the price of the dispensable articles, the purchase of which was restricted so as to permit the purchase of the necessaries. There could be no question of a general rise of prices, and the balance of payments would be brought into equilibrium 
either by the export of securities and the like, or by an increased export of dispensable goods. It is only when the above assumption does not hold good, only when the quantity of notes in circulation is increased, that foreign commodities can still be imported in the same quantities in spite of a rise in the foreign exchange. It is only because this assumption does not hold good that the rise in the foreign exchange does not throttle importation and encourage exportation until there is again a credit balance of payments. Ancient mercantilist error, therefore, evolved a specter of which we need not be afraid. No country, not even the poorest, need abandon the hope of sound currency conditions. It is not the poverty of individuals and the community, not indebtedness to foreign nations, not the unfavorableness of conditions of production that force up the rate of exchange, but inflation. It follows that all the means that are employed for hindering a rise in the exchange rate are useless. If the inflationary policy continues, they remain ineffective. If there is no inflationary policy, then they are superfluous. The most important of these methods is the prohibition or limitation of the importation of certain goods that are considered dispensable, or at least less indispensable than others. This causes the sums of domestic money that would have been used for the purchase of these commodities to be used for other purchases, and naturally the only goods here concerned are those that would otherwise have been sold abroad. These will now be purchased at home for prices that are higher than those offered for them abroad. Thus, the reduction of imports and so of the demand for foreign exchange is balanced on the other side by an equal reduction of exports and so of the supply of foreign exchange. Imports are, in fact, paid for by exports, and not by money, as neo-mercantilist dilettantism still continues to believe. If it is really desired to dam up the demand for foreign exchange, then the amount of money to the extent of which it is desired to stop importation must be taken away from those at home, say by taxation, and kept out of circulation altogether i.e., not used for state purposes, but destroyed. That is to say, a deflationary policy must be followed. Instead of the importation of chocolate, wine, and lemonade being limited, the members of the community must be deprived of the money that they would otherwise spend on these commodities. Then they must limit their consumption either of these or of some other commodities. In the former case, less foreign exchange will be wanted, in the latter, more foreign exchange offered than previously. Section 5. The Suppression of Speculation It is not easy to determine whether there are any who still adhere in good faith to the doctrine that traces back the depreciation of money to the activity of speculators. The doctrine is an indispensable instrument of the lowest form of demagogy, it is the resource of governments in search of a scapegoat. There are scarcely any independent writers nowadays who defend it. Those who support it are paid to do so. Nevertheless, a few words must be devoted to it, for the monetary policy of the present day is based largely upon it. Speculation does not determine prices. It has to accept the prices that are determined in the market. Its efforts are directed to correctly estimating future price situations and to acting accordingly. The influence of speculation cannot alter the average level of prices over a given period. What it can do is to diminish the gap between the highest and lowest prices. Price fluctuations are reduced by speculation, not aggravated, as the popular legend has it. It is true that the speculator may happen to go astray in his estimate of future prices. What is usually overlooked in considering this possibility is that under the given conditions it is far beyond the capacities of most people to foresee the future any more correctly. If this were not so, the opposing group of buyers or sellers would have gotten the upper hand in the market. The fact that the opinion accepted by the market has later proved to be false is lamented by nobody with more genuine sorrow than by the speculators who held it. They do not err of malice prepense. After all, 
Their object is to make profits, not losses. Even prices that are established under the influence of speculation result from the cooperation of two parties, the bulls and the bears. Each of the two parties is always equal to the other in strength and in the extent of its commitments. Each has an equal responsibility for the determination of prices. Nobody is from the outset and for all time bull or bear. A dealer becomes a bull or a bear only on the basis of a summing up of the market situation, or, more correctly, on the basis of the dealings that follow on such a summing up. Anybody can change his role at any moment. The price is determined at that level at which the two parties counterbalance each other. The fluctuations of the foreign exchange rate are not determined solely by bears selling, but just as much by bulls buying. The statistic view traces back the rise in the price of foreign currencies to the machinations of enemies of the state at home and abroad. These enemies, it is asserted, dispose of the national currency with a speculative intent and purchase foreign currencies with a speculative intent. Two cases are conceivable. Either these enemies are actuated in their dealings by the hope of making a profit, when the same is true of them as of all other speculators, or they wish to damage the reputation of the state of which they are enemies by depressing the value of its currency, even though they themselves are injured by the operations that lead to this end. To consider the possibility of such enterprises is to forget that they are hardly practicable. The sales of the bears, if they ran against the feelings of the market, would immediately start a contrary movement. The sums disposed of would be taken up by the bulls in expectation of a coming reaction without any effect on the rate of exchange worth mentioning. In truth, these self-sacrificing bear maneuvers that are undertaken, not to make a profit, but to damage the reputation of the state, belong to the realm of fables. It is true that operations may well be undertaken on foreign exchange markets that have as their aim not the securing of a profit, but the creation and maintenance of a rate that does not correspond to market conditions, but this sort of intervention always proceeds from governments who hold themselves responsible for the currency and always have in view the establishment and maintenance of a rate of exchange above the equilibrium rate. These are artificial bull, not bear, maneuvers. Of course, such intervention also must remain ineffective in the long run. In fact, there is only one way in the last resort to prevent a further fall in the value of money ceasing to increase the note circulation, and only one way of raising the value of money, reducing the note circulation. Any intervention, such as that of the German Reich Bank in the spring of 1923, in which only a small part of the increasing note expansion was recovered by the banks through the sale of foreign bills, would necessarily be unsuccessful. Led by the idea of opposing speculation, Inflationistic governments have allowed themselves to become involved in measures whose meaning is hardly intelligible. Thus, at one time, the importation of notes, then their exportation, then again both their exportation and importation, have been prohibited. Exporters have been forbidden to sell for their own country's notes, importers to buy with them. All trade in terms of foreign money and precious metals has been declared a state monopoly. The quotation of rates for foreign money on home exchanges has been forbidden, and the communication of information concerning the rates determined at home, outside the exchanges, and the rates negotiated on foreign exchanges made severely punishable. All these measures have proved useless, and would probably have been more quickly set aside than actually was the case if there had not been important factors in favor of their retention. Quite apart from the political significance already referred to attaching to the maintenance of the proposition that the fall in the value of money was only to be ascribed to wicked speculators, it must not be forgotten that every restriction of trade creates vested interests that are from then onward opposed to its removal. An attempt is sometimes made to demonstrate the desirability of measures directed against speculation, 
by reference to the fact that there are times when there is nobody in opposition to the bears in the foreign exchange market, so that they alone are able to determine the rate of exchange. That, of course, is not correct. Yet it must be noticed that speculation has a peculiar effect in the case of a currency whose progressive depreciation is to be expected, while it is possible to foresee when the depreciation will stop, if at all. While, in general, speculation reduces the gap between the highest and lowest prices without altering the average price level, here, where the movement will presumably continue in the same direction, this naturally cannot be the case. The effect of speculation here is to permit the fluctuation, which would otherwise proceed more uniformly, to proceed by fits and starts with the interposition of pauses. If foreign exchange rates begin to rise, then to those speculators who buy in accordance with their own view of the circumstances are added large numbers of outsiders. These camp followers strengthen the movement started by the few that trust to an independent opinion and send it farther than it would have gone under the influence of the expert professional speculators alone. For the reaction cannot set in so quickly and effectively as usual. Of course, it is the general assumption that the depreciation of money will go still farther. But eventually, sellers of foreign money must make an appearance, and then the rising movement of the exchanges comes to a standstill. Perhaps even a backward movement sets in for a time. Then, after a period of stable money, the whole thing begins again. The reaction admittedly begins late, but it must begin as soon as the rates of exchange have run too far ahead of commodity prices. If the gap between the equilibrium rate for exchange and the market rate is big enough to give play for profitable commodity transactions, then there will also arise a speculative demand for the domestic paper money. Not until the scope for such transactions has again disappeared owing to the rise in commodity prices will a new rise in the price of foreign exchange set in. A tatism eventually comes to regard the possession of foreign money, balances as such, and foreign bills as behavior reprehensible in itself. From this point of view, it is the duty of citizens, not that this is asserted in so many words, but it is the tone of all official declarations to put up with the harmful consequences of the depreciation of money to their private property and to make no attempt to avoid this by acquiring such possessions as are not eaten up by the depreciation of money. From the point of view of the individual, they declare, it may indeed appear profitable for him to save himself from impoverishment by a flight from the market. But from the point of view of the community, this is harmful and therefore is to be condemned. This demand really comes to a cool request on the part of those who enjoy the benefits of the inflation that everybody else should render up their wealth for sacrifice to the destructive policy of the state. In this case, as in all others in which similar assertions are made, it is not true that there exists an opposition between the interest of the individual and the interests of the community. The national capital is composed of the capital of the individual members of the state, and when the latter is consumed, nothing remains of the former either. The individual who takes steps to invest his property in such a way that it cannot be eaten up by the depreciation of money does not injure the community. On the contrary, in taking steps to preserve his private property from destruction, he also preserves some of the property of the community from destruction. If he surrendered it without opposition to the effects of the inflation, all he would do would be to further the destruction of part of the national wealth and enrich those to whom the inflationary policy brings profit. It is true that not inconsiderable sections of the best classes of the German people have given credit to the asservations of the inflationists and their press. Many thought that they were doing a patriotic act when they did not get rid of their Marx or Cronin and Marx or Cronin securities, but retained them. By doing so, they did not serve the fatherland. That they and their families have, as a consequence, sunk into poverty only means that some of the members of those classes of the German people from which the cultural reconstruction of the nation was to be expected 
are reduced to a condition in which they are able to help neither the community nor themselves.